Testing one, two, three. We could hear you, Carol. Thank you. Test two, one, two, three, four. All good. Test three, one, two, three, four. Confirmed. Test four, one, two, three, four. We heard you, thanks.
Good morning, Christopher. I can find the button. Good morning, Councilor. <laughs> you have our video stopped. I'm sorry? Uh, our video is uh, stopped. You can't uh, access your cameras? No, uh, you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. Uh, uh, Councillor, yeah, we had this issue the other day. Let me take that uh, back to the team and see if we can fix that quickly. No worries at all. I thought I'd done something bad. I thought our, no, I think I our, our headshots look better anyway. I'm, I'm cool with this. <laughs> Everyone looks wonderful today. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> Is Matt, when's the last time you wore a tie? Uh, that day, I think. <laughs> <laughs> even, even Jeff looked young in this picture. My God, that must be an old picture. Yeah, it's uh, a couple more weeks until the beard comes off. Oh, okay. A couple more weeks. And right back in the sandals? It's a little chilly yet. <laughs> but I we're never getting took them there. off. I never took them off. <laughs> If there's not uh, if there's not snow on the ground or if like it's been cleared, then you're, you're good to go. You know, good to go. In. They're slippy. My sandals are slippy. I should put on some ski boots. I'm just in my socks. I actually should put some shoes on. I'm gonna do that. All right, now I'm appropriately attired to serve on this committee today. Uh, if a member could uh, try their camera again, I think we may have uh, We're good. fixed it. All right. Good job, guys. Tim's well, right, though. I did look better before. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> uh, we love you, man. It's all good. All right. Now to get serious. <clears throat> uh, it is now 9.32. I definitely see a, uh, a quorum, um, but uh, I will just go through the rules again. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as we proceed through a quick roll call uh, of the members of committee, we must uh, maintain a quorum during this time, so please keep your cameras on if possible. Uh, Mr. Coordinator, would you mind doing roll call, please? I do so, Chair. Councillor Lulov. I am present. Councillor Dudas. I'm here. Councillor El Shantiri. Present. Councillor Deans. Here. Councillor Fleury. Good morning. Councillor Menard. Present. Councillor Kitts. Here. Councillor DeRuz. Councillor Hubley? Yeah, uh, Councillor DeRuz was saying he was having the audio problems there uh, just a couple of moments ago. Thank you. And Vice Chair Leeper. Present. Mr. Chair, you have quorum. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Really appreciate that. Uh, again, we have uh, no declarations of interest. Uh, confirmation of the minutes, uh, 25, the 2nd of February, 2022. Is that confirmed? Thank you. Uh, communications, uh, we did have two items uh, that were postponed as a result of the occupation that did take place uh, and people's requirement to have attention to this. Uh, I know I wanna thank Councillor Fleury. He's worked very closely with staff. He does have direction. And at this point, I don't know, Chris, if you're able to put the direction on the screen and we'll have Councillor Fleury read the direction to staff. Thank you, Chair. If you're okay, I just, uh, to reference the two items, there's one uh, which refers to uh, crack ceiling, which I do have a question for staff on afterwards. But this one, I want to thank uh, Karina and, uh, and, and the team for uh, working with me. Uh, this relates to the road cut uh, uh, inquiry response. So uh, I'll read it for the record. Staff are proposing to implement broader asphalt resurfacing requirements on road cuts primarily being that all cuts within one meter of a curb of a roadway edge be brought to the curb or roadway edge and that all cuts into pavement 
three years or less in age be resurfaced to full width of the affected lane. While this will help maintain the surface writability of road cuts, that staff be directed to one, when reviewing the R10 standard trench reinstatement detail as part of the 2022 infrastructure service standards review, take into consideration the following. A, pavement de degradation that results from the road cuts. B, identifying infrastructure degradation risk due to these cuts. C, identify possible engineering solution that can address the degradation. D, enhance current standards and specification accordingly and E, review potential applicability of asphalt sealant on all road cuts joints. And then the second point, review options for uh, an E permitting, an electronic permitting as it, re as it pertains to road cuts permits and the availability of open data uh, to the public. Perfect, and thanks for that direction and staff are, are satisfied with that. So thank you for working with them. You did mention you had a question, Councillor Fleury. Is it a simple question or should I just put this on the agenda uh, for questioning uh, later on? Uh, Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm in your hands. I do have one question on crack sealing just uh, for record. Okay, if, uh, will of the committee uh, uh, go, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, staff, for the response. Jen, specific, oh, sorry, Jen, yes, uh, I, I should have mentioned you in, in the road cut um, uh, direction. My, um, my, my follow-up is really in terms of the data. I'm looking to understand it. The answer is clear that infrastructure services does do uh, crack sealant in targeted areas. I share that I'm surprised that that is not done operationally through public works. And I wanted to understand for the record, um, what, is the, uh, res what is the research telling us in terms of crack sealant specifically um, you know, we're, we're all, we're all out there, uh, talking about potholes and fixing of potholes and, and we've operationalized the pothole fixing. So I'm as in terms of cracks, crack ceiling and, and what are future considerations? Chair. So we acknowledge that crack sealing is an integral part of maintaining our roads when it's applied at the right time. Road renewal includes a variety of interventions and the comprehensive asset management program is designed to do the right intervention on the right asset at the right time. Crack sealing is an important intervention that is used in combination with resurfacing. So cracks can sometimes appear in the years following resurfacing work. So the city has a proactive program to address these as they occur. The only way to avoid reflective cracking is to reconstruct the entire sub-base, which is cost prohibitive. The most cost-effective approach is the overlay program, which does not involve a full reconstruction and it provides users with a nice new smooth surface that they can use. This approach results in some reflective cracking, which is addressed through the crack sealing program. Under this program, crack sealing is applied to roads typically one to four years after a resurfacing project to seal the cracks that naturally occur. It's important that the crack sealing program occurs a few years after the overlay to prevent deterioration and to maximize the life of the resurfacing investment. The city uses a pavement management application, also known as a PMA, to manage its road network, which is considered a best practice in asset management. The system is continually updated with condition data and the PMA is used to optimize the combination of interventions to maximize the life of the road's infrastructure. Road renewal is prioritized based on information from the pavement management application and coordination is considered as well as available budget. Renewal efforts are aimed at assets with a greater risk of impacting levels of service. As a result, arterial and collector roads, particularly those carrying substantial vehicular traffic, will be rehabilitated more frequently than local roads. With increased funding, more work could be done Funding levels are set through the long range financial plan, which will be revisited in the next term of council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen, for that. And I, I see Councillor Fleury nodding. So uh, I appreciate uh, taking the time to answer that and, and uh, look forward to sealing some cracks. Um, so just back to the agenda. Uh, so item number one, Brian Kohlberg, uh, uh, the Cumberland Transit Extension. Uh, we do have delegations on that one. Uh, so we will, and a presentation from staff, so we'll hold that. Uh, we also do have a motion from Councillor Kitts that we'll get Councillor Kitts to read when we get back to that item on the agenda. 
Uh, item number two, Patio Innovation Program 2022. Uh, we do have uh, one delegation, Cheryl Parrott. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Coordinator, is Cheryl on here by chance right now? Because I could see the, the first item with 20 delegations taking quite a bit of time. And if uh, Cheryl is able to join right now with will of committee, I'd like to move her to the front of the deck so she doesn't have to sit here all day. Mr. Chair, she is in uh, attendees. Wonderful. Totally fine with that, Chair. We're good with that? Okay, great. So we'll, we'll move item two to item number one uh, when we get to that point so we can let her in while I complete the agenda clearing. Uh, item number three is the 2021 electric kicks scooter strategy pilot report. We do have 10 delegations on that and a presentation from staff. Uh, I don't think this is super contentious. Uh, Vice Chair Leeper thinks it is, but uh, item number four, paint it up uh, the uh, program results. Uh, <laughs> if, if no one wishes to hold this item, uh, we have no uh, staff presentation, no delegations and no submissions have been received. Uh, Mr. Chair, on I just have a, a short brief question on that. Certainly. Let's do that. Can I, can I ask it now? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm just wondering why there hasn't been an increase in the funding envelope since 2010. I mean, it's still, I think, at $50,000, and it would seem in 12 years that, that it should have increased to something in the order of maybe $65,000 by now. Just wonder why there hasn't been an increase. Sure, Chair. It's Jen Carrera speaking. Um, thanks, uh, Councillor Deans. Um, to be honest with you, I've taken a carriage of this file just in the last year, and I'm not too sure of the budget history on this one. Happy to take it away and see if that's been brought to Council in past for consideration. I can say that within the envelope we have right now, um, we have uh, had a couple of years where we've not fully expended the $50,000 budget. Um, of course, some of that is related to uh, the pandemic last year. And then previous years, there were some other reasons. Um, as it stands right now, our recommendation is to carry it forward as is. The 50,000 is accounted for in our 2022 budget, um, but happy to consider an increase if that is something council is interested in. I, I think from an inflationary perspective, we're kind of moving backwards if we don't at least keep up with inflation. So maybe I would just ask you to take a look at that and maybe provide a memo before this is considered at council. Certainly can do. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you. Now I do, I noticed that Councillor Kavanaugh's hands up, but I think that was for something else, I believe, or was it for this item? Yeah, no, it wasn't for this item, uh, though I, I agree with the painted up, getting more money for sure. Um, I had um, an inquiry on as well, and I had asked if I could speak on it. The inquiry, that, has it been submitted to the- uh, Yes, to... It, it was there. Yeah, it's on the agenda. Okay, so we'll leave that uh, inquiries are towards the end. So I'll just con continue with the uh, with the agenda. So on item four, the painted up program, uh, is that item carried? Carried. 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 Uh, we have a, a, a modus of notion that was given in the previous uh, committee. Uh, Hickory Street uh, partial temporary encroachment uh, fee waiver and uh, allocations of fees for the streetscaping improvements. Uh, by Councillor uh, Vice Chair Leeper. There's no staff presentations, no delegations, and no submissions have been received. So on item number five, is that carried? Carried. Terrific. Carried. And so we'll go back to uh, the new item one, which is item number two, and we'll invite, uh, I'm just looking quickly here, I'll invite uh, Cheryl Parrott, uh, because I believe there's no staff presentation on this specific item. That's correct? Good. Okay, and I believe Cheryl, uh, this isn't your first rodeo, uh, and I believe you also supplied a presentation for today as well. Uh, yes, I did. So there are some slides. First one's kind of blank, but if we could put that up at the beginning, that would be great. Um, great, we'll get that loaded for you right now. Okay, yeah, because I'll try to move th through things so that I get it all in in my five minutes. Perfect, okay. So thank you so much, and thanks for moving this up to the top, that's great. So the Hindenburg Community Association supports patios. They enliven the street and they've provided much relief during uh, these, these two difficult summers of COVID. We're a very dense neighborhood and we all try to work together on competing interests. So we're concerned about the proposed 2 a.m. closure for these patios. 
This year, we all expect to see more people on patios as capacity restrictions are gone and distancing is eliminated. And so this may result in more noise. So we're concerned that there won't be an adequate response to this because uh, it looks like there's only one summer staff being dedicated towards this and it's sort of proactive enforcement. So we ask that you look at more staffing for complaints and enforcement than just this one summer student because existing bylaw resources are, are woefully inadequate and they often can't get there um, in any timely manner. So if you do pass this program, we ask that any noise complaints to bylaw be brought forward as legitimate complaints to the business owner and not be dismissed as unfounded if an officer can't get there in a timely manner. And we also ask that uh, the any sound amplification not be allowed on the patios either directly or indirectly because open windows with music inside actually amplifies the sound outside. So if you could go to the next slide, please. We have concerns about the location of some of the right of way patios and the consequences for the pedestrian walkway. So this is the sidewalk on Wellington. It's nice and wide and straight and, and just a beautiful sidewalk to walk on. And next slide, please. This is the same location with a right of way patio that popped up last summer. And so it maintains the 1.8 meter pedestrian free clearance, um, but it certainly is not in a straight line. And you can see the amount of um, infrastructure there that people need to meander around, uh, as well as that uh, cone covering a broken bollard. Um, which often happens on the street and it's replaced by a cone which sometimes disappears and leaves a trip hazard. There is a community member who has very low vision, uses a white cane, um, but thankfully this person had enough vision that he didn't topple over this patio. Um, but uh, this is in between, uh, well, it's very close to a seniors building, a low income seniors building. And so, as you know, uh, vision impairment is a growing issue, issue within Canada and with the aging population. So we do have a lot of concerns about placing a patio right in the middle of the way. And next slide, please. So this is the same patio. What it does is it really, um, puts a lot of pressure on that pedestrian intersection. That's a, uh, that light takes a really long time to change. And so if you have someone there, a couple of people there, someone often has to go back into the patio entrance. As you can see with one of the wheelchairs, he's partially backed up into the patio entrance so that people may be able to get by. And I've seen the same thing with baby strollers there. So yes, the 1.8 meter uh, free distance was maintained, but this is not an optimal situation by any means. Next slide, please. So in the fall, they took out the patio and they replaced it with these planters, which were actually spaced uh, more evenly apart at the beginning, but you couldn't get through. If you were had a mobility device, you could not get through. So they moved them a bit but you can see that snow clearing is now a huge issue for this area. And again, you've got people having to clamor over ice banks to get through and the pedestrian beg button is sandwiched now in between two of the planters. And next slide. This is another patio uh, actually across the street from the previous one. And with the right of way patio that went in last year, again, you have uh, the pedestrian free clearance is about 24 inches. And the person in this, this uh, picture has a very tiny mobility device and had to very slowly inch by. There's also a pothole where the guy wire is. So again, the pedestrians are, it's made very inconvenient. Yes, she could cross the street and cross back again, but should pedestrians have to do that? So the bylaw does say 1.8 meters. This one clearly does not meet, but um, 
one of the bylaws that deals with business A-frames um, actually requires that the 1.8 meter clearance be in a straight line or in a, yeah, in a straight line. So what we would like to see is that right of way patios um, follow the same requirement that bylaw has for A-frame signs in that the location of, of right of way patios should not impede pedestrians walking in a relatively straight line. And I saw the uh, media reports last night about the e-scooters, and I feel this is really the same issue, that you're putting people with low vision um, at a disadvantage along the street. And we all need to share this infrastructure. Um, so please uh, consider making right-of-way patios go in a straight line or not, not impeding the pedestrian walkway so that people have to veer completely out of their way and around it into a crowded intersection to get where they're going. Thank you. Great, uh, right on time as always. Uh, we have a, a question from Councillor Fleury, someone that uh, very much supports uh, keeping audio devices turned down at night, by the way. Councillor Fleury. Uh, Cheryl, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, your, um, your points. I, I do, I will raise a number of these with staff. So I just, wanted to, uh, if, if you're able to stay on and, and listen, I think there's some paths to answers here in the report and in the approach, but there remains some some levels of concerns in terms of the me meandering of some of those clear ways that you're describing. So uh, if, uh, Chair, with your um, with your acknowledgement, I wonder if we could keep Cheryl for the, if for our questions to staff, uh, just so that she, she can listen in. Uh, as absolutely to to listen in and so uh, if there's no questions to the delegation uh, we'll leave Cheryl in the room if you can hit uh, the mute button please Cheryl and uh, Councillor oh wait I see Vice Chair Leeper threw his hand up is this no okay good so we'll go to Councillor Fleury questions to staff and then Vice Chair Leeper. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I, I, first and foremost, I do want to thank uh, formerly Court, now Kevin and uh, Laureen and Michelle uh, Egliot specifically. I think uh, the, the team has gone a long way from where we were a few years ago. And um, we, we've seen that firsthand in terms of supporting our businesses, yet also being responsive to Council's goals of protecting Clearway and accessibility objectives. It, it's far from perfect, but it, we've taken massive steps here uh, to uh, to make the program uh, very, very good. So Cheryl does raise a number of points that I think are partly addressed in the report. And I think, Kevin, it's important uh, to, um, to to go through them uh, one by one. So I, I understand that bylaw services will continue to proactively uh, monitor evenings and weekends specifically near residential areas. Is that, uh, is that a carryover from last year? Uh, Councillor through the chair. Um, yeah, so I believe Roger Chapman is on here as well. So I'll let him speak to how they allocate the bylaw resources. However, you know, we felt it was definitely important to um, understand some of the concerns that have come from the previous summers. So we did put into the report to add an additional staff or summer student position as part of the recommendations to, to help support that overall review of bylaw related concerns in regards to the patios. So if I could, I, I don't believe it's a dedicated resource specifically, like that one person will be dealing with all of these. It's more or less uh, an additional resource to help support the overall responses that we do get in, in accordance with complaints. Um, you know, we do have some information uh, as far as how many we did receive last year. And uh, as you'd indicated in our report, we, we're stepping up on how we're going to be doing our enforcement with the individual patios when we do hear particularly noise concerns or noise complaints. Um, so if that is some reassurance for, for the committee and council, then um, we're happy to work with Mrs. Barrett as well uh, on those individual situations as they come up. Um, I not sure if uh, Roger also wants to talk in regards to the BALA component, but I'll, I'll leave that to him if Roger's on, online here. I believe uh, staff have just promoted uh, Jennifer Thurkelson from bylaw and regulatory service. Right. Good morning, everyone. Through the chair, uh, I think Kevin summarized it well. It is a, uh, the dedicated resources, resource, sorry, is uh, intended to uh, 
for specifically the Byward Market and Elgin Street, um, doing those, you know, more of that hand neighborly um, patrols. Um, and if it's, but that being said, if it's specific complaints and in relation to a Hittenberg area, et cetera, uh, we still obviously have a regular complement of staff, but the dedicated resource is really intended for uh, uh, those very specific areas. Um, that being said, I think Kevin summarized it perfectly that, you know, we'll continue to work collaboratively with um, Kevin and his team uh, to address any concerns as they come in. And, and as complaints come in, we can obviously address them. Okay, thank you. Um, the, um, there, there is a lot of work that we've done in terms of clearway protection. Uh, I want to acknowledge that, but we are limited in space often from a business front door to curb. I think one of the most, um, most transformative uh, aspects of this program has been the on-street or street closure environment. And I, I wonder, Kevin, if you and your team can express what tools were uh, advancing to really um, push, pursue a, a constant, uh, clear way protection. And I guess through that, I mean favoring the on-street environment uh, for, uh, for patios. Yes, thank you, Councillor, through the Chair. Um, just quickly, uh, I'm gonna ask Lorraine DiNardo maybe to speak more specifically on, on how we're looking at the patios when the application submissions come in that do speak to the uh, free clear way as well as making sure our AODA standards are being um, are being met, and of course, you know, as things come up uh, through you know any type of complaints, we'll make sure and, and follow up on those specifically to look at them, because I think based on some of the photos that Mrs. Perry had provided, you're you're absolutely right. Like every situation is a little bit different as far as the complexities to what we need to modify, and. Um, we don't get it right the first time, then definitely it's something we need to go up and follow up on to have the made and modified to make sure that we address those concerns. Um, but I'll hand it over to Lorraine there. If we can speak more further on that. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, I'd say one of the biggest things that we are doing with Clearways is we work very closely with our accessibility partners. Uh, the one particular uh, location um, that had the planters in question. We did actually have the accessibility office go to site with staff to actually ensure that the, the, um, there were no concerns from an accessibility lens. Uh, the, other, the second uh, location she had actually indicated, we wouldn't have allowed uh, that type of clearway. So we obviously weren't aware of a situation like that. It's really key for us as, as issues arise, people make us aware so we can address those clearway issues. Um, with respect to placement of patios, it is it can be very challenging within the city. Uh, we really try, we have um, some guiding principles that we're really working with. Um, the two meter clearway is definitely top of mind, but we also are working to minimize those jogs along the sidewalks um, because of the, the challenges for navigation. So it really is gonna be on a block by block basis that we try to mitigate those um, those jogs and keep the, the clearway as straight as possible. That's good. And, and as a final question, I think to hit Cheryl, and, and frankly, I Cheryl, I have the same points for the record. So they were very, very on par, I think, with most community uh, that have uh, this mixed commercial residential environment. Um, the last point is, I guess, back to Kevin and, and Laureen around permit removal and specifically on the noise aspects and on the A-frame. I think there's been uh, a lot more clearer languages with the operators that uh, do set kind of a three strikes you're out and, and risk removal. And, and frankly, I, you know, again, for the record, the BIs have told us to be constant, clear. So then that the, the if there are bad apples, that there are consequences to that because it, it paints every patio in a bad, um, bad environment if we don't enforce uh, only the few, but there are a few sometimes that can be challenging. So I, I wonder if you can address uh, the per permit conditions and specifically for uh, noise amplification and A-frame um, A frame aspects. Uh, thanks, Councillor, through the chair. No, we'd be happy to. Um, again, I'll ask Laureen maybe to walk through those different items with you, um, but you're absolutely right. Our focus is that even if we do get noise complaints, we're working closely with bylaw services, that if it's not something or any information that they report to specifically on a patio, 
will also be sent to us. So we have that opportunity to uh, follow up with the permit holder and basically look at that step enforcement strategy to say it's not just a, a bylaw that you might get a fine. This is actually something we're going to review as part of your application. And it could be basically a point against you, uh, which could either, you know, I'll have Lorraine talk to the specifics, but ultimately we could be looking at withdrawing a permit if, if it continues to be a concern is, is our ultimate goal. So Lorraine, can you talk on that? Thank you, Councillor, for you, Chair. Um, we have, uh, similar to last year, we are going to be working with our stepped enforcement approach through uh, ROHUD. Uh, the first uh, step in our process is, as soon as my office is aware that there has been a um, issue with a patio, uh, regardless of what the issue is, uh, they will get a notification from us, where basically that is their first strike. And we're really intended to educate and work with the businesses to get them back on track. Obviously, our goal is compliance. Failure to comply, um, and we have a repeated offense, then we would step it up and we would basically issue what we call a notice violation. We would we'd be reducing their um, closing time to 11 p.m. Uh, currently, music is required to be turned off the patio um, at 11. So that would kind of align with trying to address typically the issue we are having is with music, then that would align. We would pull the, the closing time to an 11 p.m. If we are having continued issues, then the third step would be basically revocation of permits. So they basically would not be able to continue operating a patio within uh, the city's right of way. I can tell you that last year, we actually issued three uh, warnings um, specifically down in uh, Bywork for some issues that were brought to our attention. We did work with each of the business owners and I'm happy to say that we had no subsequent um, follow up with them. We were able to bring everybody into compliance. So that will be our continued approach again this year. Thank you, Chair, very important. And, and A-frames, uh, maybe Kevin and, and Lauren, just on the front that it is a condition, it's not a it's not a separate bylaw. So if, if there is a patio right of way and an A-frame beside it, the patio holder, permit holder is responsible uh, for the clearway blockage and, and there are consequences to that. Um, uh, Councilor to the chair. So yeah, I'll let Lorraine speak to that component, but we are working with bylaw services on that as well because there is a little bit of overlap there as far as the, the sign bylaw component on the A-frames. So this will be part of the review and complaint process for sure that we can't follow up with those particular issues. But I'll just um, ask Lorraine maybe to just to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, through, through you, Chair. Uh, yes, we did put that as a specific condition in our permit. Obviously, um, the permit requires uh, all operators to adhere to the provisions of the patio bylaw as well as any other bylaws, regulations, legislation. Um, but we did recognize that that it can be an ongoing issue. We did put that as a specific condition in the permit. So we will, again, continue to work with businesses to ensure that compliance, um, it, because the, the clearway is the priority. Great. I, again, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I do want to thank uh, staff. I think it's uh, from where we started a number of years ago. It's comprehensive, and there, there are consequences for those who uh, don't, don't uh, don't work with uh, with communities and BIAs and our staff on a standard. So I want to thank staff for it. I, I do. A few years ago, you remember our conversations around opening times and so on. I think we're well beyond that because of the uh, rigid uh, and clear system that's now been put in place. So thank you. Yeah, terrific work, uh, Councillor Floy. I, I support all your your statements there. Uh, we have Vice Chair Leeper, then Councillor Menard. Thank you very much. And uh, Councillor Fleury has asked uh, most of the questions and I've gotten the answers that I'm looking for. Uh, I do want to add uh, or get some clarity with respect to enforcement, stepped enforcement, and, and when a permit is uh, in danger of being revoked. Uh, the assertion that Ms. Parrott made is that sometimes we go out, we find that there is um, uh, no reason to provide a ticket. Uh, a complaint has been, you know, there's, there's not the evidence to provide a, a, a ticket to somebody. Can I just clarify that the complaint itself, though, is a warning sign to staff that triggers stepped enforcement? Yes, thank you, Councillor to the Chair, uh, well, Vice Chair in this case. Um, you're absolutely correct. So if we do get, um, our understanding is with bylaw services, we've asked them that even if you get it, a complaint and it's noise related or whatever the issue may be, we've asked them to 
still send it over to us. Still look at it from our patio perspective. We'll review it as part of the overall record for that particular permit holder, and we will follow up with them directly. <coughs> Even if by chance Bell Law Services did not have an opportunity to investigate it um, or do the, the follow up that particular night, we will still treat it as a complaint against that particular patio and Fantastic. follow up accordingly. Okay, no, that's uh, that's good, and I think that's what the community is looking for. With respect to the um, noise going past uh, the extended hour, uh, Ms. Parrott mentioned having the uh, restaurant door open, or you know, oftentimes it's one of those garage doors that's left open. If, for noise past eleven, are you including noise that is coming from the establishment inside? Thank you, Councillor. I may have to refer to bylaw for that one on how they're specifically appointing the type of complaint. I'm not sure if it's based on the um, the the person reporting it that it's noise or based on their investigation of what they are what they discover when they go to the particular site. Um, again, if it is pertaining to the patio in general, I would say we'd still treat it the same way from our perspective that we would follow up with that particular vendor to, to see if it was patio related and remind them of what the requirements are for their permit conditions. Um, Jen, did you want to speak on the bylaw component? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Uh, to answer the question through you, Mr. Vice Chair, um, absolutely. It covers both the interior noise that's emitting out and the actual noise on the patio itself. So past 11 o'clock when the patio is not allowed to have amplified noise, if that amplified noise is coming from inside the establishment through an open portal of some sort, you still consider that to be uh, an inappropriate uh, inappropriate noise then? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Councilor Menard. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, happy to see this report. Thank you to staff for your work in getting us here. I think we had a lot of innovation uh, last couple of years, uh, and this is a good continuation of, of some of that. Um, I wanted to uh, just talk about the fact that, you know, we, we need to keep doing this sort of thing, uh, prioritizing people, social activities, uh, the outdoor kind of market feel is very much uh, a need in Ottawa. Um, and of course, public patio space is also uh, important. Um, our office last year uh, did this in partnership with uh, city staff um, and uh, local business, local restaurant uh, last summer and created space using uh, our TTC uh, budget in some cases, as well as uh, worked with uh, local streets and um, you know, created more of a, a public space for people that could go anywhere along that stretch of, of Bank Street and then go to this patio and enjoy whatever it is that they, they purchased. Um, and so I, I just wanna make sure that sort of thing is, is viable in this plan. Uh, I think it is based on the motion I'm seeing and, and uh, you know, the, the right of way space on our roads, um, but I just wanna make sure that sort of thing is gonna be possible um, this year as well. Uh, thank you, Councillor, through the chair. Um, if I could specify, I think you're speaking more to road closures. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, that's right. It was a mid block. It was a road closure at Bank Street on a side street. Uh, and um, it allowed for a public patio space there. Um, and so, you know, the closure of, uh, of that access point. Uh, the rest of the road was open and accessible for another area, but uh, that one point right at Bank Street was was uh, was closed for a patio space. So thank you for the clarification. So uh, to answer the question in regards to road closures, yes, we are we're basically mirroring what we've done in the previous years. We've uh, confirmed in the report the process for the request for road closure, uh, and we have some details in regards to that. But it would definitely be a mirror from from previous years. But I could ask uh, Lorraine maybe to spot, uh, speak more in specifics on the road closure component. Would you like to? Uh, additional information on that? Sure, just that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor, through you, Chair. Uh, I know exactly which location you're speaking about, uh, the Glen Avenue. So yes, they would have to follow the same process that they did last year, where we have to get, because there's no BIA in that area, that they would need to get that two-third business support. But we are going to be following a similar process to last year in terms of the intake of those applications and uh, review. So the possibility is definitely there. Okay, thank you for that. And Lorraine, you were great last year. You met with a lot of the businesses on in my area 
I know you were very busy. Um, the team, I know Kevin, the whole team was very busy, but uh, you were excellent in just uh, working through some of the problems, the patio space, either on the sidewalk or on the, on the street. One of the things that came up though, is that, is that two third piece. We, we had so many discussions with so many businesses who wanted to convert right away space or use the, um, the parking space right in front of their business to convert, but it was difficult to implement um, if, if there was a, a block uh, sort of, you know, block by block approach. Uh, um, you know, if half of them on the block wanted to create this sort of uh, space, um, but we had to kind of abide by the two thirds of business on a block, it was made impossible for some of those uh, individual businesses in that area that wanted to act and wanted to take that space. So I just I just want to see clarity on, on what we're passing this year. If an individual business wants to change, uh, wants to work with the parking spot in front of their business, um, are they going to need two thirds of that whole block to change that one parking spot? Or is it that they can work with the local counselor uh, and staff to try to get something set up for themselves uh, in that area? Um, Councillor, say the chair, yeah, I'll, I'll ask Lorraine to speak to that component, but from my understanding, that is a different application than an actual road closure. I think for the road closure, we're looking at the same information as what you've indicated based on previous years. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, it's, um, it's about that degree of fairness uh, in order to say we're actually shutting the road down. We have to look at all of the logistics behind closing the road, you know, from access to buildings to EMS to deliveries, um, you know, there's quite a large component in closing the road. So we want to make sure that we have that two thirds uh, component to make sure that it's worth that initiative to, to, to go ahead and do that in particular review. Um, but I'll have Lorraine discuss more on the difference from maybe the sidewalk patio compared to actually using a parking space, because I think that's a little bit different if that's uh, okay with you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Through you, Chair. Um, Bank Street is definitely challenging for us. And I know, again, I, the, the area that you're referring to, the reason we had to be looking at the two thirds is technically along Bank Street there, we have, um, we don't allow street side patios because of the, um, the peak period parking. So that's where we ran into the limitations and the challenges and trying to find some creative solutions along uh, uh, sections of bank. And I, if I recall correctly, uh, that's where we were involving traffic and trying to look at some kind of more of a closure um, along those sections. And that's why we would be looking at the blocks. So it is definitely challenging for us to get those street site spots on bank because of those parking restrictions. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, we had good work last year where staff came back and said, look, peak hour restrictions, we don't really need to have them. So you can park on the other side during rush hour um, to have that extra park during that time. But the other side, um, you know, could be freed up. And uh, we were seeing traffic volumes with the one lane uh, do very, very well, and just fine. So I think I'm hopeful we can work together this year so that if there is some kind of market feel uh, along some areas of bank and other areas in the ward, that we can get to a point where all businesses can benefit if they want some space on the, um, whether it be the patio space or on the street, um, that we're creating the type of environment that people want to be out there for people um, and, uh, and supporting businesses in a, in a kind of strange time. So um, no, I appreciate all your work. And thank you as well for the noise uh, uh, issues. I know two uh, members of my office, uh, John and Miles, worked with you as well on some of the noise piece for the last time we talked about this. And it wasn't going to be included at first, but now it is. So thank you for, uh, for, for including that in the report. Really appreciate all your work. Thank you, Chair. Great. Uh, thank you, Council Menard. Uh, so uh, thank you, Cheryl, for coming by on this item. So on uh, item number two, Patio Innovation Program 2022, is that item carried? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to the first item. Uh, we do have a presentation. So this is how the order will, will run. We'll have the presentation from staff uh, about uh, Brian Kohlberg and Cumberland Transway Extension. Uh, then we will have motions. We do have a couple of them here, uh, one from uh, Councillor Kitts, one from Councillor Dudas, uh, and we'll go with those to be read out. Then we'll have the delegations, and then we'll go to questions to staff. Uh, so at this point, I'll turn the floor over to our terrific uh, staff. Uh, Jeff McEwen is doing our presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll start off the presentation, and then I'll hand it off to Angela Taylor. 
Uh, she's the project manager uh, that will be doing most of the presentation. Um, also with us, we have the consultants from Morris and, Morris and Hirschfield who were engaged by the city to undertake this project uh, and are here to assist with questions. With me is Andrew Harkness, pro pro project manager, and Kelly Roberts is the senior environmental block. And now I'll begin the presentation in French. Next slide, please. For situer le context de, de la planification, le plan directeur des transports de 2013 a identifié le prolongement de la voie de contournement de Blackburn Hamlet, illustré ici, en bleu ici, pour le relier à l'actuel boulevard Brian Coburn avec une transitway parallèle, illustré en rouge. Depuis la fin de, de, de 1980, Lorsque l'expansion de Orleans au sud de la route Innis a été envisagée, cette infrastructure routière et le transport en commun sera nécessaire pour soutenir cette croissance et les traces indiquées sont basées sur les évaluations environnementales originales de 1999. Puis, en 2016, la conception préliminaire a commencé par, pour le prolongement de la route et une analyse géotechnique a confirmé les conditions de sol très mauvaises qui ont entraîné des coûts beaucoup plus élevés que ceux prévus à l'origine. Et des solutions alternatives ont dû être explorées. Étant donné, le transitway de Cumberland partage le même corridor que le prolongement de la brocade de Blackburn Hamlet, il fallait également envisager une, nouveau, une autre solution de transit. Diapositive suivant, s'il vous plaît. Il s'agit d'un plan tiré de, de la plus récente enquête sur le terrain urbain vacant de 2019 d'Orléans qui montre important terrain vacant sur les croissances futures au sud du chemin Innes. La zone d'étude était supposée euh, à ce plan pour montrer l'infrastructure de transport et est nécessaire pour soutenir cette croissance. Notez que la zone d'étude traverse le centre vert de la CCN. Les passifs suivants, s'il vous plaît. Now, Angela Taylor will take over the rest of the um, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Jeff. So next slide. Yep, that's perfect. Because the project is crossing the green belt, engagement and collaboration with NCC staff was essential and was undertaken throughout the project. Through a comprehensive evaluation process in consultation with the NCC, a long list of road and transitway corridors was eventually screened to a short list of four corridor options as shown here. The NCC provided support for options one and four, and the next slides will present how we arrived at the technically preferred option seven. But first, a very brief description of each option will provide some context. Option one identifies the roadway in red and the transitway in blue on a new shared corridor southwest of Navin Road before joining the Blackburn Hamlet bypass, which would be widened to six lanes. At the west end of the Blackburn Hamlet bypass and Old Innes Road intersection, the new road turns southwest on a new alignment to connect to the future Innes Walkley Hunt Club, shown in the dashed gray line. This is needed to address future travel demand destined to Highway 417 and the South Urban Area. Note that the Innes Walkley Hud Club Link is a separate city project and is needed at the same time or in advance of this project for all of the four options. Next, we have option four and is similar to option one, except this option involves widening of Navin Road to four lanes, while the transitway remains on a separate corridor southwest of Navin Road. Option five now splits the road and transitway into two separate corridors with a transitway alignment similar to options one and four, 
In this option, Brian Colburn would be extended directly west to connect to the existing and widened Renault Road and Anderson Road, eventually connecting to the future Innes Walkley Hunt Club corridor. For option seven, the transitway would share the same roadway corridor as shown in option five, generally following along Renault and Anderson Road. Closer to Innes Road, the transitway would turn north to join Innes Road, destined to Blair Road and Blair Station. Next slide, please. Here is a summary of the evaluation results showing option seven as ranking highest overall and is therefore the technically preferred plan. The evaluation process was developed in collaboration with the NCC and based on the four broad groups of evaluation criteria, transportation and transit, the natural environment, the social and cultural environment and cost. Within this broad set of criteria, a total of 31 indicators and measurements were used to rank each of the four shortlisted options, and the rankings were then summed to determine the top ranking option. As shown on this table, option seven ranked first in three of the four evaluation criteria and came second on the natural environment. Based on this assessment, option seven ranked first overall. To test the robustness of this process, further sensitivity testing concluded that option seven also ranked first overall. Next slide, please. Following the selection of the preferred option seven, the design was further refined to minimize environmental impacts resulting in the functional design shown here. The road and transitway are bundled mostly along the same corridor and extends from Brian Colburn Boulevard, westerly approximately six kilometers for the road and 6.5 kilometers for the transitway. The road will connect to the existing and widened four lanes of Renault Road and Anderson Road and approximately 400 meters before Anderson Road meets Innes Road, the road and transitway split into two separate corridors. The road will continue westerly with a connection to the future Innes Walkley Hun Club, while the transitway continues along Anderson Road, dropping down under Innes Road before rising back up to the north side of Innes Road and then connecting to Blair Road. Throughout the corridor, a three meter multi-use pathway is located on the south side and away from the, from the roadway with connections to the Prescott Russell Trail, NCC pathways, the communities, and the Chapel Hill Park and Ride. There are also three new signalized intersections designed with opportunities for gateway features. Next slide, please. This is a cross section of the proposed road and transitway corridor shown facing east. It includes a 12.5 meter segregated transitway and a 21.5 meters for the four lane roadway and the separate three meter multi-use pathway to the south. To preserve the Greenbelt's natural and rural landscape, rural ditching of varying widths is proposed with context sensitive planting. The wide cross section reflects the desire to maintain the rural footprint and compatibility with the surrounding environment. Next slide, please. Next slide. Sorry, key highlights of this recommended ultimate plan are as follows. It improves transit travel time and reliability with direct uninterrupted travel between the Chapel Hill Park and Ride and Blair Road, as well as future transitway connections to Blair Station. It provides a new direct east-west arterial roadway link to the future Innes Walkley Hunt Club to address future travel demand between Orleans South, Highway 417 and the South Urban Area. It respects the Mare Bleu Ramsar boundary, which is a wetland site designated to be of international importance under the Ramsar Convention, as this plan is outside this area. It provides new multi-use pathways for pedestrian and cycling connectivity to Blackburn Hamlet, the Chapel Hill Park and Ride, Bradley Estates, Prescott Russell Trail, and NCC Pathways and beyond. 
It also improves safety for pedestrians and cyclists and removes two sharp 90 degree bends along Renault Road. This realignment shifts a section of Renault Road, which is currently within the Mare Bleu Ramsar boundary to outside the perimeter of this boundary. It reduces traffic on Anderson Road when implemented with Innis Walkley Hun Club, which will reduce impact on the environmentally sensitive Mare Bleu wetland wetlands and species at risk that surround Anderson Road. It preserves the natural character of the Greenbelt through context sensitive rural roadway and landscape, landscaping design. And finally, it's the least expensive of the four options. Next slide, please. Due to the high cost of the ultimate plan, interim transit priority measures are proposed to improve transit travel time and reliability and encourages sustainable modes of travel through supporting carpooling and adding new active transportation facilities. This is an overview of the two areas proposed for localized improvements. It includes widening of Innis Road from Blair Road Easterly for approximately two kilometers for shared transit priority and high occupancy vehicle lanes. A four meter multi-use pathway is proposed along the north side of this improvement area for safe connectivity between Blair Road and the Blackburn Hamlet community. At the intersection of Blackburn Hamlet Bypass and Navin Road, transit-only queue jump lanes on each leg of the intersection will help buses avoid congestion. Also proposed is a new multi-use pathway between Clareau Crescent to Navin Road to provide connectivity for the Blackburn Hamlet community. Next slide, please. Project costs were developed in accordance with the council approved project delivery review and cost estimating process and includes design, construction, property, public art and contingencies. Funding is subject to future capital budget priorities. The estimated cost in 2021 dollars of the ultimate plan is 128 million for the roadway, 178 million for the transit way and 22 million for the interim measures. The ultimate plan requires 42 hectares of greenbelt lands and 1.1 hectare of private property, while the interim measures require 1.2 hectares of greenbelt lands. Next slide, please. Extensive consultation was undertaken for this project and invo involved four rounds of meetings, each with the agency consultation group members and the combined business and public consultation group members. These groups consisted of technical agencies and regulatory bodies, community associations, business and landowners, interest groups, indigenous peoples, and the accessibility advisory committee. Also three rounds of public open houses were held with two in person and one online, as well as many individual stakeholder meetings with the NCC, the Rideau Valley Conservation Authority, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society and property owners. Next slide, please. Comments and feedback from the consultation included strong local community support for the project and option seven, Support for option seven from Friends of the Mer Bleu, concerns about the natural environment, climate change impacts, proximity to Mer Bleu wetlands and green belt impacts, general public support for options one and four, increasing traffic congestion from increased growth, requests for closure of Renault Road west of Bradley Estates to avoid cut through traffic, need for more active transportation connectivity to Chapel Hill Park and Ride and existing pathways, concern about noise and vibration impacts, and over 100 form letters were received from the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society against options five and seven. Next slide, please. Extensive consultation with the NCC involved a total of 14 individual meetings, which included three workshops to develop the evaluation criteria, and their input was included to reflect the importance of the Greenbelt and respect its policies. Once the evaluation process selected option seven as the technically preferred plan, NCC indicated that they did not support option seven nor option five as they do not conform to the Greenbelt Master Plan policies, 
it will result in fragmentation, isolation, and degradation of the environmental and agricultural lands, and it will risk more intensive use of Anderson Road, an arterial road that passes through the Mare Bleu wetlands. Next slide, please. Furthermore, the NCC will only consider options one and four as a starting point for discussion. An NCC letter dated September 2nd, 2020 stated that the NCC Board of Directors passed a resolution affirming that federal lands required to implement option five and seven of this project will not be made available. Also, the NCC neither supported nor rejected the interim measures and preferred an overall solution that is more consistent with options one and four. Next slide, please. This is a summary of NCC's concerns with option seven and its impacts on the green belt, which was compared to their preferred option one. The comparison resulted in option seven faring better than option one in five out of eight NCC areas of concern. And although cost is not an NCC concern, it is worth noting that the much lower cost of option seven when compared to option one. Next slide, please. As the ultimate plan and in interim measures requires an estimated 43 hectares of greenbelt lands, a preliminary compensation and mitigation strategy was developed in the form of a potential land exchange offering 47 hectares of city land within or adjacent to the greenbelt. This was discussed with NCC staff and the proposal was rejected, stating that the land is not of comparable quality and value to the greenbelt. They stated that the land serve a municipal function and have no ecological or real estate value to the NCC, and they would also need to take on additional operating and maintenance costs for these lands. They reiterated a willingness for further discussion with options one and four as a starting point, and were also non-committal regarding the one hectare of green belt land required for the interim measures. Next slide, please. The next steps for this project includes finalizing the two separate environmental study reports, the interim measures in March and the ultimate plan in October of 2022. And these reports will be posted for the 30 day public review period under the environmental assessment process. During this period, anyone can file a part two order or appeal this project. Note that the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks recently amended the process for filing a part two order or appeal and will only accept requests related to adverse impacts on constitutionally protected Aboriginal and treaty rights. To date, no such concerns have been raised. Lastly, city staff will continue discussions with the NCC for the interim measures. Next slide, please. This concludes the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Jeff and Angela for the presentation. Uh, as mentioned, we do have two motions and maybe Chris, you can help put uh, the first one on the screen. It's uh, Councillor Kitts and we'll get uh, Councillor Kitts to read that in. Thank you, Chair, happy to. And uh, I have also asked uh, Chris to circulate it. I think there was a formatting issue, but it should be done shortly. Um, I won't read all the whereases. I think the first couple cover what we just heard, but uh, I'll start sort of halfway through. So whereas the study team is reviewing a potential land swap of unopened city road allowances within the NCC Greenbelt with the assistance of the corporate real estate office, and whereas the NCC's opposition to the Brian Coburn Extension EA, which includes the Cumberland Transit Way, has forced car-centric development in South Orleans in recent years. And whereas according to the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force report, scarcity of housing has caused house prices to increase by 180% in the last 10 years. And whereas Ontario will need to build 1.5 million new homes in the next 10 years to address the housing supply shortage. And whereas prolonging this impasse will prevent the development of land in South Orleans at the density required to address the housing shortage and meet the goals of Ottawa's new official plan. Therefore, be it resolved that one, the minister responsible for the National Capital Commission be requested to direct the NCC to strike a joint committee with the city to try and resolve the impasse on the Brian Coburn Boulevard Extension EA with a deadline to report back to the minister and the mayor within 100 days 
Two, planning staff be directed to convene a summit with the Greater Ottawa Home Builders Association and major developers in Orleans to discuss strategies for mitigating the impact of development approvals while the impasse remains. Three, planning real estate and economic development staff be directed to bring a report to planning and transportation committees outlining options for short-term solutions and four staff be directed to fund any professional services from accounts 910610-2022, rapid, rapid transit EA studies and 908-210-2016 EA arterial road studies. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you for that. And uh, I hate to ask uh, Chris if you could put up Councillor Dudas's um, motion on the screen and we'll get Councillor Dudas to read that out. Yes, thank you, Chair. And just for clarification, it's, it's a direction to staff. Um, it is specific to allotment gardens that are adjacent to both um, Anderson Road, Renault Road, but also off of the Blackburn Bypass. So regardless of what option uh, ends up proceeding, it will have impacts on this garden. So that staff be directed to work with the Gloucester Allotment Garden Association to develop a mitigation plan to address the impacts of any of the proposed options for the extension of Brian Coburn Boulevard, and that the mitigation plan include, but not be limited to identifying potential new lands for Gaga's use. Wonderful, thank you very much for that. Uh, and I believe Chris, uh, that's it for the motions for this item. I I will go ahead and start to moving towards delegations. And uh, if we can start moving some of the delegations and first up is John uh, McDonald. Let's wait for John to get online. Uh, good morning. Great, John, welcome. Uh, you're no stranger. Uh, you have five minutes, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to this issue. So the Ottawa Valley chapter of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, or uh, CPAWS, represents uh, about 6,000 members, donors, and supporters uh, residing within the city of Ottawa who value the conservation and protection of our natural lands and waters. Uh, we are on record as opposing any new fragment of the green, any new fragmentation of the green belt, and uh, we strongly oppose city the city's preferred option seven for the alignment of Brian Coburn Boulevard, which would see a four to six lane highway uh, being built within Maribler's greater ecosystem. Uh, CPAW's supporters have sent some 1300 emails to the mayor, members of this committee and others in opposition to this project, uh, which in our opinion will only worsen the twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss, while leading to the degradation, fragmentation and ultimate loss of valuable uh, agricultural land. Um, as, as you know, the, the Green Belt spans over 200 square kilometers of recognized protect and protected ecosystems that are typical of undisturbed, unfragmented woodlands and wetlands. Um, unfragmented forests are extremely rare in our region due to competing land use for urban development and agriculture. Uh, these ecosystems are under significant development pressure from urban expansion and are, and are at risk of no longer functioning as unfragmented ecosystems. Uh, simply put, uh, green belt ecosystems are fragile and cannot support further fragmentation and you know, is mitigated with fencing and uh, you know, crossing structures for wildlife. Um, you know, the ecosystem will just can't support that. Um, over 60 species at risk call the green belt home and many, many spend their entire life in the Maribler sector and will be negatively impact, impacted by this project. Um, Environment Canada has identified many areas of the green belt, including Mare Bleur as critical habitat for declining species. Uh, these areas are essential for the species recovery. There is critical habitat for Blanding's turtle, spotted turtle, bank swallow, western chorus frog, to name but a few. Uh, we also know that Mare Bleur is a, is a hub for uh, you know, valuable climate research and uh, that function will be put at risk by this project. Um, in addition to that, uh, the Green Belt is the, or the Ottawa Green Belt is the largest federal green belt in the world and one of the largest urban green spaces in North America. Um, the Green Belt should be a point of pride for the city of Ottawa. Um, yet, uh, much like Gatineau Park, it benefits from little to no protection under the law. And the city continues to treat the green belt as a bank of land to be developed rather than the ecological, educational, and recreational gem it is. 
Um, Ottawa is con consistently rate ranked <laughs> among the, uh, the most livable cities in North America. And this is largely due to the proximity of green space uh, like that provided by the Greenbelt. Um, and moreover, if the pandemic has taught us anything is that we must protect our natural environment. Uh, residents of Ottawa overwhelmingly support conservation, including conservation of the Greenbelt. And uh, this project study was launched in 2018 um, you know, prior to the emergence of COVID-19, we know the patterns of work have changed and will likely continue to change as more and more people work permanently from home and many, other, many others adopt hybrid models of work. So before embarking on this project, we recommend that the city ask itself if this project is even still pertinent. Do the current and projected traffic volumes warrant the expenditure of public funds and the destruction of our natural environment? Uh, we cannot forget that natural infrastructure like wetlands play a critical role in managing water and mitigating flood risks. Uh, peat bogs are incredible carbon stores and sinks, and by uh, protecting them, we're closer to reaching our climate goals. Um, you know, simply put, Mayor Blur is irreplaceable, uh, and the destruction of this area cannot be offset by adding lands to the green belt elsewhere. Um, we are calling on members of this committee to reject option seven and instead direct city staff to work with the NCC to find an alternative, uh, making use of an existing fragment such as Innes Road and the Blackburn Bypass. And we further urge you to look at existing and emerging technology to optimize the roadway without necessarily widening it. Uh, you know, solutions like alternating traffic lanes have prov proven successful on the Champlain Bridge. And, uh, and with some, you know, out of the box thinking, I think these measures could be employed to increase carrying capacity during morning and afternoon rush hours as but one example. And I think fundamentally, though, as new communities are being planned and developed, you know, whether that's in Orleans, the southwest, southeast, um, we really need to be looking at ensuring that employment nodes are also being developed in those communities so that people can live, work and play in their neighborhoods. Um, you know, so this is not about keeping Orleans down, but rather developing Orleans in a sustainable, uh, in a sustainable way. So in closing, uh, you know, CEPAS, Ottawa Valley, we're, we're calling on the government, the federal government, to grant national urban park status to the Greenbelt as a means of protecting it from you know, this rapacious and irresponsible development and to ensure that future generations can enjoy it as we do today. And uh, we're asking the city of Ottawa to, to officially endorse this initiative to elevate the status of the green belt and to demonstrate Ottawa's commitment to halting and reversing biodiversity loss and to officially abandon plans to extend Brian Coburn Boulevard through the Mariblur ecosystem. Um, with that, I will uh, I'll leave it at that. Great, John, thank you very much. We do have some questions, Vice Chair Leeper. Thank you very much and thank you, Jonathan. Uh, when I look at the uh, proposed route. It runs to the north of Mel Bleu. Um, according to the uh, the materials we've been provided, it runs outside of the uh, protected Mel Bleu uh, ecosystem. Uh, to play devil's advocate, I, are the ecological impacts as severe as you would indicate um, this is you know most of it is running along a, an existing roadway. Um, there's a, a portion that's going through. Uh, agricultural lands, uh, is the ecological impact as, as devastating as you would suggest? Uh, yeah, we are of the opinion that, as I said, the green belt, uh, particularly in that sector, really cannot support any additional fragmentation. And we have to recognize as well that the Ramsar boundary is uh, very much an arbitrary boundary. It follows, I believe, a former rail line. Um, which is just a, you know, a straight line, the greater ecosystem is much, much larger. And so there will be uh, you know, trickle down effects from, from this project uh, all the way down to the sort of the main wetland complex area. So um, we are of the opinion that this is serious. Uh, it will fragment agricultural land as well, which you know, through the pandemic, we've seen that you know, food supplies have been disrupted. So I think we're very lucky to have all of this agricultural land in Ottawa, and we should be uh, we should be protecting it. Can you describe what some of those trickle down impacts might be expected to be with respect to the, uh, particularly the bog ecosystem? 
Uh, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, light and noise pollution to uh, runoff, uh, you know, whether that's salt and other, you know, road treating material. Um, you know, the, uh, the opening of a new corridor obviously enables invasive species to, uh, to gain access and, um, and uh, you know, light noise, as I mentioned, uh, you know, if there were to be spills on this, on this roadway, uh, all of that would have a, a, an extremely negative impact on the, on the ecosystem. I appreciate your, uh, your intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair, uh, Councilor Menard, and then Councilor Dudas. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you for being here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, go into a bit more of your um, assertions around uh, the protection of this, this area. Um, the, the proposed uh, road, which I understand at its narrowest point, the roadways would be uh, 50 meters wide. Um, it, they, they would require drainage. Um, as well as um, review of that shallow water table of the area. Um, I understand there may be a separation uh, from Mare Blue from Mud, Mud Creek uh, as well and uh, a rerouting. In your view, is this the sort of thing that disrupts wildlife movement in that corridor? Um, will the uh, silt and road salt that you've mentioned and the noise and light pollution uh, threaten wildlife? Um, such as uh, you know, breeding amphibians, birds, um, resident moose, and several species of turtles, uh, which are already suffering high mortality um, on existing roads, uh, would they become more vulnerable um, in your view? And then just finally, um, you know, are you supportive of one of the other options that exists, uh, or is the contention that um, there should be um, other solutions found, perhaps strictly focused on transit. Um, I just would like to know your, your contention with regard to that. Thank you. Um, certainly in terms of, um, you know, the, the impact of the roadway, uh, you know, any, any relocation of, uh, uh, you know, a creek or other uh, interventions in a, in a wetland, uh, I mean, those are very complex and very sensitive uh, environments. We've already lost, uh, you know, so many wetlands in and around Ottawa to development over the last number of years. Uh, we've allowed development to encroach right up to Maribler, um, on, in, on the sort of southeast side, and, uh, and that's continuing. Um, so, um, you, know, my, you know, my opinion is that, um, you know, this will have a negative impact on a host of species. Um, you know, you mentioned moose, uh, there are, uh, you know, coyotes in the green belt. Uh, and, uh, you know, projects like this will further fragment and, and degrade the, uh, the natural environment. And that's what, to a certain extent, leads to problems of wildlife in our communities, uh, because they are displaced, they have fewer places to go, and, uh, and that creates those human-wildlife conflicts. So we see, uh, you know, tremendous road mortality on Anderson Road through the, uh, the wetland area. And, um, you know, that, uh, you know, the fact that that's not been mitigated is, uh, uh, you know, a, a disaster in my opinion. Um, and, um, and like I said, uh, you know, the, the planting of trees and other things along this roadway uh, will, will not mitigate the impact of uh, noise, light, other, other, other things. So, and then uh, in terms of the, the alignments, uh, we, you know, we, we, we are concerned about any new fragmentation to the green belt, but certainly moving it up closer to or or incorporating it into Anderson, uh, not Anderson, but um, Blackburn or Innes Road uh, would would make sense to us. And uh, and certainly, if there is a potential to improve transit, um, to encourage you know transit oriented development, uh, that would be a, a solution that we would uh, we would support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Menard. Uh, Councilor Dudas. John, I, I want to thank you for being here. I actually have a million questions for you, but I'm going to try to keep it to a few because I'm sure that um, I'll have opportunities later on. So just, just 
I need some clarification on your point. You are aware, you've read the report, obviously, I'm hoping, that the higher habitat fragmentation is actually seen with option one, as well as the higher core natural area impacts and not option seven. And you spoke about the fragmentation and the inability of wildlife to, to pass through. Have you had an opportunity personally to stand at the roundabout and stare where the road will go? Have you had a chance to look back? I'm just, I'm not trying to be aggressive or anything. I just want to know, have you looked at where this road will go? Yeah, I've had the, uh, the opportunity to uh, go out into the, uh, into the green belt and to, uh, to get a sense of the, uh, the, you know, the landscape. And uh, I, um, I have, yeah. So did you see the hydro corridor that this would run adjacent to? The one that the NCC allowed to be built? Did you see that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm aware of the, uh, the hydro corridor. I mean, there's uh, certainly a difference between a hydro corridor and a, uh, and a highway in terms of oh, impacts. Oh, and I on, totally get that. Did yeah. you get a chance to drive along Andrew, uh, sorry, Renault Road and the S-curve, the one that actually goes into the Ramsar section right now of Maribor, the road that does exist and was approved by the NCC historically? Yeah. Okay. So you're aware then from reading the report that with the option seven or any of the other options, but with the new segment of road, we would be able to close that dangerous S-curve, take it out of the Ramsar section and move a kilometer and a half away from the Ramsar boundary and the Prescott Russell Trail. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And also you brought up Anderson. Sorry, I know I only have a couple minutes. So I just wanna make sure Anderson Road, I 100% agree with you. It is actually one of the highest um, mortality rates for wildlife crossings in the entire city. Are you aware that with option seven, with the savings that the city will find financially, that we would then be able to look at not only closing that dead end connection of Renault Road that buffers right into the Ramsar section, but we could have that conversation about closing Anderson Road as well? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm aware of that, uh, that possibility as well. Um... And, and I, I just wanted you to know as well too, with Mud Creek, with the, uh, Earth, uh, the Eastern urban um, community, sorry, forgive me, I haven't had all my coffee this morning, but once again, all of those development that's ha happening in the East End is flowing into the creek and the city has invested significant amount of money into improving that creek as it stands right now and will continue to do so on NCC land if option seven goes forward. Did you know that? I've, I'm uh, I'm familiar with uh, with the project, and uh, I'm certainly aware of all of those um, you know those uh, measures that are being proposed. Um, I mean, some of these roads do exist or do predate the uh, the establishment of the green belt, um, and so that does I think explain some of these you know odd corners and and things like that. And certainly, um, you know, we would hope that uh, wh whichever option is selected, that you know we do look at moving roads out of areas that are sensitive and or mitigating roads. Really. And, roads. and I, I want, you know, I can bring up your points about economic development and the fact that the East End has been stymied in its ability to do that because we don't have access to roads or transportation networks or transit. So I can bring that up, but I'm not going to because I'm sure I'll be able to talk about that later. But I did want to point out one more thing that option one through four, the one that the NCC is saying that they would talk to us about, are you aware that the forest that surrounds the Blackburn Bypass right now is actually considered a core natural habitat and that the, the mature trees that line the bypass not only buffer the community of Blackburn Hamlet, but also all of that agricultural land that is actually right now being farmed, the ones that Bud Gardens is using, the ones that, like once again, all of that would be massively impacted by options one through yeah, but I mean, in, in a situation like that, it would make use of an existing fragment. And obviously, we're, we're not, you know, we, we don't like to see uh, trees being lost. But in my opinion, there's less impact, you know, expanding something that's already existing, rather than creating something new. So that's the, the rationale for, for supporting uh, making use of an existing, uh, an existing cut, essentially, across the Greenbelt. Okay, and you, but you do know that we would be utilizing the existing far end of Renault Road, the furthest away from the Ramsar section, and it's just a small segment of road that we're talking about right now. 
So once again, we're still talking about using existing roads. We're just looking at a new piece that runs along a hydroporter along disused agricultural land, as opposed to taking out mature wooded trees that are homes to, well, we see tons of coyotes in this area and lots of those things. So I, I just, we're gonna hear a lot of information today. And I have to tell y'all like, Development, regardless of what it is, road infrastructure is always going to have an impact. There's no way around that. So I just want to make sure that information is clear and we can all come away from this conversation with our own opinions. But I just want to make absolutely sure that everybody understands what it is that you're bringing forward. And I do appreciate, John, your, your uh, delegation. And thank you for that. And I mean, certainly I'm uh, more than willing to, uh, you know, I'd be, it'd be a pleasure to meet with you, your staff and, and others to look at how we can, you know, work together to address, you know, both conservation and economic development in a way that, you know, makes sense for, uh, for, for everyone. I'd take you up on that in a heartbeat. Thanks, John. All right. Yeah, I, I echo that as well, John. A terrific uh, delegation today. You raise many uh, overarching environmental concerns. I, I know you work quite closely with the NCC. They fund a lot of stuff. So all the items that you did list, I think is very critical that we hit all of those uh, regardless of what option gets selected. So I wanna thank you for coming out today. Uh, I'll go to our next delegate. Uh, I'm looking on the board. I don't see Alexander Ray. Is Alexander Ray on this call? I'm right here. Ah, terrific, wonderful. So if you haven't been here before, you have five minutes uh, for your delegation and the floor is yours. Great, I sent in a presentation. I was wondering if that could get pulled up. Absolutely, just give us one second. We'll get that up right away. There you go. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate it. And I take the five minute rule very seriously. So I, I appreciate the chance to talk about this. If we wanna jump right into things and we could advance to the next slide. Um, there are four broad themes I want to talk about. So that gives me a bit over one minute per theme with a couple of minutes of, of extra time here. Um, to start off with, and, and really building on what the, the counselor just said, the communication for this plan ha has really confused me in a lot of ways. Um, I've seen a lot of letters and, and presentations in the media published about this. And they often talk about you know, the, the impact on wetlands or the environmental impact being preferable with option seven, which wasn't what was found in the evaluation matrix. Um, and, and in particular, uh, the, the city's assessment found that there was a greater impact on wetlands, despite you know, letters being published saying that there was a lower impact for option seven. Moreover, the discussions around this plan are, and, and the wording of the motion indicate that it's either option seven or nothing which doesn't seem like a fair comparison and certainly isn't supported by the city's planning where it's several options or nothing as opposed to the NCC is preventing all development instead of pushing it in a specific direction. It seems, and, and looking at the report, the cost is mentioned in the first paragraph and everything else doesn't get on until much later. That cost apparently is the primary issue, but it's not weighted like that. And, and that's not what the communications has been like, which, which doesn't, doesn't work on a, on a couple levels. Mo moving along, if we can advance to the next slide, please. Taking a look at the, the assessment report and the community feedback, there's a lot of discussion about how this plan is well supported by the community, but that's not what the, the data says. That's not what the results show. The overwhelming comments were in opposition to option seven. These were primarily focused on the environmental concerns, but there was also a significant number of concerns about the transit impacts. Um, and that's what I'm going to get into a little bit more. Um, if we can flip to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, one thing that doesn't make sense with the, the way this is being talked about and presented is that the idea that option one doesn't meet the transportation needs. Um, and the city's scoring, it does. And, and looking at the traffic assessments, op Blackburn Hamlet bypass with widening is more than capable of handling the anticipated transit or the anticipated car needs. Um, there's sufficient capacity under the widening and, and the city's long-term design. Moreover, option one also reduces traffic through both Anderson and, and Renault roads. Um, moving traffic farther away from those communities and, and farther, you know, north onto the protected bypass areas. 
So both options that, that were evaluated meet the transit requirements and, and do a good job with it. It's not option seven solves this issue and option one leaves traffic rumbling around dangerous S-curves and through communities. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So this is where I started, um, and this is what I want to wrap up with. Um, I moved to Blackburn, my wife and I moved to Blackburn Hamlet about a year ago. And when we were looking at houses, I, I work in engineering, and so I like to do as much research as I can. And I saw that there are two rapid transit stops on the, on the master plan. I thought that's fantastic. We'll have rapid frequent transit throughout the day um, at some point in the future. Uh, and then I saw this, I was like, wow, like we're just removing these two stations. The area south of Innes Road is identified as an equity priority neighborhood. It's got a lot of, a significant amount of medium and high density housing within 800 meters of both stops and has one of the highest percentages of rental households in the city, certainly within the suburban areas. But more than anything else, the neighborhood has a 24% transit share. Um, and again, one of the highest percentages in suburban areas. One minute remaining. The TMP identifies that we want to have um, rapid transit stops within 800 meters uh, as much as possible. And this is what option one proposes, right? as well as option four, compared to option seven, which take this away. I recognize that it's already being served, um, but rapid transit is, is an entirely different priority than, than frequent bus services. We could jump to the last slide. Thank you. Um, I can't sum this up any better than the city can. In the city's assessment, uh, option one scored uh, equally good or better in, in almost all the categories compared to option seven. It made sense. It was a great idea at the time, and it doesn't make sense to deviate from that. Uh, thank you. Pause my alarm there. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity to present and talk about this. Um, and it's, it's exciting to be part of the planning process. Great, and welcome to the East End. Uh, we do have a question from Councillor Menard. Thank you very much for your presentation, Alexander. It's good when we have delegations that dig into it and uh, look at uh, the, the, the data and the details uh, on the transit impacts. I'm just wondering if you can go into more details on that option seven with those rapid uh, transit stations that would be uh, removed. Uh, what's your understanding of why, why they would remove them? Um, and I, I also uh, have another question, but I'll wait to hear the first answer. If we can pull up the slides again, I've got a supplementary slide that talks about this. That's not too much trouble. Uh, if you could jump to slide 13, it's, it's the last of the supplementary slides. So these are the two stops in question that have been on the TME planning TMP planning horizon for as far as I could dig back into it, um, Blackburn Hamlet East and Blackburn Hamlet West. By routing the bus rapid transitway south of the bypass, we can't include these two stops. You'll notice that I've got the equity priority neighborhood overlay turned on as well as the 800 meter radius. There's a lot of housing that would be right next to these frequent all day, 10 minute service or, or you know, in that range stops um, compared to, to existing service. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes, uh, that's, that's very helpful. Um, is your contention that the removal of those stops may lead, in fact, to more, um, you know, car-centric travel um, rather than uh, just a, a shift over um, to where the proposed option seven uh, would go? Oh, absolutely. Um, We're trying to encourage uh, additional transit usage and making transit available. Right now, there's reasonably adequate transit um, for morning and evening commutes, um, but there, there are two problems with leaning too heavily on the existing routes. Uh, the first is there's no guarantee that once a designated transit way is built right south of Blackburn Hamlet, that OC Trans was gonna to continue to run high frequency bus service uh, down Innes Road when there's a, a better option that has more capacity required um, in the south area of Orleans. And the other problem is, is that while there's good morning and evening commute service, there's they're very limited service throughout the day. Having protected transit way with faster, more frequent service addresses that in the long term. It allows for future development, as we know density and, and existing infill is a city priority. And that's much easier to do in the Blackburn Hamlet area if transit capacity is increased through the construction of transit way stops. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for the questions.
Great, uh, Councilor Dudas. Wonderful, thanks to see you, Alexander. Uh, we had a great conversation on the phone. I know we're gonna disagree on some things, but actually, could we get that same slide back up again? I just, so while we're getting the slide up, I just wanna ask, and I, I once again, I know we chat about this, and if we disagree, that's totally cool. And I, I really but appreciate are, the time you, you took walking me through this. It, it helped a lot to understand this. Hey, and you know what? The democracy is about having conversations about disagreements and coming to conclusions. I'm very, very happy with that. I'm so glad you're in the Blackburn Hamlet community. I just wanna go again and look at, uh, I don't wanna leave people with the impression that Blackburn's underserved. Currently Blackburn, and, and I just wanna make sure you're aware of this, but if you have any questions, it has the 28, which is a community bus that goes up and down almost every single major road. It will connect directly to Montreal Station, which you can't see from this map, but it is literally a two minute jog down Bear Brook Road. And once Montreal Station opens in 2024, 2025, we'll be able to probably even walk for some of us with mobility uh, uh, you know, capacities. I'm gonna take my bike down to the station. It's gonna be a matter of like a five minute bus ride. Plus, we also, along Old Innis Road, so you can all see, so there's the bypass where the two transit stops are located on this map. You can see on Old Innis Road, we actually have the 25. So that used to be the old 94. You could take that all the way to Millennium, or right now you could take it all the way to Blair. And if you're hopping to go to Blair, it's probably about like a 15 minute jaunt, 20 minutes if there's traffic. So bus rabbit transit, in terms of Blackburn right now is currently well served. So my question to you, Alexander, and I know I've posed this to you before is, knowing that you're, you're, you're saying that this would improve transit to residents in Blackburn who all live in that green area or a little bit in that yellow area around Old Innes, including schools, seniors' homes, uh, we have uh, lower income housing uh, for single moms, we've got uh, all sorts of you know, needs along that corridor, including businesses. Why do you think that putting two transit stops on the bypass, which the speed limit is like 70, 80, it, at the best of times when people aren't speeding, walking through woods, because once again, that's NCC land, so we'd have to find a way to work with them to build walkways through, but once again, wooded areas unlit, to stand by an 80 kilometer road is a better option than having the 25 and the 28. Because I, I have to say, I can't imagine that the OC Transpo would say, let's run two parallel buses. They'd probably cancel the 25. Great, and, and I can address that uh, pretty specifically. Um, I, I take issue with your characterization as a few people in that yellow shaded area. That yellow shaded area is about 34 to 3,700 people, depending on which census we're looking at, um, in an equity priority area with a high rental share and a high transit share. These stops are specifically focused on the area south of Innes, which isn't nearly as directly served um, under existing systems. It's, it's within walking distance of the 25. The other points I'd make, and I've, I've been reading the city's transit plans for a long time, every time a report comes out, whether it's for the LRT or for the transit way, the original reports really emphasize that existing transit is not comparable to grade separated rapid transit. The justification ports for the original transit way, which I'm, I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with, uh, emphasize time and time again that the transit way is a unique piece of infrastructure that is, provides a service that isn't comparable to buses. I have a lot of concern that Route 25, the old 94, won't continue to run with nearly the same frequency once the east side of Orleans is served with its own designated transit way. And there'll be a rapid road running south of Blackburn Hamlet, regardless, I suspect OC Transpo, would, which would make sense, will continue to route things along that. Um, whether or not these stops are there, so it makes far more sense to have stops available. I, I only have one more question, and I'm sorry for taking up the committee's time so much, and Alexander, I really do appreciate you being here, is have you taken transit from South Orleans? Have you hopped on a bus in Bradley Estates and tried to get downtown. And I, I ask that because it, once again, we're talking about transit in this slide. We're talking about communities who have existing and historical service, two buses in fact running through it. And I'm just wondering, have you taken buses to get 
through and around South Orleansville. I've taken them in Blackburn Hamlet, haven't ventured over to Bradley Estates to try it. The transit way, and, and I, I recognize I've read the city's report that adding these stops will add a, a moment of time to the bus rapid, the Cumberland transit way from South Orleans to Blair. The amount of additional time though is, is projected to be very small. It's not, this route does not significantly compromise the transit way in Orleans and enhances the transit way in Blackburn. So this alignment. So the majority of population growth in the East End, 41% in fact, is gonna happen in South Orleans in those communities. We see the development happening every day. They need access to transit. They need access to the bus rabbit transit. Oh, absolutely. A long time. So I, once again, nobody wants to pit communities against each other, but when we're looking at who is going to benefit and who's gonna to choose to take transit, particularly to the LRT, but even that future South End connection, which we're lacking right now, but once again, I, I, I just, I wonder, you know, how would putting more bus stops next to Blackburn Hamlet through the woods, how that would make sense? But this brings back to my concern about the framing. The, this is not a, a transit way through South Orleans or nothing. This is a transit way through South Orleans and Blackburn Hamlet or a transit way through South Orleans discussion, in my understanding. Okay. I really appreciate you you coming today and I look forward to meeting you at Timmy's for coffee soon. <laughs> I would love to. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Alexander. Uh, our next delegation is Anton Schrimm. And I see Anton on the screen, so this is great. You have five minutes, sir. Uh, I'm just seeing you do have, have a, a presentation. Correct. We'll get that loaded up for you right now. Uh, thank you. I'm Anton Shire with the South Ridge Community Group. I've been involved with this since the mid 90s. Um, so it's nice to see that it's progressing to some extent. I want to make it clear uh, option seven is not a new road through Mayor Blue, despite what you're going to hear in the media or social media or from others. It's primarily on a very heavily used Renault road. Next slide. That's the general focus of the EA. Next slide, please. The previous EA just didn't look at the whole area of, uh, that we're looking at now, which is the information that was used in the 2013 agreement with the NCC. Next slide, please. Core natural areas of the green belt are in dark green. You can see the woods that uh, we we're just talking about just outside Blackburn Hamlet. It's ecologically sensitive habitats that contain support unique threatened or endangered species and natural features. You'll notice Mare Bleu and the wetlands you can see there and the woods of the bypass of the same designation. Next slide, please. So this is Renault Road, uh, the road that the uh, primarily option seven to use. There's something in the neighborhood of 13,000 cars a day using that road, very close to Mare Bleu. It's uh, peak traffic counts, I think in 2019, 750 cars an hour on a roadway capacity for 300 cars. Many people want to get to the south of the city and take the shortest, quickest route, which is that they do along Renault right now. Next slide, please. The yellow is the Ramsar boundary of Mare Bleu. You can see Renault Road crosses the Mare Bleu boundary. Next slide, please. Option seven is in purple. It doesn't travel through any of the core natural areas of the green belt, and it can take traffic off Renault. Next slide. Option seven will take the, the traffic off as mentioned earlier, particularly if Renault is closed at Brian Cover in the west end of Bradley Estates. So the traffic, that 13,000 cars is moved northwards. Next slide, please. Next slide. It all can, also can allow consolidation of farmland. And the previous slide shows that Renault crosses Mud Creek in two locations, which would no longer be the case. Next slide, please. Option one is the in orange. I mistakenly said it's eight lane or 10 lanes of traffic, but that's wider in the Queensway. Um, it's through mature tree canopy in the, in the core natural area around the M there. If you can have the next slide, please. The woods on both sides of the highway are exactly the same. 
And the M would be the location of one of the transit stations was just discussed. The other one would be close to the I. You can see that the closest house is about 200 to 300 meters away from those transit stations. And it's a similar distance to just walk over to uh, Old Innes Road to get on the bus, which at rush hour at least can take nine minutes to get to Blair. And you can also go south to the new LRT at uh, Montreal Road pretty quickly. Next slide, please. Um, if we had go with option one, you'll still have 13,000 or more cars per day going along Renault Road. There'd be no buffer to Mer Bleu, which option seven provides. And, and Renault is a very dangerous and overcapacity road. Put a little uh, icon there of a cyclist. There's a ghost bike there from one of the uh, cyclists that was killed in the last couple of years. Next slide, please. Few people from Navin or South Orleans will travel all the way up to the bypass to use option one. It just doesn't make sense. They're gonna keep going along Renault Road to get to the south of the city or head up to uh, the bypass over by Anderson Road. One minute the remaining. Stage. Next slide, please. Um, basically, Renault Road will be upgraded with option seven. It could be safer for wildlife, drivers, pedestrians. Um, this Orleans South and Navin residents will have much direct, more direct access to the LRTs. Without option, with option seven, there will be none of that fixing up of Renault Road, no wildlife safety mitigation, still two right angle road crossings, and the, the two crossings of Mud Creek. I would encourage the or Transportation Committee to move forward with option seven. It's the best for all parties. And I think if you look at the details of the, of the assessment with the NCC, it's, it's listed as the best for the green belt uh, in the criteria under social um, criteria. It's also listed as best for agricultural land. And I think it's the best option overall. Thanks for your time. Great, uh, thank you, Anton, for that. Uh, looking on the board, we got um, Councillor Luloff followed by Council Menard. Thank you very much uh, for coming out today. Um, I take the route that you described uh, up to Hunt Club every single day uh, to, to drop my daughter off for, for daycare. Um, I, I agree 100% with your assessment that um, what's being proposed in one and four just simply don't make sense. Uh, people are not going to take that road uh, and they'll continue to use, that, to use Anderson and Ridge to, to make their way up to Walkley or to uh, find another way, uh, you know, through Davidson or what or what have you to to make their way to the south end. Um, I do believe that the only way that that we can uh, even look at closing Anderson Road is to look at option number seven and to give people a uh, a, an option uh, that makes sense uh, to connect the two um, south uh, suburbs um, of our city uh, in a way that's responsible and adds uh, and adds transit options. Um, I just wanted to thank you very much for coming out today. I, um, I, I really, really appreciate uh, your analysis and, and I agree with everything that you said uh, completely. So thank you very much. Great, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Menard and then Councillor Dudas. Thank you uh, very much. Um, I just want to uh, ask the delegation about uh, the Renault Road um, changes that would occur with the proposed design. Um, so my understanding is it, it, there would be a widening that would occur there, um, compared to what's there now, including at the intersection, um, with Anderson, um, meaning more traffic could access Anderson. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, definitely it would be a, a wider road. I think as the, uh, the planning, uh, presentation suggested if we can connect to the Ennis Walkley link, people will not have to do what uh, Councillor Luloff was talking about. Um, I think you can save uh, 4,200 cars going down Anderson Road a day by connecting the inner walk Ennis Walkley link, uh, which can save about 700 tons of greenhouse gases a year. And obviously the wildlife mortality on, on Anderson Road would be dis greatly decreased. Um, you know, I, I think the thing we have to realize too is that uh, a lot of those cars are traveling right through Bradley Estates, which is a residential neighborhood. And I know there's been uh, 
two other incidents with uh, between pedestrians and and uh, and uh, cars as well through there. Um, I think by upgrading the Renault Road, putting in wildlife mitigation measures, which are not going to be there if we go with option one, that's very important. And I believe as well the roadway itself, it's probably uh, crumbling in many locations, and I think it can only improve the uh, uh, the environment basically where where Mud Creek uh, is crossed. Like I, I think it can fix things up, which isn't going to happen unless. Uh, it's just going to get more and more traffic. Um, the other thing I did a little study the other day, how long does it take to get from Chapel Hill on Google Maps to South Keys? It takes an hour and 48 minutes by bus. It takes 20 minutes by car. So what's the logical thing for somebody to do if they need to go to the south of the city? And I think anyway. that's part of, uh, I appreciate that, um, Anton, and I, I think that's part of the uh, the overall concern I have, and I'm not, you know, in favor of option one or option seven or uh, any of these options, really, but uh, we need to improve uh, the transit accessibility for the east end oh, of definitely. the city. That, that's my that's my primary goal uh, in, 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 yeah. all, in all of this discussion, um, but, but what I'm seeing instead are options which drastically expand driving options more than transit, and you know, as you likely know, the more you expand roads, the more cars want to use them. So even adding a transit line while widening the roads for more traffic is going to induce more cars to take that line of, yeah. as you're exactly as you're saying, right? Uh, we're not inducing the, 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 the um, demand for transit, we're inducing the demand for cars. And that, that's the opposite of what, what uh, we, we should be doing. I did want to just on the one point you're making about environmental effects and, and climate change, option seven did score uh, the worst uh, on the climate change metrics, um, which which failed in that section. So I'm just wondering what your view is of, of why that would be the case. Well, I have, a, I have a few comments. I agree with you regarding transportation. And I think that the option seven provides a much better transportation option for the uh, uh, transit option for the Orleans South community, I think. The two transit stops at Blackburn would be white elephants, basically, um, and it would just slow commuters. So, you know, I think when we're talking about transit, to me, we, we need to use the carrot, not the stick approach. We need to give an opportunity. It, the transit has to be good for people. They have to be able to get places quickly. People will take it. But if, if it's really encumbered and doesn't work, then people are going to take the other options, which is the vehicle. Um, anyway. I'm not sure I answered you. your question on that no, one. I appreciate, appreciate being here. Thank you very much. Oh, I, I, the one other point I was going to make is um, one of the earlier presenters talked about Champlain Bridge. And, you know, I, I think that's an option for option seven. You know, to me, why don't you have uh, two lanes or four lanes? One lane is a dedicated transit uh, uh, lane going westbound, because that's basically what we're talking about. Um, going westbound or an HOV lane in the, in the morning and then coming back in the evening. And then you could reduce the roadway to, to just probably expanding Renault Road within the existing boundary. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Council Menard. Uh, we have Councilor Judas. Just really quick. I was doing the math the other day on how long I've spent of my own personal life working on this project back when I was in the Community Association. It was well over 12 years. But Anton, you mentioned at the beginning of yours, how long has this been discussed, the need for an extension of a road through the East End? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because if you go back to when the Blackburn Bypass extension was looked at, that was when the first EA was done to look at transit and transportation, which I think was in 1981 or something. I mean, then it proposed something very much similar to option seven, if you look at the old data. Um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, it, it, you know, it's been early 90s for sure. I mean, I, I was involved pretty much at the start, the transportation committee meeting. I, I know three of my neighbors have passed on since uh, we started this process. Um, you know, I think at that time it was supposed to start around, you know, I don't know. 2010, 2015, and here we are still discussing this and trying to get it sorted out. 
just the, the one final point I didn't get in my presentation, but I got the mic right now. I heard some of the earlier people talking about uh, lighting being an issue for, for wildlife on this, uh, this roadway and would scare them away. Uh, number one, I have two coyotes that visited my back door uh, recently, which is kind of cool since I live on Navin Road. But the other point is there's no lighting on Sir George at Chancarche Parkway. There's no lighting on the bypass. And I don't see why there would need to be any lighting on this facility, other than obviously at the, the key interceptions. Um, so, you know, I, I don't see that being a concern. And I, I think, you know, really the, the wildlife, I mean, I have turkeys in my backyard, I have deers, there's a lot of traffic around. Wildlife adapt. And if you can put in proper wildlife, uh, you know, mitigation uh, tunnels and those sort of things, where you see the, the wildlife walking together under the tunnel, you know. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the environment. It's very, very important. Um, but uh, anyway, that's all for me. I hope, uh, thanks for your time and uh, look forward to how things progress. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the terrific uh, delegation. I don't see any other questions. So thank you, Anton. Uh, next, we're on uh, delegation number four of 19. Uh, Nick Grover. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? We can. You have five minutes. Uh, the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so my uh, first credit where credit's due, um, it's good to see a city project that is giving space and emphasis to multiple modes of transportation, not just cars. Um, we need to do this across the city uh, to better enable and encourage low carbon and affordable transportation. Um, but what's disappointing about this um, is that I've been hearing a point that's been debunked for a long time. It's that giving more road space to cars will alleviate congestion. Um, sometimes we talk about this in terms of creating new lanes for cars. In this case, we're also talking about um, adding more lanes for buses in order to free up space for cars. The effect is the same. Uh, research and countless failed real life cases show this isn't going to work. It, it makes congestion worse and, and pollution worse in the short term. Um, and this is because more cars are encouraged to use the space. It's the principle of build it and they will come. Um, yes, building a transit way will get more people onto the bus, which is a good thing. Um, but more road space for cars will also attract more driving. Um, if that's the mode that the, the city is designed for, that's the mode people will use. Um, it seems a major tension with this plan is the limited space and that an expansion plan would intrude on a lot of green space. Um, we're seeing option seven presented as the low impact option, but it's still 42 hectares from, from the presentation, which is, uh, it's not great. Um, I think there's another option. Um, there was a, a large meta-analysis published in the early 2000s. It was actually a replication st uh, study of a previous study. Um, it looked at about 70 cases, talked to dozens of experts, and they basically found that, um, it's counterintuitive, but they found that when um, road space for cars was reduced, uh, and especially when it was converted for other modes, uh, congestion and pollution were reduced, not just on the road, but in surrounding areas. Um, why? Because buses and bikes, uh, they simply carry more people per square meter of space, uh, a lot more in fact. Cars are very spatially inefficient. So for this project, um, where my head went is instead of adding um, another lane to this limited space, why not convert an existing lane um, to a dedicated bus lane? Um, this would of course need to be coordinated sufficiently to connect other routes allow people to journey by bus. Um, but this is an approach that would actually save space and alleviate congestion um, because you're using the current space and you're just redesigning it to encourage the modes we want to encourage, the modes that carry more people in fact. Um, we've spoken a lot about the best options of the ones on the table, but I don't think any of them fully reflect what we need. Um, there's a climate crisis, not only at our door, but sitting in our living room. We need to take a hard line against destroying green space, increasing emissions, and relying on cars. 
electric vehicle uptake is way too slow and it's not going to save us or address our spatial limitations. We need to put transit and biking at the center of our urban planning, not just of an array of things alongside cars. Um, so I say, let's challenge ourselves. Let's devise a plan that devotes no additional space to cars and leaves all natural space intact and see what we can come up with. Uh, the best time to be bold, creative and experimental about urban design was about 20 years ago. We failed, but the second best time is now. I don't see that we have much of a choice, so let's reconsider how we can do things even better. As a final point, um, if we want to get serious about accommodating more people in our city and population growth, um, we should acknowledge that we don't have to make them uh, travel or drive so far in the first place. We should acknowledge that we can. Thank you. Um, we have to acknowledge that we can't keep paving space for roads and parking into infinity. We have to shrink the distance that people have to travel to begin with by any mode. Um, we should be looking at walkable neighborhoods with amenities less than a car ride away and taking that seriously. So I know that's not part of the discussion today, but because you are all counselors and on various committees, I think that's something we need to be talking about. If we're talking about this insane population growth and how we need to have more roads and that they will inevitably lead to destruction. I don't think they have to. We got to think of some better ways. So thank you. Like you've been here before. All right, uh, Council Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. And uh, thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, this is largely, you know, my concern is that our official plan that we've just minted, newly minted, um, is you know, polar opposite to what we're, we're seeing here with the road widening. Uh, even the interim measures include widening lanes um, on Innis uh, uh, as a four lane road. One of those would be transit HOV, but, but three regular traffic lanes, uh, part of, you know, the intent of the interim measures is to introduce a modal shift, but you can't do that if you're offering more space to cars um, than to transit. And, you know, I'm all for the service of transit um, into the East. And, and it's really incredibly frustrating, I think, and aggravating that the communities of Bradley Estates, Eastboro, Trails Edge were constructed without proper transit support. That's what we should be talking about here. And that's really the only thing we should be talking about here, given the climate emergency. And so I guess I wonder to question to you is, I think, I think we're on the same page here is, the revisiting of this in a new transportation master plan, which is supposed to be coming uh, imminently, yet we're going ahead with this in advance, it appears. I mean, should we not wait until that transportation master plan shows the effects of what has happened here and focus in on what the new official plan says, which is transit-oriented development uh, without the expansion of uh, new road uh, lanes and wider width for, uh, for driving? Yeah, and, and I'll just add, because I thought of it as, as you were speaking, um, you know, in addition to being um, very carbon intensive projects, uh, road widenings are also incredibly expensive for the amount of space they're serving. And so I think as everyone here knows, uh, city budgets are pretty limited. So doing that is, is not just taking space away, it's also taking funds away from, from transit or from other concerns. Um, but yeah, to speak to your question, um, yeah, I think we need to get the larger priorities in order. That's, that's, I think that's my intervention today is that I, I think the priorities are, are still off um, and we need to get those in line. Um, it, if we're going to be moving people, it, it should be predominantly centrally by transit. Um, but I think we mainly have to look too at how can we not need to move so far? How can we have more accessible areas, more areas that we can walk so that if population is growing, um, we don't need to say, well, well, how can we support all these cars? It, it won't be a question of cars. It'll be a question of, you know, there's walkable areas. They can access amenities by, by walking. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Great, thank you. I don't see any further questions. Next up, we have Heather Buchanan, and I believe Heather does have a presentation. So we'll give uh, Chris a couple of seconds to load up that presentation for us. Morning. Good morning, Heather. Thank you for the time. And um, I understand um, I'm wearing actually two hats. I'm a member of the Friends of Mer Bleu, and I'm also a member of Bradley Estates, and I am presenting on behalf of Bradley Estates today. 
Um, I'd like to just go to the first slide because I'm, I know I'll over go over my five minutes. I won't read through all of this, but just to comment on what everybody else has been saying, this is not a new problem. This is a problem that originated and has been identified as far back as 1993 in the original Gloucester plan that a route out of this area uh, incorporating transit and uh, able to move cars and people was absolutely critical. Fast forward to 2022, we're now 29 years later and we still have no Brian Coburn extension, no uh, route whatsoever out of our area. Next slide, please. The, that, this uh, map indicates all the community associations that are on board with option seven and have uh, written to the NCC to endorse uh, their support of option seven. Um, they make up almost half of the population of the uh, census of 130,500 people in 2021. That's an enormous amount of people who are currently not served by any kind of transit or have no other major route uh, taking them across or out of the area. Next slide, please. Um, this is just some community associates, uh, sorry, the developments that are happening within the Bradley Estates uh, community. We've got 8,571 new units <clears throat> being planned. I'm going to say that all of these units, in addition to what has already been um, developed in the area, all have been planned without the 15 minute community uh, plan. You talk about saying that we should be able to walk places. We can't walk places. We have to drive. There are no stores. There's no commercial. There are no access to rapid transit. The LRT is so far north up on the 417 that we don't have any um, quick way to access it. We are isolated effectively from all um, amenities that the rest of, of Ottawa benefits from. Next slide, please. Um, studies have been done to show where the uh, traffic wants to go and the traffic wants to go to from our areas in South Orleans to the Walkley employment node. They aren't going to be using the option one, if that goes through, to access that area. We are car centric for all those reasons that have been mentioned because over 25 years we have allowed our, develop, allowed our community to be developed in that fashion. You, we're trying to address that now. We can't retroactively go back and change it. We have to do something now to help the 41,000, 50,000 people who live here. Next slide. Next slide, please. This just shows the traffic routes that are being taken right now. Um, all of these routes funnel cars to Renault Road, which is shown in black. That is, um, the counts that were given earlier um, are underestimated. There's approximately 17,000 cars that are using this road and 75% of them turn south onto Anderson. Next slide, please. Um, actually, we've covered this a little bit, but it just, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip because I wanna get to some more important points. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. A Couple of facts that I wanna um, address or claims and myths that I want to bust. Highway Through the Bog keeps uh, getting headlines in the paper and on the radio. Um, all of the maps that have been shown clearly show that option seven does not go through the bog. Uh, in terms of the threats to wetlands, option seven affects four adjacent wetlands by comparison to option, uh, option one, which affects seven. We are moving traffic away from the wetlands as uh, Councillor Dudas pointed out earlier in her comments. Next slide, please. The carbon sink impacts and the Mud Creek sensitivity have already been addressed, but they both were more positive for option seven. Next slide, please. Uh, this goes back to what our last delegate uh, was talking about, saying, oh, if we build roads, more cars will come. Well, you cannot deny uh, the community, the communities of south of Innes any way to get in and out. One minute are remaining. Going? Are you going to suggest that we don't give them any kind of access, that we don't try to correct the planning mistakes that have happened over the last 29 years? So let's talk about how it will decrease. 
First of all, cars that want to take Anderson are not going to use Renault. They are going to take option seven, connect to the Walkley Innis link, taking cars off the Anderson route, taking cars away from the bog. The NCC was shocked when they found out that they had 500 cars on their road a day on Anderson. They would be more shocked to learn now that they have 500 cars an hour using Anderson. Ignoring our communities and saying, no, we don't need any roads. No, we don't need any transit out of our area. We'll do nothing. And in fact, the NCC is going to find that by ignoring the situation, they are going to further cause harm to the bog. Next slide, that's, please. That's time. Okay, Tri sorry. Tri no tri time. Terrific delegation, Heather. And I'm sure that uh, we have a couple of people that will want to ask questions, uh, probably about a couple more of your slides. So uh, Councillor Kitts. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation today, Heather, um, but also for being a regular advocate for South Orleans, a planning committee as well, because uh, this, if we're talking about a road today at transportation, but it has a lot of uh, impacts there as well. Um, in your view, what is the key difference between option seven and the NCC preferred options of one and four? Okay, well, with, with option one, um, you're asking people to, uh, I guess, travel north uh, to to travel just south of Blackburn Hamlet, and then and then hook south if that's the direction they're going to go. Um, with option seven, you're going to offer them the opportunity to travel in the direct route that they want to go. Sorry, let me rephrase that. If option one goes through, people are still going to use Renault. I mean, people are creatures of habit. So you're still gonna have the 20,000 cars a day using Renault to go south on Anderson to get to the Walkley uh, employment nodes and places of Hunt Club and so on, regardless of option seven. That, that's just going to happen. And we, we're seeing it now. Um, the, in terms of um, uh, vehicles on option one, or sorry, uh, the effectiveness of option one in providing any kind of relief for our communities. If you imagine what I talked about earlier with a funnel, the funnel of cars heading towards Renault, you're asking them all now to travel up north and, and then travel south, but you're not providing any of the communities a way to access, um, let's say, multi-use pathways that are going to be incorporated in option seven. You're not giving them any safe cycling um, structures whatsoever. People have talked earlier in, in earlier presentations about using bicycles to um, access amenities in our area. We're isolated. Well, there is nothing. There's the NCC space on one side and a sea of homes for kilometers with no commercial and, and nothing for us to access safely by bike, by, by walking. And so we are car centric. Um, option one doesn't solve our issue, doesn't provide us with any other kind of movement out of our area. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and and I, I know that you got cut off. Um, so I was just wondering if there was anything from your last couple of slides that uh, you didn't get a chance to to touch on that you wanted to, uh, to raise to the committee. Um, yes, let me just go to that, those slides just if I can. Um, let's go to the, um, I think I'm not sure which slide it is. Just go, let's go next. Next, I was going to go through that. Um, right here. Okay. So a couple of points that I wanted to make is that, uh, Orleans is the fastest expanding community in our area rather in all of the city. And right now we have, um, very few routes uh, that are not gridlocked to, to move emergency vehicles, buses, people, cars, what have you, from east to west and, and, and back and forth. We need to establish um, a third commuter corridor in addition to the 174 and the Innis. When we had the sinkhole um, on the 174, whatever, five years ago, people quickly discovered that, oh, Renault Road and Anderson Road will, will take us where we need to go. And since then, um, Renault Road has become an unofficial highway for all manner of vehicles, primarily uh, construction trucks, cars, and commuters. Um, that is an important point that can't be ignored, uh, that, that um, if you want to establish 
better commercial connections and better um, access to our, let's say, our, our new Morpho our hub or whatnot, we need a third corridor coming in. If there's an accident on the, the Blackburn uh, bypass or if there's an accident on the 174, we have cars that go for kilometers down Ren Renault Road. When we talk about what's good for the environment, idling cars that are a kilometer in length, uh, that's, that's the reality. The second point from this that I want to highlight was that we would have, we would actually improve accessibility on the multi-use pathways um, if we had option seven, because the Prescott Trail would be connected. We'd have access to the NCC pathways to the north, and we would uh, make those, uh, the Prescott Trail itself safer by eliminating those uh, very unsafe crossings uh, that, are, that currently exist. I think that there are three right now two on the sharp corners that um, are very dangerous. And the last point was coming back to protecting neighborhood co cohesion and school zones. Right now, all those cars, as I said, are funneling down Renault. They go through um, five communities. Uh, they travel by or through two school zones and they, uh, they create, um, it divides and bisects rather neighborhoods. So, when we're talking about moving all of these cars through neighborhoods, it doesn't make sense. And it seems irresponsible for a city to allow or to pretend that that doesn't exist, that we don't need to find a solution. And yes, I know everybody's saying, <clears throat> well, environmentally, we have to not build roads. Renault Road exists, the hydro corridor exists. People already live out here. You, we have to be able to address the, the needs of a, a very big and growing community. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, as a resident of the area, if you could touch on the suggestion that we could convert an existing lane um, on Brian Coburn or, or on Innes to, to be transit only and how, how that would work, if it's I mean, even possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I love the suggestion and that was uh, something that we've talked about, I've talked about with other people that if people are, are a way of looking at the option seven could be to have a route going one way in the morning that is dedicated uh, lane for westbound and same thing return, thereby decreasing the footprint of Renault. Um, that would be very helpful. I did want to point out though that um, I back on to Renault. So I'm going to tell you from experience that tra the pandemic has done nothing to change traffic patterns, absolutely nothing. In fact, I thought there'd be less traffic and there is more. Um, it's a constant mini truck convoy behind our houses all day long because that's the route they need to go to to get to South Orleans. No one is using, truck companies aren't using, movers aren't using, buses aren't using, all the way up to Blackburn, a bypass and back down. It's, it's um, I understand that the communities were built before, um, perhaps before uh, talks about transit, you know, sh sh should have happened. But the reality is that living on Renault Road gives me a, a <laughs> bird's eye view to what's only going to continue happening if option one goes ahead. And, 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 and the NCC is, is going to suffer more for it. Yeah, what I'm hearing from you is if we, if we go with the NCC preferred options, we'll continue to have significant vehicular traffic on Renault Road, a residential road with vulnerable road users, uh, and is at present closer to, to the bog and to the Ramsar boundary um, than what's proposed. So I, I appreciate your delegation. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Great. Councillor Luloff. Thanks so much, Heather, and thanks uh, again for coming out today. I really do appreciate hearing from somebody who lives in the neighborhood that's most affected uh, by uh, these uh, potential options. <clears throat> so can you describe to me what, what a commute um, for you would look like, uh, let's say rush hour in the morning, if you uh, were hopping uh, on a bus, as things are right now, without option seven, without option one, without any of these options, what would that look like uh, if you wanted to make your way uh, into the downtown core as somebody who maybe works at National Defense or um, or works uh, in, in the core? <clears throat> Absolutely. So um, for right now, our area is served by three buses in the morning, 
uh, peak hours between 6.30 and 7.45, no, no later, um, <clears throat> which take you to Blair Station in about, if you get on that bus, uh, 25 minutes if there's no traffic. Any of the other buses take you 45 minutes to get to Blair LRT Station from South Orleans. From there, obviously, you need to connect to, you know, get on the train and hope that the LRT works and get downtown and then perhaps transfer onto another bus to access wherever downtown location you need to get to. Um, so I can speak for my son who works down on Queen Street and we're talking about upwards of an hour and a half on busy days for a commute from my area, from Bradley Estates with the current bus service transit that we have. Um, driving, I mean, a lot of people say, well, why don't you just get a drive him to Blair? I said, well, if I drive him to Blair Station or if I even drive myself to Blair Station, there's no parking there. And uh, from, from that point, I might as well just continue the five minutes downtown because I've already done most of the route. So that, I hope that it talks about, it talks to the lack of, um, bus service that we have. And it also talks to the, the idea that buses right now are all, are all slaves to the Innes Road gridlock mm -hmm. and the use of um, Renault Road as a direct route, only three buses in the morning and three buses at night during the peak hours. And forget coming home later than 5.30. So the, um... that's it <laughs> by, by current OC transport. That's fair. I mean, and so, I mean, all things considered, let's say that it's the same timings, uh, nothing else changes, which I can imagine that it probably would uh, mm -hmm. if there was another option. But if we were, if, if you were looking at option seven with a BRT, um, how would that first, obviously there's nothing you can do about the second leg from, from Blair to, yeah. to downtown, but how, how would that first leg change um, in your experience? So I would say that you would be able to do exactly what we can do if you were able to sail down roads with no cars in front of you. That's the bus. So that bus is going to get from, let's use um, Chapel Hill Park and Ride as a starting point, for sure. example. It would get to Blair Station within eight, nine minutes. So about a difference about 32 minutes. Yeah. I mean, I think that we can all remember uh, how easy it was to get to the city by bus when we had a transit way. Yeah. Uh, I think that having this tra this sort of transit way in the south end of Orleans would probably encourage less people uh, to use their car. I certainly would uh, much mm -hmm. rather hop on a bus and be able to answer some emails in the morning rather than having to pay 100% attention to, to what I'm doing and, and driving is it's important to do when you're when you're driving a personal vehicle. You know, living in South Orleans, uh, if there was a direct BRT, um, it would make a heck of a lot more sense for someone like me to who's going down to City Hall to hop on a bus, get on the BRT, then get on the LRT and I'm down there, you know, within mm -hmm. 40 minutes. Now it would take me over an hour to get there just driving. Um, so, I mean, plus the additional 40 minutes of productivity that I would get out of not having to drive, it seems like a pretty good option to me. Um, so... Um, let's say somebody who's, who's driving from Bradley Estates, uh, to, to get uh, to the downtown core, how many school zones are you driving through? Um, what kind of gridlock are you getting into? And I mean, uh, what, what does that commute look like? So anybody who's leaving from not just the Bradley Estates area, I mean, let's, let's talk about right from Mare Blue Road. That's, um, sure. from Mare Blue Road over the bulk of those people are using Renault right now to travel. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're passing through two school zones, an elementary school and a high school zone. The road is, um, uh, is two lanes and has no sidewalks on parts of it. And that is the, uh, sorry, we we're talking about driving. Yep. <laughs> so um, in terms of uh, the route you're following, it's along a, basically a non-urbanized road for great lengths of it. Um, through the two school zones, and uh, through the uh, along Renault Road seems to be the, the, the path of least resistance for most people to follow. Um, what you will encounter there are various, very um, aggressive drivers who are very annoyed by the um, 
multiple roundabouts that they might have had to uh, go through on uh, Brian Colburn uh, previously, and or all the stop signs along all the different neighborhood streets that finally get them to Renault. Um, from once everybody's on Renault, now you're on a, a very narrow old farm road with no paved shoulders and um, uh, weekly accidents in the ditch. So we see um, the road closures happen frequently uh, where emergency vehicles have to close off the, the road at both ends to pull out yet another car from the sensitive Mud Creek area. There's a, there's a car at every, every snowstorm, there's a car in the ditch. So snowstorms, we don't, I don't travel Renault. I, I go up to the bypass and sit in the gridlock with everybody else. Um, so the commute is, is, I guess, contingent on uh, time of day, weather, um, and, um, and uh, I guess the, um, the shape of the road. So it's this will be my last. Commute by road, to, by car rather, but in, in no uncertain turns than by bus. Because we are no, we have no service that that takes us that way. And how much would that change if there was option seven? Like what I'm hearing from you right now is that it makes far more sense for you, and your neighbors. All, I, I'd have to do the math here, but over forty thousand and growing, and neighbors. Growing. Yeah, um, it's much faster, even with the gridlock, for them to take their car all the Absolutely. way to downtown, making it worse than to take the bus. Um, how how do you feel? that would change uh, given what you've just said uh, if there was option seven with a BRT on it? Well, I, I would say that in my conversations with the various community groups, um, you would have, um, you would actually invite and welcome many, many more users to the transit system. Um, who wouldn't want to leave their car at home when, when you can't pay for parking, you don't want to drive in nasty conditions or dangerous conditions. Get on the, the you get on the uh, rapid transit, connect with the LRT, and you're where you want to go in half the time. In fact, faster than driving, obviously, and safer than driving. Um, I would say that by providing a corridor alongside option seven that incorporates a very uh, consistent and safe BRT, you are going to see ridership dramatically increase. The whole premise of Every development that's been improved, the, sorry, approved by uh, planning council over the last five years that I've been um, getting involved in this, every single time it's based on the fact that they will, they can, we can add in, uh, density and we can add these houses here and we can have this development because there is going to be a rapid transit corridor. Every single development gets approved on that. There is no rapid transit corridor, so there's a little bit of there's a little bit of a misconnect disconnect rather here that we have thousands and thousands of homes another like I said 8,000 coming down the pipe in the next five years based on a fact on a road that doesn't exist or on a transportation system that doesn't exist so this is the time that the city needs to do something about it and if it isn't option seven then we've lost all opportunity to connect people to the rest of the city thank you I really appreciate your delegation. I think that uh, you know, if members of this committee care about the environment and uh, care about uh, how quickly people can uh, can can access the downtown core via transit and increasing um, our our transit modal share here in the east, especially the south uh, end of the east end, uh, that option seven seems to be uh, the only viable option. Thank you yes, very much, Heather. You. I really do appreciate it. Great, uh, Councillor Dudas. Thank you. I, thanks, Heather, for being here. And I know you've been at many, many planning committees where you've shown that photo of the <laughs> cars, like the thousands of cars lined up. I, I'm going to ask you about cycling in a moment, but I just want to play into what Councillor Luloff mentioned a moment ago. So as you mentioned, the BRT, we've talked about BRTs along Carling, we've talked about BRTs across the city, and we're all, you know, predicating a lot of development across the city on BRTs. But say, for instance, the BRT was actually built right now, Mm -hmm. without option seven. So, mm -hmm. so can you paint a picture as to where that BRT would end up, even if it was built to the extent without option seven? Where it would end up? Mm -hmm. Finish or, or what do you, what I'm just trying so to- The BRT as it stands right now would cross mm -hmm. along South Orleans mm -hmm. and then it would end up at the park and ride. Where would it then go? Oh, I see. Well, didn't we have in the plan, the original Cumberland corridor? 
So from, from there, it's supposed to service all those, uh, the whole East Urban community. Uh, the whole CDD, CDP plan is based on having that uh, Cumberland Transit Corridor in, in place. So even if all we built- out to Trim Road. Yeah. So even if we built that entirety, it still yeah. dead ends at Navin. It still right. funnels onto the bypass. Yes. It still has nowhere to go. So yes. even if we got that right, then portion, it has nowhere to funnel to because there's nowhere for it to go to. Mm -hmm. So, um, go ahead. sorry, I just, I know my counselor colleague just talked about transit. I won't go into that too much. And he painted a great picture. You mentioned it, you know, it makes more sense to drive a car, unfortunately. I wanted to ask you about cycling <laughs> in your community. And I want you to tell people exactly, you talked about Renault Road and the S curve and how it crosses the Prescott Russell Trail and about the ditches along Navin and, and Renault. Can you just tell people how many people feel comfortable cycling in your community as it stands right now? Well, I think from the last time uh, traffic studies were done, um, they looked at the number of bicycles that were being used on Renault, Navin and uh, uh, certain stretches, uh, certain major intersections and the number was paltry. And the number is paltry because people aren't safe. Um, you. I see the families in the area. I filmed them this, this, this summer. I took a lot of videos for these kinds of meetings. And the bulk of people use the sidewalks <clears throat> that do exist to uh, ride safely. Um, there is no side sho or paved shoulder in Renault for, on Renault, for example. So uh, if you wanted to go out to, the, um, to access the NCC Greenland and, and connect with any of the pathways, um, you can't do it safely. So we've, we've got a ghost bike there for a reason. Um, you know, cyclists killed there. Um, in terms of cycling through the neighborhood, there are no uh, pathways that connect neighborhoods to neighborhoods to neighborhoods. Everything was built piecemeal. And so you have are pushed out onto the main roads to access a community. If you get my picture, kind of like how Innis Road, everybody has to come out of a store, come on Innis, go back in, come back out on Innis, go back in. It's the same thing all through our communities. There's nothing safe. Ditches, unpaved shoulders, very few bicycle lanes, no dead, very few uh, MUPs, and, and, and absolutely no connection for, um, to access the green space safely by bicycle whatsoever. And with the option seven proposal, you're aware that the that city staff are recommending dedicated mm -hmm. cycling infrastructure. Would that improve the situation in terms of access to cycling amenities, getting to their station by bike and LRT, accessing the Innis Road locations, potentially by bicycle? Do you think that, that would improve the situation? 100%, yeah. I mean, who wouldn't want to, right now the MUP that is uh, on one section of Brian Colburn, where it ends at the uh, roundabout on Navin, that is, uh, I'm sure you've seen, it's very well used by people. They get to the end and they've got nowhere to go. If that continued, now you've got a beautiful scenic route along what we call a parkway. You don't have to call it a, a highway through the bog as all the uh, scaremongers would call it. It's a road and it's sided with uh, dedicated bicycle lanes that take you through the NCC green space. And isn't that one of their mandates to encourage recreation and uh, and attract people to enjoy the natural space, now we can do that. And from there, you connect to all of the NCC pathways. I would take that bicycle route to Blair Station in a heartbeat. Uh, except that I'm not a great cyclist with my bad back now, but you know, you get the general idea. <laughs> thank you so much, Heather, for coming out today. Thank you for your presentation. Great, and uh, I see no more. I do have one question for you, Heather. Just okay. wondering, I know your involvement with Bradley Estates Community Association. Do you, do you think they would be agreeable to remove the dog leg stretch of Renault, take, uh, take traffic even further away from the bog? Um, yeah, what, what, what will that do for the Bradley Estates people though, if you think about that? Mm -hmm. um, people who are afraid to drive those sharp corners are now gonna be encouraged. Um, the nightly uh, motorcycle races in the summer, well, now they've got an even better um, way to go because they don't have to stop for those two sharp corners. Now they're gonna use that as their, as their motocross route. So no, I mean, I don't think that's, that's not the solution at all. Great.
Okay, wonderful. I just had that question come in from somebody else. Uh, that being said, uh, I don't see any further questions. Terrific uh, delegation. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, we have, uh, we're on to delegation six, folks. So if I can ask you to be a little briefer on your questions, I know it's really good conversations. Uh, we have Al Ross, followed by late, uh, Rachel uh, LaCour. Um, we'll get Al Ross on deck. And then I am doing a quick straw poll. Uh, by show of hands after Rachel, uh, that will put us up to delegation number eight. Did we want to take a 20 minute bio break for everyone to go stretch a leg, make a coffee, use the washrooms? I'm seeing a lot of yeses. So let's do that. We'll get to Al Ross, then we'll go to Rachel LaCour. We'll have a 20 minute bio break and then we'll get on to the following delegation. Just looking at Chris. Mr. Ross hasn't joined yet, although he is in the room. Okay, is uh, Rachel there by chance? Maybe we can tee Rachel up if possible, and then we'll go back to Al if we figure out what the connectivity issue is. Can you hear me? Uh, oh, there's Al there, right on deck. All right, perfect. Yeah, I don't know what button to push. <laughs> and we can't, we can't see your face. How do I, how do I fix that? Uh, Chris, can you uh, assist by hitting that button to uh, Mr. Ross, on the lower left-hand side of your Zoom screen, there should be a mute and a start video button. There you go. Yeah, there you go. It was in my upper right-hand corner. Anyway. You have five minutes, uh, Mr. Ross. Okay, I, I, I'll be brief. Um, uh, I want to thank you, uh, the Transportation Committee, for inviting the Friends of Mayor Bleu to address the uh, committee and provide input to your decision um, facing your various options. Uh, just a quick note that the we were uh, <clears throat> uh, we are a community organization that was established in 1997, consisting mainly of uh, resident citizens of Notre Dame des Champs and surrounding areas. And we were formally incorporated in uh, March of uh, 2009. Um, our, our organization is uh, primarily concerned as, as far as this project is concerned on the uh, environmental impact of, uh, of option seven, which we, which we support. The, um, <clears throat> This is our, the function of, of the Friends of the Mayor Bleu to protect the bog and uh, make uh, local citizens aware of any changes or uh, various issues that uh, surround uh, this uh, uh, wetland area. Um, we, we, uh, we have studied the proposals by the city uh, for the extension of the Brian Colburn Boulevard. And there's no doubt that this project must be completed um, to alleviate the traffic and the uh, and transportation issues facing uh, the East End. Um, our studies have resulted in the selection of uh, option seven, uh, which is no surprise, as the most economic and environmentally favorable choice. The, um, <clears throat> the, our reasoning is that the, uh, there's a crucial need, as everybody has pointed out today, crucial need for um, uh, to alleviate the traffic issues in the East End. Uh, this, this option uh, provides the, uh, a minimum of new road construction and uh, uh, there's no paving, uh, no new roads within the bog. In fact, there's no impact on the bog itself. And uh, uh, this includes uh, the uh, uh, effect on pristine uh, natural forested areas. And uh, it also provides uh, a, a, an acceptable, uh, so a good solution to both the traffic and the public transportation issues. And uh, one of the main things of interest, of course, to the city would be the, uh, the cost is the lowest of, of the other options. Um, we, we, uh, We have no disagreement. Uh, there is no great disagreement on the need and necessity for the work, and uh, uh, the. Uh, well, I'm sorry. We just uh, 
we are, we are, I guess we're just ask, asking your committee to uh, recommend option seven to the uh, city council for this extension. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Ross. I don't see any questions for you today, but we certainly are hearing what you're saying. Thank Good. you for coming out. Uh, next up, we have uh, Rachel LaCour from Greater Avalon Community Association. And I do thank believe you. you have a presentation. We're just gonna load that up for, up. Oh, there we go. Chris is already ahead of me. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, practically good afternoon, councillors and everyone. Uh, my name is, uh, next slide please. My name is uh, Rachel Lecour, and I'm the president of the Greater Avalon Community Association, which you see at the, we're the, the very last big square, uh, the very, at the very uh, right side of the screen here. Uh, we represent 20,000 residents, and that's growing uh, exponentially. And um, next slide, please. Next. Next slide. Um, the just to put to put things in, into context. Orleans North is the area that is north of Venice Road. We 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 split Orleans in two, and uh, it's served it's served by uh, the Highway 174, which uh, goes to the 417, Saint Joseph Boulevard to Montreal Road and the Aviation Parkway and the future LRT. And those all go downtown and they're mo they mostly run in parallel to each other. Orleans South, <clears throat> on the other hand, is serviced by Innes Road, Brian Coburn Boulevard, Navin Road, and all three of those roads funnel onto the Blackburn Hamlet bypass. So in other words, we they're not distinct parallel um, roads heading to downtown. So all the traffic ends up on the Blackburn bypass. Um, the proposed BRT, which we just uh, talked about not long ago, is tentatively planned for 2036 and possibly later if, uh, if it's not included in the city's transportation master plan. So that's 14 years from now. The BRT is the like somebody just mentioned before, is always the excuse for new developments. Um, we've just uh, seen one that's being approved now by, uh, by the city. And the first thing that they mentioned on their, their approval list is, well, we're right next to the future BRT. Well, in 2036, uh, there's a lot of things that can change until then. And we're still gridlocked here in, in Orleans. Uh, next slide, please. The Telfer School of Management, uh, University of Ottawa, conducted a 15 minute study for the GACA in partnership with the FCA. We've talked about the 15 minute community. And next please. Part of the recommend that uh, definitely we are uh, car centric. There is no way that, uh, uh, that we fit the 15 minute community uh, um, the guideline or uh, propose, uh, proposed uh, idea of what a 15 community, 15 minute community is. Uh, the study recommended uh, two things. Uh, the first recommendation was again to um, review the structure of the public transportation by focusing more on bus frequency and connected directly to the LRT for faster travel, again, to downtown. So there's two things there that we have to look at. Next slide, please. The recommendation uh, number two was in support of option seven as an alternative to the Blackburn Hamlet bypass, which again funnels all the three um, uh, arteries to, to that Blackburn bypass. But this one is, is for travel to Ottawa South and West. And somebody mentioned that before. 75% of the traffic using Renault Road heads out south on Anderson Road. So it, obviously there's, there's a, a disconnect there. Something has to happen. So next slide, please. The, all those facts are presented. Uh, people have questioned the facts, but th there's, there's no dispute on the facts. The, the facts presented here are all drawn from the draft assessment of alternative of alternative that was part of the environmental assessment carried out by the, uh, under the auspices of the Ontario Ministry of the Environment. 
Next slide, please. So I'm going to repeat what others have said. Option seven is has a less environmental impact on the green belt and the and Mer Bleu. It's a lowest cost factor, maybe not environmental, but from the point of view of taxpayer, it is a lowest cost factor. And this cost difference could be could allow for the necessary transit infrastructure a link to the 417 and reducing the traffic through the Mer Bleu and the Anderson Road uh, and Anderson Road. It would provide a safe route for cyclists to safely commute uh, south and east to Orleans. Um, next slide. Um, unlike misinformation that's being circulated, option seven uh, does not travel through a pristine natural land. We've seen that on the slides that uh, Anton presented before. One minute nor remaining. Does it travel, nor does it travel close to the Mer Bleu wetlands and nor does it pave over the Mebler bog, as some are falsely suggesting. And the next slide, next please. And I'll have to pass on to a lot of those. Uh, the facts that are presented are based on studies, data, metrics, and public assessments. And facts, not politics, is the key in making a decision. And remember that uh, Option seven does not pave over the Mer Bleu bog, which would be unacceptable to every one of us. So the NCC has a great opportunity here to create a safe state-of-the-art nature parkway accessible to vehicles, public transportation, cyclists, pedestrians alike, while creating green space and forested areas similar to the aviation parkway. Next. Uh, we do not support uh, the... Um, Great, uh, thank sorry. you. Okay. Thank you very much. But we do have questions. Uh, yeah. First on deck, uh, we have Catherine, uh, Councillor Kitts. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for being here today, Rochelle. Um, I, I'm happy you had that slide at the beginning of the presentation because I think it's important to reemphasize how large the catchment area for Greater Avalon is in, in South Orleans. Gaka um, represents a very large section uh, and has a long history with this file. So um, you mentioned in your in your presentation that the Telfer study also endorsed option seven. Um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little on why it was the preferred option over other options through that study. Uh, option seven was was a preferred option because as, as you can see from the, um, the, the, the three, um, our arteries that uh, that that lead to the Blackburn High Bypass. Uh, that's where the fun the funneling is, and that's where the the traffic is backlogged for a greater distance, all the way sometimes all the way to uh, Avalon, which uh, at the very most eastern portion of uh, of Orleans. So we're we're the last group to uh, to uh, that we're we're the furthest east in the Orleans area. And so we're the ones that have to travel uh, all the way through Innes from Trim Road, all the way to the Blackburn Bypass. And the, the traffic is bumper to bumper uh, for uh, hours at a time until um, the, the rush hour is through. And there's always the fight between with the buses that don't have the, uh, the don't have a, a good clearance, so the, the the cars are stuck behind the bus because they can't they can't use the other lane, which is already full. So it's um, it, it's a real nightmare. And the other the other option would be to use Brian Coburn, but then again, you end up at the same place. You end up at the Blackburn Bypass, which is which is no help at all. Okay, um, thank you for that uh, answer. Uh, You've been heavily involved in a lot of the development applications that have been improved or are, or are being contemplated for, for this area. From your perspective, would there be a real opportunity for a modal shift to transit, particularly in some of these um, newer, higher density developments, if we had a rapid transit option in South Orleans? It, it definitely would help. Uh, the, the, the BRT seems to be coming along at a uh, it is proposed at a at a at a good area because there's there's the um, there's all that section between Innes and and the BRT 
and then there's there's the other people that uh, that could use it from uh, Blackburn, the Black, uh, the Ryan Coburn bypass, at uh, the Ryan Coburn Boulevard, sorry, to to the BRT. So the it, it the BRT is equidistant to to both um, Innes and uh, Ryan Coburn, except that now all the development is being south of that, south of Brian, Brian Coburn. So you, you, you'll see huge developments coming up because this is all farmland that's going to be developed now. It's, it's new. We've, we've already started to see new proposals for developments in, in the area that's behind the Francois Dupuis uh, Recreation Center. So all that traffic, again, they're going to be a little further away from the BRT, but if there's local buses connecting it, I, I'm sure people would use it. With the price of gas now, and the fact that you uh, uh, you don't have parking downtown, I mean it's 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 a no-brainer that uh, people would uh, would use the uh, the BRT if it was efficient and if it if it connected properly to the to the LRT. But the the issue that I'm seeing here in Orleans is it it's okay if you if you talk about uh, using the BRT and and connecting to the LRT to get to downtown. But the issue is, is to get to south, uh, to, to the south end and the west end. If I was to, like this afternoon, later this afternoon, I have to go to the general hospital. Now, if I was to take a bus to go there, I would have had to take the bus probably at nine o'clock this morning to get there. But by car, it'll take me, and I try not to go during rush hour because then it takes me an hour and a quarter. So I, I, I try and take my appointments later on in, in the afternoon. So, and again, try and come back before three, before the rush hour. So it doesn't give me a big window to, uh, to travel. But it takes me, I would say uh, 45 minutes to get to the general hospital. So the, that Innes Road, that uh, option seven is definitely the, 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 a game changer for the people living in Orleans South. There, there's no other way that uh, that we could we could even uh, uh, consider just ex expanding uh, the Blackburn bypass. Uh, if you ex if if you create more lanes on the Blackburn bypass, you might as well create more lanes on on create the lanes on on uh, option seven and create an HOV or uh, you know a lane like somebody proposed before, which to me is, is an excellent, it's an, it is an excellent option. So. Okay, thank you very I much. Did I answer your question? I know yes, I'm wrapping yes. on. But... No, thank you very much. Councilor Menard. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have two, two questions for you. Um, the first is, I'd like to know, um, your reasoning for why the municipality and worse, you know, city councillors that have to weigh the, the city council as a whole and in our, in our individual wards, but why the municipality should move forward at this time with this option, which would spend taxpayer dollars uh, without an agreement with the NCC. So potentially spending money on something that may not come to pass and before completing an update of the transportation master plan, which is uh, imminent. Uh, I'm just wondering why you feel we should move forward right now without those two pieces intact. Well, the, the thing is, uh, I was in planning. That, that was my job. And if you don't plan ahead of time, things will not happen 20 years from now. We can't have that BRT coming in to in 2026 to service an area that's growing uh, like mushrooms uh, by the minute. So you, you have this, the city councillors have to look at, uh, at what's happening to the outskirts and, and make, make plans for the future. You, you can't just ignore the, the presentations that are being presented here today and say, well, no, it's, it's not approved and it's not in the TMP and it's not in this and it's not in that. You have to put them in there. And that was one of the, uh, my last slide was exactly that. Um, what, okay. what, what, what I'm asking for is ensure option seven is included in your master transportation plan. Ensure that the bus route transit is included in your TMP 
and closer to 2036. And we do not support the interim measure. It's, it's, a, it's, an, obsolete, it's, a, it's an obsolete solution. It's the taxpayer money going from worse to bad. Okay, and that's my concern is spending more taxpayer money without a potential solution with the NCC um, and the environmental effects. That, that's my second question to you is, it seems that some delegations who, who want option seven are minimizing um, the very real uh, environmental climate change effects that this could have. Um, and I'm not, you don't have to listen to me. It's, it's in the report and in document four, it goes through all of those environmental effects and the associated mitigation that would have to come with them. And they're significant. Um, it, this this uh, option scored worse uh, of all the options. It was the worst scoring one around climate change. Uh, one of the pieces that it talks about is the encroachment in ravines associated with the water courses, the impacts to Gre uh, Greens Creek and Mud Creek. And it goes on to talk about the construction of the project with the potential indirect impacts on Mer Bleu uh, during construction, but also in the future um, with the change in land use, which may affect the quality and quantity of the Mer Bleu wetland, including an opportunity for introduction of exotic and invasive species. There are many other areas where uh, the environment is noted in both the staff reports and by the NCC that is extremely concerning with this type of development. And so I, I just wonder why that is being minimized in, uh, in the discussions from uh, delegations that may support option seven. Well, if, if you uh, uh, look back at uh, Anton's uh, presentation where he shows uh, the, the mitigation of, uh, of, of the wetlands and where that option seven is going to pass, uh, it, I think it's very clear that it doesn't it doesn't have as much environmental impact as what people seem to seem to say, and the the Mud Creek uh, um, uh, uh, pass or whatever it's called, the, it 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 affects it twice. It doesn't affect it four times. So you know, it, I think it's important to to have a look at all the facts, and and not just just uh, listen to what uh, environmentalists uh, have to say. I am an environmentalist. I'll tell you that for sure. I've been fighting for the Orleans, uh, the Nantwoods Woods for five years now. And we're, we're fighting, uh, we're, we're trying to get the city to approve, uh, to, to prevent them from cutting down two thirds of that woodlot, which is five hectares. So, you know, it's, it, it, uh, nobody can tell me that I, I don't like animals and I don't like trees and I don't like this and I don't like that. I am an environmentalist, but sometimes you have to look at the pros and the cons and decide which is the best solution for everyone. Like the, the city is not just, um, the, the, the city core is not just a, um, a, 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 a city by themselves. You have to look at the whole, the whole city. You have to look at Orleans, you have to look at Canada, you have to look at Stittsville. Like, like all these communities are growing now and th there has to be a point where uh, councillors look at the city as a whole and not take sides and say, well, you know, uh, we'll do this for, for this and we'll do this for that. Let's look at the city as a whole. I love this city. And uh, I, I think if we could create this aviation parkway that I'm talking, not the aviation parkway, but this natural parkway that I'm talking about with option seven, uh, I have groups now that are willing and able to plant 20,000 trees in that area, as long as we have access to that property. So, it, and right now we're looking at planting uh, over 500 trees in our area, in the Avalon area. So it, you, can't, you can't look at, at uh, the, the, the option one and four with all the, or, or even Renault Road, let's look at Renault Road, when the traffic is back to back, bumper to bumper, for hours at a time, that's not environmentally uh, sound. So let's let's resolve that issue. Let's make it a parkway where, where where the traffic can move and move to the right place. Like the, there's there's a difference between I find between transit and transportation. To me, transit is going from one place to another quickly. Transportation is for me to go to Toronto to Kingston. And I, 
if I have to take Innis Road and, and the uh, Blackburn Bypass to get to the 401 or whatever, and then and then get to uh, uh, the 416, it it's it extends my trip by possibly I would say 45 minutes. That's 45 minutes that I'm wasting gas on the road. Well, if I had option seven, I could take that the that uh, the the, uh, the Blackburn Bypass extension to the Watley Road exit, and from there uh, head out to uh, to Toronto, Kingston, uh, or even the the south end of Ottawa, where I'll, I'll if if you need to go there to work. So it's you have to uh, you have to consider that it, uh, uh, Orleans is first of all we're we're gridlocked, and somebody at City Hall has to talk to the NCC and make them realize that it's not just to their benefit, but it's to benefit to the benefit of the city altogether. Because if the traffic doesn't go on the Queensway, then it goes south somewhere else. So you're diverting the traffic. You're not you're you're not sending all the traffic in one spot. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Appreciate you being here, uh, Ms. Lacour. Nice to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lacour. Really terrific points, and I know all my East End colleagues are hearing exactly what you've just said. Um, that being said, um, I don't see any more questions to yourself. Uh, thank you. We uh, did a straw poll uh, and we're going to take a quick 20 minute bio break. My bladder thanks everybody. Uh, we'll be back here at 1250 and on deck we will have uh, Larry Morrison uh, as our next delegation. So I'll see everybody in 20 minutes, folks. Thank you.
Jeffrey. Oh, excuse me. Hello. <laughs> oh, shit. I'm just going to refill my water bottle back in a sec. That's good. Oh, hello, Mr. Chair. Ah, hello, Councillor Lodoff. Why don't you sing us a ditty while we wait? <laughs> uh, that costs money. <laughs> I officially moved uh, my dentist appointment, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you have no cavities at all. You brush like regular I'm sure. There you go. All right, I'm just looking for Chris to make sure he's back in the room here. All right, is Chris back in the room? I'm just tracking uh, Chris down. Uh, he should be there momentarily. Okay, good. Thank you. Which you could go ahead and you, uh, proceed uh, if you like, Mr. Chair. Sure, Let, let's, let's go ahead and do that because we do have quite a few delegations remaining on this and the next item. So uh, okay. next up on deck is Larry Morrison. If we see Larry in the, uh, in the waiting room, that'd be terrific if we could bring him in. He is in as panelist. He just has to unmute himself. Perfect. You've muted us. There we go. We can hear you, Larry. And if you want to, uh, you can turn your video on as well. Uh, yeah, if we knew how to do that, we would no, do that. <laughs> so uh, if, if you're on a... Oh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, there we go. There we go. We see okay, you there All we right. go. So you have five minutes. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. And um, I'm here with my lovely wife, Linda Anderson, to make sure that I stay on topic and don't miss anything. I'm here primarily to do about the park and ride and the proposed changes for it because um, we, along with about eight other neighbors, back onto uh, that facility. And uh, the neighbors they're saying yeah we're on side with what you want to say so I'm kind of representing them as well just to put a little bit in context uh, all of us live in bungalows loft bungalows we're at walkout basements so 
the grade of our backyard pretty well matches the grade of the park and ride behind us. Immediately behind us, we have the uh, Mud, Creek, Mud Creek Ravine, not a huge ravine, but it's a ravine that's treed, has a few uh, large mature pines on it and spruce tree. Everything else is deciduous. So all those leaves are gone for six months of the year. Um, on the other side of the ravine is the hydro corridor. So when we moved in here, we had done due diligence. We were aware that there was going to be a Bri uh, Brian Coburn extension. We knew that there was going to be a transit way. And I was aware of that because I worked for the city of Gloucester and then of course the amalgamated city and had since 19 in the late eighties been working with the region through official plan amendments, et cetera, to make sure that those two corridors were going to be represented. And in fact, I believe right up until the 1998, 99, pri just prior to uh, amalgamation, the region may have gone in and completed an environmental assessment for both the transit way and Brian Colburn extension to ensure that it was entrenched in the OP, their OP, it was in our OPs. And even at that time, we had to satisfy phases one and two of a class EA. That became a requirement of the, of the uh, province back in the late 80s. So we had actually gone through that whole process. Immediately moving upon moving in by immediately, I say about four months later, I happened to be speaking to someone at the city who knew that we had moved here and they said, oh, so you're gonna have the park and ride behind you. And I said, what are you talking about a park and ride? So I investigated, checked with staff and found out, yep, that the originally planned park and ride major transit station that what had been included in the earlier version of everything that we had done was now being dropped because it was supposed to be at the end of an extension of Orleans Boulevard across Navin Road down the escarpment where it would join in with the transit way and of course Brian Coburn or at that time whatever we called the uh, Blackburn Hamlet bypass were also, was also going through there. So it was gonna be moved from there up to where it's situated today. So if we fast forward again, we're into the environmental assessment for this. And just prior to this assessment beginning, we had actually met with uh, Councillor Dudas and the project manager for the park and ride to see, is there anything that we can do because Visually, there's a huge impact because we no longer have a hydro corridor with a bit of a buffer on it. That's been removed because it's been turned into a parking lot for the park and ride. Not to mention, now we have perceived the noise of the buses. A noise study had been done at the time the park and ride was built, and it was showing that for two or three of the houses where there was a receptor area where we live, no, we weren't quite meeting the requirements for mitigation, but we're close. So we move ahead into this environmental assessment and we find out changes are coming. The biggest change, one's good, one's bad. The good one is that the BRT is going to be six, approximately six meters below the grade, <clears throat> excuse me, of the park and ride now. So that would damper a lot of the noise coming from the buses that are specifically traveling the transit way. The bad news was all of the local buses were now going to be routed around this parking lot. 30 seconds. To, to the back of, uh, to the back of the, parking lot, there was a roadway to be constructed. So all the local buses were going to use that to access the new transit station. 
Well, that puts them immediately on the top of the slope behind us. Staff, when I talked to them, they said, yeah, they did another study for noise. They said, yeah, no, you're, you're still not meeting it. You're, you're still not meeting the noise requirements. When I go back through the reports that have been prepared that studied the noise, I believe that the, let me find it here. Yeah, during daytime, we're looking at 50 decibels, evening 45. Time. And, pardon? Time, your time is time up. Time is up. Anyway, what we want you to do, because I, I'm never going to get through the rest of this, we need your intervention here because we are so close on the noise, uh, the noise impact. Staff's hands are tied. They can't do anything to mitigate it. Only because we're not quite there. We're about five decibels off. And we would want, we want something done to deal okay, with Mr. the Okay, Mr. Morrison, uh, uh, first of all, it sounds like there's a lot more detail in the letter you have. And unfortunately I have to treat all delegations the same. We've gone over the time, but if you do email that in, I'm certain that staff will certainly- I'll do that. that. That, that is terrific. And uh, do, you, do you have the contact information at the city? Or you can yeah. simply email yeah, yeah, the city. Yeah. Okay, perfect. If you email that in, they'll certainly, and I'm seeing a lot of nodding from my East End colleagues' heads. Yeah, Laura, Kits, everyone's waving. So if you don't mind, that would be, a, that'd be terrific. And thank you for coming out today. Uh, our next uh, delegation is Paul Johannes. Uh, Paul, are you in the waiting room? Yes, I am. I'm here now. A great setup in the background there, Paul. Uh, you have five minutes. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I'm here on behalf of the Green Space Alliance of Canada's Capital. Uh, we've been following this particular uh, project from uh, first consultations in 2019 uh, through till now and participated in every phase of it. Um, in general, from the start, we've uh, been... Uh, opposed to option seven. Uh, and uh, if we were given a, a choice, we would go with option one. We fully recognize the need for improvements in transit and transportation for uh, the South Orleans area, which is, is growing by leaps and bounds with urban expansions in that area. And so uh, our reasoning for preferring uh, option one basically is around the green belt. We believe the green belt needs to be preserved as much as possible in all circumstances. And even more now, um, um, it's, it's the major green space asset of the city of Ottawa. Uh, it, it really ought to be uh, at every opportunity protected, uh, not further fragmented. So in that context, we, we oppose basically any new transportation corridors through the green belt. Um, and and uh, option uh, seven represents a new transportation corridor through the green belt. I know we've heard, well, it's just an upgrade of Renault Road. You know, it's true it's on the path of Renault Road, but Renault Road is a, you know, a, a, a two lane blacktop a rural uh, road with a very low profile uh, as opposed to uh, uh, six lanes of, of uh, bus and uh, vehicle uh, corridor. Uh, so, um, so, and we've been consistent on that uh, position uh, throughout. Uh, we understand the various evaluations that have been done using the grid that staff has used, has, you know, comes up with different scores and, and maybe sensitivity tests have been applied to it. But those, you know, those scores really do come down to judgment calls uh, uh, on factors that aren't hard and quantified in many cases. Uh, and in the end, you know, like the decision will come to, to, to you, members of this committee. And, 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 uh, and I don't think we could just say, well, the numbers made us do it. Uh, when we look at, at the numbers, I think on the basis, the big difference between option one and option seven is, is cost. Uh, and, and, and maybe that's enough to make the difference. I don't know. Uh, but from our point of view, it shouldn't be. Um, um, we also uh, are kind of, you know, in a way shocked that it's going forward, knowing that the NCC can't support or won't support or, uh, the option that's being proposed. 
uh, we would have hoped that some kind of accommodation, some kind of possible solution would have been found prior to getting to this step. This is really kind of bringing it to a head, and maybe this is a new confrontational way of doing business, but we find it a little well, hard to deal with. Uh, we'll see what happens, I guess, when it goes through the NCC's own land use approval process. Um, we see that there are really real problems here, and, and uh, from a transportation and transit perspective, both options one and seven score very high. They're almost equal. Uh, so it's not that, as our first speaker said today, it's not that an all or nothing approach. Uh, uh, a BRT for the East community is required, and a BRT is included in option one. Um, the uh, uh, it, it, it's an option that meets with NCC approval now. Uh, it's got, you know, it's got broad support. I mean, in terms, I know not local because we hear all the local communities, but it, overall it has broad support. Um, and even within the, the study's own framework, it, like it comes in second. It's not, it, it's not like a non-starter. It's a, it's a, it's a serious option. Um, now we do hear there's, I mean, there, there are real problems. Uh, one interim measures we 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 support the last speaker that we sh the, the current proposed interim measure isn't isn't suitable it's it's expensive and likely not uh, you know solving anything uh, however if option one was presented as the preferred option an interim measure for option one would be to move immediately with brt through the Innes road blackburn hamlet bypass uh, that would you know, have an opportunity to provide immediate, you know, m much more close in time benefits uh, directly tied to a long term solution. The other long term solutions, it sounds clearly access to the south of the city is a very big problem. Uh, and well, but the Innis Wakali link is, is included in both in both proposals. So, you know, that that should deal with that uh, particular issue. Um, and but but you know and what we hear of course from many many speakers is is you Reno know, Road is a is a mess, and it, and and of course that needs to be fixed, uh, and and the residents better served by uh, adequate road uh, services on Reno Road, uh, but that doesn't have to be part of any option. That just needs to be fixed, uh, and, and 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 ought to be anyways. So. Basically, you know, on that, on that basis, we we uh, we hope you would consider steering uh, steering staff to uh, going back to the table to see whether with with the NCC something more like option one can be uh, moved ahead instead of what seems to be to us right now sort of a dead letter with option seven. If if we know already that. Uh, uh, in advance that an approval process through the NCC is not likely to, to change their position. And that's, that's, uh, that's our comments for today. Great, thank you. I'm looking on the board. Uh, I go to committee members first, Councillor Fleury. Mr. Chair, I'm fine to, uh, uh, to, to go after uh, Councillor Aguilar if you don't mind. Uh, uh, no, it's okay. Well, we're, I'm going to stick with the rules. I'm also trying to get to our questions okay. and answers uh, down a little bit of time. Yeah. Thank you. I respect that. Thank you. Um, Monsieur Joannis, merci de votre présentation. Je veux juste clarifier un des points que vous, avez, vous venez de faire au niveau du, euh, du BRT. Vous, vous proposez que pour l'instant, il y aurait un corridor euh, qui est disponible pour euh, mettre en place des mesures euh, transitoires. Pourriez-vous juste nous donner un petit peu euh, l'aperçu de ces connexions-là? Je veux juste m'assurer que je comprends bien ce que vous proposez. Uh, comme, uh, désolé, vous avez dépl déplacé sur mon écran, um, uh, comme, uh, comme connexion uh, à, la station, uh, à la station Blair. Alors, si vous pourriez juste le parcourir pour moi rapidement ce que vous voyez comme BRT, je pense que ce serait pertinent. Ben, L'option 1 inclut un corridor euh, rapide pour les autobus à, à, à partir de Brian Coburn sur Navin au... Euh, Uh, Blackburn Bypass, puis tout le tour. Alors, le plan uh, final, finalement, du BRT pourrait être mis en œuvre plus rapidement uh, en ajoutant des voies de uh, transport rapide uh, dans le corridor qui, qui est déjà existant. OK. Je comprends ce que vous voulez dire. Simplement, uh, je, vais, je vais clarifier uh, après, à la fin des délégations, je vais, ça, ça sera certainement une de mes questions, puis 
mes, mes collègues qui ont plus de contexte à ça, si vous pouvez euh, nous éclairer un petit peu sur ce que vous faites. Je pense que c'est un, un point qui, qui est pertinent. Est-ce qu'il y aurait une transition vers un essai d'un corridor rapide pour les, pour les autobus? Euh, merci, M. Joannis, de votre euh, proposition et de présentation. Yeah, merci, uh, Conseiller Fleury. Uh, Conseiller Aiglaire, s'il vous plaît. Thank you, uh, Chair. And I'll, I'll keep this uh, keep this brief. Uh, Mr. Joannis, you, you uh, spoke about your hope that uh, people could go back to the table and try and sort something out. Um, I don't know if you're aware that, that um, Councillor Kitts has a motion on the, on the table for a, for a hundred day process, um, which even though I don't vote today, I'm supportive of having been part of a very similar process uh, in sorting out some of the LRT uh, issues with, with, the, with the NCC. But I guess my question to you is, you know, to sort of help fuel that discussion, if you will, that, that Councillor Kitts is hoping will, will happen. Uh, you seem pretty firm on, on item number one or option number one, but is, is there any modification you think that could be made to option seven that would make it more palatable uh, to yourself and, and, the, and the organization that you represent? You know, I think our, our, you know, our basic uh, uh, problem or concern with option seven is that it really does create a whole new corridor through the green belt. And that's like that can't really be fixed in a way. Uh, it it uh, so so on that basis, um, you know, unless something is findable, you know, another option somewhere between one and seven. In a way, the other thing with option seven, and I know it doesn't have any direct impact on the Merbler Bog. We 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 know that. Uh, and yet, if you're looking at a series of potential corridors, uh, if we had to choose, we would say, let's use the one that's the furthest from the bog. You know, let's use the one that's the furthest from Mayor Blue. Uh, it, it, it just seems more prudent to uh, use an already urbanized corridor. Uh, and yes, there's going to be green space losses on that corridor, even if we go with one, that's understood. Uh, but it's a balancing thing. You can't always get everything you want. And so, uh, so in a way, I, I, I think there might be something other than uh, uh, one, um, two and a half, I don't know, but probably not seven because really seven is just putting a new corridor right through. Now, that doesn't say we, we don't need to fix Renault Road. That has to be fixed. It doesn't, but it doesn't have to be fixed by putting a four lane road there with two transitway uh, bus lanes. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming out uh, today. Our next delegation, uh, Riley uh, Batista with the Chapel Hill Self Community Association. So we'll allow them into the room. Oh, perfect. There you are there, Riley. I'm Great. Here. Terrific. Absolutely. You have five minutes. Okay. The floor is yours. Okay, perfect. So first of all, I want to uh, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. It's my first time, so I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I am the president of the Chapel Hill South Community Association, and I'm here to um, ask you to approve option seven. We are in support of it. Our board has always been in support of option seven. Um, and I uh, respect all the information that's been given uh, up to this point and our concerns are in line with the other community associations and some of the other points that have been brought forward. So I don't want to get too much into it. Um, just for perspective, where we sit, uh, our community, we are at that nice little junction between um, Navin and Innes. So we have about 1500 homes and all of those developments that are being built in the southern part of Orleans that traffic, we feel it. It's on, it's on both, side, both sides of us. And then we also have the Brian Coburn, um, uh, Brian Coburn behind us. So um, from our association perspective, what we see in our number one complaint that we hear as an association is around traffic. So we are a car dependent community, um, absolutely. Um, the way we see it, options one and four and everything kind of in between, with the exception of seven, has traffic going on to Innes. So Innes, Navin, so we feel that traffic. You can expand as many lanes as you want. You can put as many stops as long that path as you want, but traffic will still go there. 
And we feel that. We not only feel that when we leave our community, to, whether it's to go get groceries or drive our kids to school or uh, just do errands or take part in recreational activities, we feel that through our community. And we've worked with Councillor Dudas um, to install traffic calming measures because we have seen an increase in vehicles along Orleans. We have managed to lower the speed limit um, through our community, uh, but we are now looking at um, citizen safety because of the amount of traffic that uh, goes through our community. Um, so that that is felt. We we have seen it with the uh, Brian Coburn being built. We uh, we see it. Um, as the developments are continuously growing and our community association stance to all new developments that are coming into Orleans is what is the impact? Um, what is the plan? How do we build that infrastructure to get cars going to where they need to go? So it's not just cars. Um, I guess on that note, I would also like to add um, Option seven is the only option that addresses the behavior of the vehicles on Renault. So option one and four, personally, as an association, we've talked about this, we don't see those options impacting the behavior of the traffic going down Renault Road. The other point I wanna bring up is the fact that our community is not well serviced by public transit. We have no effective connection to the LRT. I'm a public, federal public servant. Uh, prior to COVID, I commuted downtown all the time. Before the LRT was in place, I was happy to walk down the street, get on a bus, read my book, do whatever it is I had to do, I'd end up at work. When the LRT came into place and then the bus routes changed, it took me the same amount of time to actually get to, sometimes longer, uh, to my office on Queen Street. Return, complete nightmare. So how did I fix my problem? My husband would drive me every day to Blair Station. So I went from a bus user to a car user to use the LRT. We live closest. Uh, it's a 10 minute drive with no traffic down Orleans to get to the 174. And that is a, a five kilometer drive, just for perspective. So that's a real issue. The fact that our residents in Chapel Hill South cannot access, or Chapel Hill South, all of Southern actually Orleans, cannot access easily the, uh, the rest of the city, the Southern part of the city, it impacts. This is, this is real life. This isn't just on paper and studies. I have five children um, in post-secondary, moving to post-secondary. We advised them when they were looking at going to Algonquin, at going to Carleton, the, it, how would they get there? It's next to impossible for those kids to get there. I have five kids that all drive and I'm a little bit embarrassed to say they all have vehicles. So in our house in Chapel Hill South, we have seven vehicles because we need it. We just, that's our lifestyle. And it's not like we, it's not that we hate the environment. I am a bus user, I'm an avid cyclist, I'm an outdoor enthusiast, I walk, ride my bike all the time. That's just how we can manage our life. And we are citizens of Ottawa. There's also seems to be some pretty heavy assumptions around destination traffic. I guess I kind of, I just covered that point. Um, basically everything feeds us north to go west to go south. So that doesn't make sense to me. We actually need to alleviate some of the pressures. Someone has said this before, it's like a funnel. Doesn't matter how wide you open that top of the funnel if you don't change the end. And there's physics around that, it's kind of really interesting. But um, we, need, we need to alleviate that pressure and we just do. Um, I guess the other point I do wanna bring up is, you know, I work, um, in service management in the federal government. And we look at design services based on needs and expectations of those we serve. Uh, you as the city, you need to design services based on those expectations, now and future uh, expectations. And um, we need to make, we as a, as a community need to make data-driven decisions. I believe the data is in, option seven scored really well on several points. And I think it's also important to be objective when we look at scores, not subjective. 
And the reference to the natural environment scoring poorly for option seven compared to option one, that's a really subjective statement. It scored 37 out of 44, as opposed to option one that scored, sorry, 32 out of 44, as opposed to option one that scored 36 out of 44. So that's percentage wise, that's really only nine, nine percentage points. So I think it's, um, it's really important that we stay objective when we're referring to the data that's coming in. And I think that's really important. Um, yeah, I think that's all I really want to address. I do um, admire the point of views of, um, of everyone and um, in support of option seven. And I commend uh, my fellow uh, citizens for coming forward with this type of information and the, the passion they bring to the table um, about this. And I, I really hope that the transport the transportation committee can um, see their way forward to, to move this forward. Uh, but from a community association uh, perspective, uh, our board really feels that the only viable option is option seven. Terrific uh, presentation. We do have a question from Councillor Dudas and then Councillor Fleury. Yes, thank you so much Riley for being here and you did great for a first time. So, so you, there was no need for nerves. Very much appreciated. And I know that the Community Association has been very involved in this project for decades. Um, we've talked a lot with past delegations about the growth in South Orleans. We know that 18% of the remaining greenfield development is happening in that area. But Chapel Hill South is also very, very close to Innis Road. And what we haven't discussed is what is happening along that stretch. We know anybody who lives in the area who's been out here and knows there's a lot of big box stores. But Riley, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about some of the large scale developments that we're seeing adjacent to Innis Road and what that will mean for traffic flow in the next five years, 10 years, and what that will do to your community. Well, I'm certainly not the best person to speak to this, but from uh, from the stuff that uh, we have seen, one of the biggest developments is actually butts up right next to uh, to Chapel Hill South, and it's the old golf lands. And I think there's a pin proposal going in with a multi-level, multi-building uh, facility, um, and it's just it's right now. Um, the community that is built back behind those lands, um, they have one road out. And that's even before this, this new development is going to be built in front of them. They have one road out. So there's another stoplight that needs to go up or they can't get out of their community. The, um, the traffic is so heavy on Innis, it's not enjoyable to even walk down there anymore. I, I know there was talk about you know, walkability and that, no one wants to walk along in this. No one wants to ride their bike along in this. It's, it's actually very dangerous. And if you ride your bike, you pop on the sidewalk because uh, you know, you, you want to be careful with that. But the, the amount of traffic that's on in this, sometimes when I've had to uh, take my kids to school um, down at Kareen Wilson, which is, uh, you know, a good five, six kilometers down Orleans, um, driving, and the cars are so backed up on Innis going westbound that they'll block the intersection. So if there's any weather, anything going on, it's just backed up. And then you're like, oh, how do I get to where I need to go? So, and that's, that's during rush hour. So um, we just see, uh, a, and the pandemic, we thought the pandemic, we're like, whew, we should be able to get around the city, no problem. There's no more rush hour. And that was, that's a mistake. Um, you know, you're like, where are all these people coming from? Where are they all going? Um, I guess they're not all a federal public servants that get to work from home. Um, but it, it, the traffic is insane on Innis. Um, it, and it's just, it really impacts. You have to think about where you want to go. What time is it? Where do I need to go? And I need to work in a, a buffer zone because of the traffic. Okay. And, and I appreciate that too, because I think that you know, to my colleagues who probably know the East End really well, but I'll just flag, Innis is the Blackburn Bypass. So all of that traffic mm -hmm. goes on to the bypass. There, it's the same road or it goes through Blackburn Hamlet. And the East End is only connected to the south end of our city 
and the center of our city by three main roads, the highway, Montreal, or Innes. And then if you want to go anywhere else, you got to take back roads, rural roads. So, or, or this Georgia Chin Parkway. So, I mean, once again, if you're talking about major roadways, there's only the three and we're trying to funnel transit there. We're trying to get cycling there. It's, it's definitely difficult. So Riley, thank you for flagging that. I appreciate it. And for bringing your perspective to this committee. Thank you, uh, Councillor Fleury, and then Vice Chair Leeper. Thank you, uh, Chair, and, and thank you, Riley, for your presentation. I, I want to specifically come to the, the data point and, and your reference to um, your, your daily commute. And, and I, I'm looking for, it will be questions that I ask for, to staff later uh, in relations to the COVID impacts and the federal public servants mm -hmm. uh, future uh, workforce. So I'm curious to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> If, uh, if your employer allows you to go back to work, are you planning to do the Monday, Friday commute uh, that you were describing earlier? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, okay. So I actually, uh, because the ability to work from home, have uh, actually moved to uh, Parks Canada, uh, which is looking like we get to work from home on a more permanent basis. Uh, and if I do have the opportunity to go into the office, I will choose to go maybe once or twice a week. Um, now, I love going to work. Um, I don't love the commute. It was it it's eats up so much of of my time. Um, so I do have uh, five teenage children. I would love to get out of the house more often uh, than not, especially when they're kicking around. Um, but it is actually a, a drain. The, the commute is a, um, is a drain. And the park and ride is actually behind me. And it doesn't get used. Um, it just doesn't. It never did uh, prior to the pandemic. And I know why that is. It's, it's because it doesn't save any time. And I don't see how a bus going onto the Blackburn bypass to get down to Blair Station and it's not just going, and I, I think that's not talked about enough. It's coming home. It is coming home. So um, for any of you who have tried to experience that, you know, it just, if you have some time, you might want to experience, really, truly experience that. At the end of the day, when you get home, like the, that LRT, I, I am a fan when it works, but getting off it and waiting for a bus and then having that bus sit in traffic, it is the worst feeling in the world at the end of the day. And um, I, just, uh, Riley, I don't want to interrupt you, but yep. I, I think you, you got to the point that I wanted to make, which is there is kind of a changing reality, right? To most residents that are federal public servants. And I mm -hmm. wonder if you were in our shoes today, where we, where there's going to be so many, we could, you know, ask every delegation that has very similar um, similar work environment and, and their answer would likely be different. Although maybe very similar that their future is likely hybrid. And I, I wonder uh, how you see that influence our decisions uh, today. I guess, I guess that's where I wanted to, to land on my question is understanding that there is traffic generally, but there is peak traffic that is core to, the, to this effort here um wondering you know what's your advice to us knowing that there are a lot of public servants that live in orleans there are a lot of public servants that are unsure about their work future or their day what their daily commutes might look like so you know give give me i'd like i'd love your advice on what what that means in terms of numbers and what that means in terms of you know a pretty significant investment here that's being asked well it is it is interesting in terms of uh, public servants and going back to work or not going back to work. And um, I really feel if rapid transit isn't addressed for public servants, they will take their cars because they'll likely work in a hybrid model. Um, not just that, but it's the kind of the expectations that we grow as, as citizens. And I am a public servant and yes, I could I commute or could commute or have commuted, but there's so much more to my life as a citizen than just going downtown to work. 
I need to move around my community and my community, as much as I would love just to stay in Orleans at some point in my life, I'm not, I'm a city, I'm a city commuter. I'm a city user. I want to move around my city. And so to do a lot of other people, especially with kids, when you have to drive them and you want them to be active and play in sports, you need to move around. I know there's peak times, but um, I would suggest that the transportation committee actually really looks at, instead of designing, that's forcing, I guess, as a citizen, sorry, I'm just gonna back up really quickly. As a citizen, I use the transportation corridors in a variety, I'm a, I'm a different type of user. I'm a commuter, I'm a mother, um, an outdoor, uh, outdoor enthusiast. So there are many ways that you should, as a city, be addressing my needs and expectations. And funnily, me as a user all through the Innisfawkley area, which all roads seem to lead to the hut, um, except option seven, that doesn't meet the, all, all of my needs. I don't know response. if Thank that you. makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I was asking a very, very, uh, I, I wanted to hear directly from you on, on the specifics of changing lives and, and if that should change our, our data or, or approach. So thank you. Yeah. But Great. I don't think you should be designing a, ser a service to, you should be designing to, for my, needs as a user, not the city's needs. I don't know if Great. that makes sense. Great. Thanks, Riley. Uh, we do have another question, series of questions from Vice Chair Lieber. Thank you. And uh, I did want to come back to the um, your kids who are post-secondary, they're, um, uh, they're driving to university and college, I assume right now, because of the um, unsustainability of, of trying to do that every day on transit. Does the opening of Convent Glen and Orleans LRT stations change the math for you? I know OC Transpo is probably going to be looking at, you know, some sort of a rejig of local bus routes in order to get people from their neighborhood fairly quickly to uh, something like Orleans Station, or I guess they call it Convent Glen Station, mm -hmm. Jean Dark Station. From there, of course, it is a straight shot to, I think, most of our post-secondary um, uh, institutions. Carleton will require a, a change at Bay, uh, Bayview Station. Does that change the math in terms of your kids trying to get to post-secondary at all? Well, their post-secondary paths are, have already been cemented, but okay. if I were to back up, given, given this, um, again, our area is five kilometers, um, five kilometers from the LRT. It like, it's, it's still a trek. And so either you go straight north and across, um, but that doesn't exist right now, like in terms of that rapid transit to, to an LRT. Uh, if that exists, mm -hmm. then to uh, University of Ottawa, absolutely. I guess once the train gets up to Carleton, that would likely work. Um, other facilities such as Algonquin, I know that's a, a potential uh, place for one of our kids uh, to follow up with. Um, no, that doesn't seem like that, that would be an option. Right. It's uh, mm -hmm. their time is pretty. Well, I guess I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I can't speak to that. But um, it's certainly it's certainly the, the transportation that exists today actually plays a role in the decision of where these kids will go to school, um, as it does if they move away and rent a house or rent an apartment. How do they get to school? How long will it take? Do they need to walk? Is there a bus? Like that's a major factor in some of these uh, decisions. No, of course. Um, I guess I, I just wouldn't want to come out of this discussion today with um, uh, a notion that the transportation uh, context for the East End uh, wouldn't be changed fairly fundamentally by the arrival of LRT um, at multiple stops along the 174. Um, you know, when I was going to Kareem, um, it was uh, a, a you know, a 20 minute bus ride to get to Plas, and then another 20 minute bus ride to get north of the Queensway to, to Kareem, right? Um, you know, I know well what that local route to Plas Orleans is like, and I did it 
constantly. And that's how I got to the University of Ottawa as well, is local bus, Place Orleans, 95, straight to the University of Ottawa. And when the LRT stations open up for Chapel Hill South, um, you know, it's very possible that there would be a single local bus that gets you to uh, Convent Glen or to Jean d'Arc. Uh, and then the LRT goes straight to Algonquin, Carleton, University of Ottawa. Um, I, I think that is sort of a fundamental change for the East End that needs to be taken into account when we're talking about uh, any given piece of what that context is going to look like. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Oh, I wait. Councillor Dudas. This may have been a slip of the tongue, but to my colleague, there will not be a LRT station for Chapel Hill South. There is one for Convent Glen. Chapel Hill South is is south of Innes, so just just clarifying that that's from exactly Chapel Hill the, South getting on a local bus. No, I know. To, I'm just going yeah. back to the yeah. Just just saying, everybody's going to have to bus down, and there's a very large population growth we're seeing in South Orleans. So I just wanted to clarify. That. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you, and thank you very much, Riley, for a first timer. You're a pro, so I really appreciate you coming out today. Uh, we'll thank move you on so to much. our next. Delegation, uh, Tony M uh, McLaughlin. Oh, McClosh. Tony McClosh. Forgive me if I butchered your name, Tony. There well, we go. It's quite all right. Uh, I get uh, any number of different varieties, but it's just fine. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, as a resident of Southeast, Southeast Ottawa, oh, sorry, I lost my uh, speaking notes here. All right. So you can hear me okay? Uh, there was a slide presentation. I was just going to ask them to load. I saw the first one up there. Is it visible or? Yeah, just coming up right now. I'll be up in one second. Okay, that's great. Darn. Sorry, I end up losing my speaking notes when the, the screen goes large. Ah, my apologies. Somehow my uh, view disappeared on me here. And, uh, darn. All right, you have to bear with me. Uh, anyway, as a resident of Southeast Ottawa, my comments today are in support of the extension of Brian Coburn, known as option seven. Uh, others will have presented uh, uh, the various aspects of the proposed extension, but I'd like to focus my comments on the matters of traffic safety and personal safety and citizen well-being. Next slide, please. Uh, actually, next slide. As I have a 40 year career with the RCMP and I've policed in five provinces. So I'd like to preface my remarks by the statement that Renault Road as it presently exists is perhaps the worst traffic corridor I've ever had the just dubious pleasure of navigating. And even with all my experience and training, I am reluctant to use Renault Road. <clears throat> and when I do, it's with all my skills keenly focused in order for me to make my way to the uh, safer routes. Next slide, please. In my opinion, we could easily pay for a full-time uh, traffic officer by having the right tickets for violation after violation every day, although admittedly there being no safe place to pull over. Next slide, please. For no road at, at best, an aging rural farm road with a measured volume of over 17,000 vehicles per day, as we've already heard, meaning about 750 vehicles per hour, which is over twice the intended maximum capacity. And over 70% of that traffic connects with Anderson Road heading north and south. Next slide, please. To the west of our residential areas, the speed zone is 80 kilometers per hour. And the problem being that the road itself is very narrow with no paved shoulders. And at best, there are uneven gravel edges that crumble and slope away. So there are essentially no escape routes for drivers to take evasive action if needed. The road for the large part is marked with a double solid line indicating that it's unsafe to pass, yet at any hour of any day, you will experience aggressive diver drivers who are intent on passing and speeding by a great danger to all. Even this, the so-called passing areas are treacherous. Next slide, please. The traffic volume at any time is heavy, but at peak hours, it is literally at a crawl. And this is an unacceptable level of traffic volume serves to increase drivers' impatience, leading even to rage. And while causing others fear and anxiety, all of which causes a significant rich of risk of property damage and human carnage. At peak hours, the cacophony of noise from engines idling, revving, tires squealing, horns blaring, and the stench of pollution from exhaust fumes all leads to high levels of frustration and anger for both the users of the road and the residents, leaving everyone feeling helpless. 
Apart from the cars, the roads are used by buses, commercial trucks, heavy equipment, and including cyclists and farm vehicles. And this traffic all tends to decrease the speeds, but conversely, it increases the number of impatient drivers who become even more determined to speed and pass despite incrementally greater risks. Next slide, please. As mentioned, there are two severe 90 degree turns, the infamous S turns, one of which is surrounded by protected wetlands. Near these S turns, all the motorists are faced with two sections that are crossed by the popular Prescott Trail, thereby exposing all the motorists, pedestrians, cyclists, and even the animals to a high degree of risk. In recent times, there have been two fatal accidents that include a pedestrian and a cyclist. As well, there are numerous other incidents of property damage due to collisions, rollovers, and vehicles leaving the road who are trying to avoid a collision or even basic driver error. Next slide, please. This untenable situation is only going to get exp exponentially worse as the city continues to approve developments with higher population densities throughout our communities. We have zero compliance with the city's own 15 minute community concept and public transport uh, transit offers only limited inconvenient service. And these gaps simply mean that every household is forced to rely primarily on vehicle transportation day by day. Next slide, please. Best estimates for the near term indicate an increase of about 10,000 more vehicles all needing to enter this traffic quagmire. Simply put, these aging rural farm roads can no longer suffice as major arterial traffic routes. Our citizens are in urgent need of safe, efficient and proper roadways. And the extension of Brian Coburn by implementing option seven is the optimal way forward. Option seven is really the only logical solution. And the scores, including the environmental ones are close enough to the other uh, options that we really have no other choice but to see option seven as the one and only uh, solution. So the extension Brian Coburn is long overdue. Mm -hmm. Sorry, one minute, thank you. So I'll close by suggesting that any other efforts to implement some sort of form of interim measure should also be discarded as being ineffective and potentially a waste of money and resources. Any interim traffic solution is far more likely to cause option seven to be deferred indefinitely and that cannot be the case. Uh, but thank you for the opportunity to speak today and I enjoyed the, uh, listening to the other presentations. Hello, sorry about that. Okay, uh, great. I'm just looking at terrific presentation today, uh, Tony. I really appreciate it. I'm not seeing any questions on the board. So uh, thank you very much for coming out today. And we'll go to our next delegation, Edison Stewart. And I see Edison, you're all fired up and ready to go. So that's terrific. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm in uh, Chapel Hill South. Um, I want to start by uh, commending the presentations of Heather Bradley from Bradley Estates, uh, Rochelle Lacour from Avalon, and of course, uh, Riley Batista from Chapel Hill South. Uh, and I have to agree uh, with a lot of what Mr. McCulloch just said. Um, the key point that I think is coming through here is that Orleans badly needs another east-west link. There are, there are some minor ones, but there are currently two major ones. One is the 174 and the other is Innes. Now, there's been a major expansion along the 174. Within a year or so, uh, I believe another lane is being added and the train's going down the middle. Uh, so that's, that's really good for traffic that's uh, down in the north end of Orleans. But along Innes, uh, and Innes is a long road, but along Innes, that's where I would submit 90% of the housing growth is happening. Uh, in a sense south, there's nothing in terms of uh, uh, highways. In us west of Orleans Boulevard, that is from Orleans Boulevard down to the 417, has not changed in size or capacity in 30 years, maybe longer. And uh, according to all the plans that I've seen, it's not projected to change by 2031. So no change to Ennis, this major east-west arterial, for 40 years. In us east of Orleans Boulevard has not changed in 20 years. You've heard others talk about Ennis Road gridlock. It's absolutely the case. And as we heard at the top of the meeting, Orleans as a whole is expected to grow 41% between 2018 and 2046. Think about that. If it's 41% in all of Orleans, Simple math means that it's a lot higher in South Orleans where most of the undeveloped land is. That is a huge amount of additional traffic. Much of it is east-west. Some of it goes south, yes, but much of it is east-west. 
and there is no plan to deal with it. Now, congestion on Ennis, east of Orleans Boulevard, has eased uh, with the Brian Coburn extension out to trim. That's good. But west of Orleans Boulevard, there is no change. All of the traffic from Coburn is fed onto Ennis via the bypass. Remember, that's a road that hasn't changed in 30 years and is not going to change for another 10. All option seven would do is to move the junction of Coburn and Ennis a little further west. So basically down towards Blair. That's where the bottleneck would be. I've, as a few of you would know, I've been pushing for a different option. So option seven, uh, but go straight to the 417. Straight to the 417. People going uh, west easily could get on, uh, could uh, get onto the 417 from there. People going south would, could easily get on from there. You would not need this uh, NS Walkley Road. It would not be necessary. So um, uh, just a final point, uh, the Chapel Hill Association Board, and I'm not really a member, but I did participate last year. We had a bit of a discussion about this. There was no vote on it, and I cannot speak for them, but the people at that meeting agreed with option seven going out to the 417. That would be my recommendation. Thank you for your time. Great, uh, really appreciate your delegation today. Uh, Councillor Luloff. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stewart, for, for your delegation today. I think that um, finding a way uh, to do that uh, should certainly be a consideration. I think that um, it would serve um, our traffic woes a heck of a lot better than any interim solution that we may be able to come up with. Uh, I think that it is the intention in the future to, to push for uh, a connection that looks like that. And, and I think that you kind of get get it in a roundabout way by going, you know, option seven and then, uh, and then the Walkley connection. Um, but essentially you're right. South Orleans uh, needs to be connected uh, to the 417 um, eventually. And uh, I'm hoping sooner rather than later. Unfortunately, it's not on the table today, uh, but I want you to know that uh, uh, there are more people that support this, this idea. It would, it's just about trying to find a way to do it uh, in, a, in a responsible, an environmentally responsible way. So I do really appreciate you coming out of this and thank you. Thanks, Matt. If I could just respond to that quickly. Yeah, quickly uh, please. please. My, my fear would be that once the NS Walkley um, uh, connection is built, it will be hard for the city to find funds uh, or whoever needs to find the funds to, to, to build a, a route out to the 417. So that wouldn't be bad at all for people who are heading south. I would acknowledge that if you're going out Ennis and uh, you want to go south, then the Ennis Walkley connector uh, could be beneficial. But I think the bulk of our traffic, even 10, 20 years from now, is going to be east-west. And people who are going to go east-west will not want to go south down to Walkley in order to get back onto the 417 to go west. So um, uh, if this has to be done in stages, my plea would not would be to not build the Ennis Walkley connector. Uh, and then uh, when we can, uh, build it out to the 417, but not to Walkley. Thanks, Edison. Great, thank you very much for uh, coming out today. Next up, we have Patrick, uh, Patrick Byrne. Yeah, Patrick Byrne here. Great. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, well, afternoon. It was morning yeah, afternoon, started, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, Bradley Estates, where I've uh, resided uh, since the area was developed uh, 15 years ago. And when the first uh, invitation came out to uh, join the group today, uh, I thought, well, private citizen, I can put my name forward, and sure, I'll give my response. I noticed most of the responses so far have been from community associations, uh, various groups around the city who have a uh, maybe a, a, a desire to protect uh, the mirror and so on. Um, and and this, is, this is now, I'm representing none of them. I'm representing myself and certainly the neighbors around who I speak with, 
but most of them are working all day and uh, they don't have the uh, retirement option of uh, getting on the Zoom meeting at nine o'clock in the morning and still being on at two in the afternoon uh, to have a, chat, a chance to, to chat with you. I commend all of you. I've been, I've been uh, on Zoom meetings most days of the week uh, and for you to be sitting through what very often is repetitive uh, discussion uh, is very admirable, and, and I thank you for your service for that, for that reason. Um, I'm here personally to, devote, uh, to propose that option seven is the one that I would support uh, for all of the reasons that you've heard. Uh, I'm not going to put up a series of uh, overheads. They've been handled uh, terrifically well by people who have preceded me and by people who are much more expert than I am. But I do know what I see and I do know what I experience here as just a member of the community. Uh, the changes that I've seen here with the increased housing has been well documented. You all know that. Um, I've traveled Renault Road uh, since it was a paved rural road back in the 1980s. And I know before that it was just simply a dirt road that was uh, not, hadn't been paved yet. Um, obviously our city's growing in geometric uh, fashion in regard to uh, um, traffic. The city's still allowing the tremendous number of houses to be built out here. We need the places for people to live. I understand that. Uh, but we obviously have to change the traffic routes uh, that that don't work right now. The rapid transit, I don't think anybody argues against. All of that's there. The question is how and, and where it goes. Um, we've seen only too clearly in the last month in downtown Ottawa how gridlock traffic uh, tr uh, affects the welfare of people in an area. And it's affecting the people in this area, not only physically, but uh, I'm sure mentally. Um, Miss Batista talked about the, uh, the the trials of traveling downtown on on uh, uh, transit and how that affects her in, in a lot of ways. And I'm sure that she speaks for many people. Um, what did get me upset in the last uh, several weeks was were the inaccuracies I would read in the newspaper printed as if they were true regarding the option seven destroying the, the complete uh, mare blue bog with a, a highway going through the middle, all that kind of thing. And that was partly why I decided that, you know what, I would come on here and have a chat, even just as uh, representing myself, um, to, to, to suggest that that's not how it's looked at in this area. Uh, the present roadway to me is more of a threat to uh, these lands and will even become so uh, more so with uh, more traffic as we uh, uh, continue with people using that, that same option. Um, I strongly support the option seven as the only solution to reduction of uh, the terrible traffic uh, increases, the safety of the mirror blue wetlands and the health and welfare, welfare of the inhabitants of the Orleans South community. Uh, and I thank you for giving me some time today to let you personally know, just an ordinary guy out here in Orleans, that that's how uh, one guy feels about it. And I don't speak uh, exactly for everybody else here, but I know myself that there are a lot of people who feel the same way. Thanks. That's all I need to, to say. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, uh, it's great that you took time to come out today. We really appreciate that. I don't see questions, so we'll move along to the next delegation. And I'll yep. confirm with the coordinator. Do we have Ted on the line? No, Mr. McKay cannot attend. Okay, great. So we'll, uh, he can always submit his uh, in writing as he indicated he might do. Uh, we'll go on to delegation 15 of 19, uh, Roseanne. And forgive me, is that, is that, is that Illand? Illand? I, I'm can't, having trouble reading up my sheet. I hope I haven't butchered Roseanne's name. <laughs> I believe Ms. Island may be participating via telephone instead of video. Okay, terrific. Can you hear me now? There you are. Uh, Hello, well, can you hear I, me now? We certainly can, and you have five minutes. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. My name is Roseanne Island, or Elon. 
I am a resident of Ottawa and a citizen of Canada, and I, I am here to speak on behalf of Mebler Wetlands. Councillor Chair Tierney, Vice Chair Leeper, Councillors DeRuz, Deans, Dudas, Al Shantiri, Fleury, Hubley, Kitts, Luloff, Menard, and Mayan Watson. Mebler is one of 37 Canadian wetlands of international imp importance and is included in the Ramsar Convention ratified by Canada in 1981. You've heard this earlier today, for those of you who didn't know prior. The Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, known as IPCC report, has compiled a scientific analysis of the work of hundreds of scientists from over 67 countries. This report informs us of the evidence of climate change and its impacts on us as citizens. As importantly, it offers mitigating and adaptive strategies and comprehensive actions on addressing the climate emergency in which we are living. Mer Bleu is the largest surviving bog of Southern Ontario and is part of a carbon capture global study, the longest and oldest active study in the world. Its significance is remarkable. And what should that mean to you as councillors? Well, you should recognize the Mer Bleu bog is one of nature's natural infrastructures and that it traps the emissions of carbon dioxide from the air, transporting it underground. The Mer Bleu bog is a carbon sink and is a mitigating infrastructure and a needed climate emergency strategy. The Brian Cooper and Cumberland Highway will further threaten this 7,700 year old bog, which is also a habitat for hundreds of species at risk, plants and wildlife included. Presently, as was mentioned earlier, turtle species such as the snapping, the painted and the blending are killed each year on the Anderson Road. All artificial man-made boundaries are destructive to ecosystems and wildlife habitats. First, as nature is not confined by man-made structures. And secondly, we residents will endure the impacts of the loss of these natural infrastructures through poor air quality, increased ill health, floods, and other weather impacts if we continue to ignore the science. Mitigating climate impacts requires our, an understanding of what natural infrastructures presently at no financial cost provide to humanity, and in this case, to the residents of Ottawa. It requires from you Transportation Committee members, constructive and superior expertise of what we now have and what we are about to destroy through another development process, which will only exacerbate the climate impacts we are already experiencing. Every single action undertaken by this committee and the Ottawa City Council to destroy a green space natural infrastructure is an act of ecocide. You are responsible for knowingly ignoring the scientific facts of climate change and willfully facilitating increased carbon emissions. You and your decisions will impact Ottawans and their further future families. Just as the BC residents endured the atmospheric river events in November 2021, and Brisbane, Australia is presently enduring a 500 year event flood today. So it is no longer if, but when. Our turn is next. 
Thank you, gentlemen and lady councillors, and good luck with your decision making. We will all reap your rewards. Thank you. Great. Thank you for uh, coming out today. I'm just looking. I don't see any hands up. So thank you for your delegation. Uh, on to delegation 16, Jim Petrie. Mr. Chairman, members of the planning committee, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm the past president, president of the Friends of Mayor Blue and a longtime resident of the area, having lived on Mayor Blue for more than 40 years. Unfortunately, health reasons forced me to step away from the Friends of Mayor Blue, but that hasn't changed my support for option seven. I supported a version of option seven even before option it was identified as option seven. Those living in the uh, Orleans South area desperately need to have uh, and have needed for a long time better access to the 417, the airport, and the south end of the city. All the community associations and organizations, as well as the city, provincial, and federal political representatives of the affected area support option seven. Even the person for whom the road is named, Brian Coburn, uh, I have an email from him I will read if I have time, uh, support option seven. Um, more importantly, the independent consultants hired by the city to evaluate the various options have concluded uh, option seven is a recommended route. Concerns been expressed by some that option seven will impinge on the Maribel and Bog these concerns are unfounded as reported by the cons consultants and has been spoken to in great length and in greater detail by other presenters. However, it's worth repeating that option seven is the most, for the most part, goes through unpopulated fields and over existing roads that don't impact the bog. All one needs to do is look at a map and see that the existing Renault road and proposed extension from Anderson to the 417 is north of the defined area of the bog. The consultants and others have done an excellent job in addressing the details of the different options. So I won't reiterate what they said. Uh, there's no question that Orleans is, is a car centric uh, community um, and, and has been a, a, gridlock for many years because of lack of access. Um, my, my presentation today, I want to speak to the issues with the NCC and perhaps Councillor Kitt's motion, which I missed, might already do so. But in any case, um, under previous leadership, uh, the NCC was more than willing to support option seven for a or a version thereof. Um, it was thought that it was an excellent opportunity to work with the city of Ottawa and the community to develop a comprehensive transportation plan that could be used to promote and turn the Mirabla bog from a hidden jewel into a true uh, appreciated treasure. And at the same time, facilitate the transportation needs of the East End residents. At that time, it was the city who wasn't prepared to enter into discussions with the NCC. Unfortunately, it appears that positions have changed and now the NCC under new leadership has decided to demonstrate its superior authority and be uncooperative. The consultants have reported that it's the NCC's position that lands offered by the city in exchange for those required under option seven are unacceptable. That would indicate the impasse with the NCC is over land uh, and, and determining what land is, a, is an appropriate trade. Um, it seems that if lands acceptable to the NCC were offered, their position on option seven might be more receptive. It's simply a matter of negotiation. The residents want option seven, the area needs it, the area politicians and all levels support it and the consultants recommend it. So the city should move forward with option seven and negotiate with the NCC to acquire the required right of way. I encourage this community, this committee rather to not to consider interim solutions which have a way of becoming permanent but rather recommend the entire option seven to council and further request the members of council do everything necessary to obtain the required and reasonable concessions from the NCC to make option seven possible. Uh, one, one final comment, um, 
the gentleman who spoke about going straight to the 417, I think is an excellent idea. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, Councillor Kitts. Thank you, Chair. Just quickly, uh, Jim, because you said you, you'd missed my motion, I just want to let you know, it's it's um, asking the, the minister responsible for the NCC, direct the NCC to strike a joint committee with the city uh, to try and resolve the impasse within 100 days. So I, I'm gathering from your delegation, that's something that uh, you'd support. Hallelujah. Absolutely. Yes. I, I'm very, very frustrated that we have a, a body like the NCC, who's, who don't live in the area for a large part uh, and, and are independent of seemingly any uh, connection with the city uh, to be able to stand in the way of, of this or any other project. Great, thank you very much for being here today. You're welcome. Great, Councilman Menard. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Petrie, for being here and your presentation. Um, I, I want, I was hoping to get more information from you about how um, the Friends of uh, Mer Bleu formed uh, initially. Um, I see the incorporation happened in 2009 and you've been around for a little while. Um, I'm just wondering more about the, the purpose of the group and, and who it's made up of. Well, actually we were formed in closer to 2007 um, and it was a result of, of a, a problem with the adjacent landfill or the landfill in the area. Um, so we formed a committee to deal with that and, and um, dealt with the city of Gloucester, the landfill operator and so on. And it just grew from there. Uh, we dealt with many other issues, including uh, working with the NCC on projects. Um, that's basically how we found it. That's great, thank you. And then how did you come to the position of, of um uh option seven as a committee um running close in terms of an expansion uh, close to uh, the bog well what, when when i was with the friends of mayor bleu i'm no longer as i said with them and i can't speak for them but at the time uh, we looked at all the different options um, we don't just look at the mayor bleu bog we look at the entire community uh and, and the needs of the community and, and the different options that were presented uh, didn't seem to make sense apart from option seven. Okay, thank you for that. And in terms of the environmental impacts that have been identified um, both by the NCC and, and by the city in their documentation, uh, including some of the, the harm of um, some rare and significant uh, plants, birds, other wildlife, um, as well as the um, separation of Mer Bleu from Mud Creek, um, which would affect wildlife movement in that corridor, and the, the runoff of silt and road salt um, that would occur, not to mention many of the other uh, issues that have been raised in, in what is uh, really a, one of the most incredible uh, places in, in the world, really. Um, this bog, uh, you know, and related peatlands occupies a very uh, important place in, in Ottawa. And in the entire world, there's only 3% of the surface of the planet um, that has this type of condition um, and this type of carbon sequestration anywhere. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, do you have any concerns about those environmental impacts that have been laid out in detail by the NCC, as well as by the city, because of all the mitigation that we're saying has to occur here. Is there no concern there from the Friends of Mablo that, that that could harm that environment uh, in this area? As I said earlier, I can cannot speak for the association currently, but at the time uh, we, we looked at, at the various options and, and the mitigation that was going to take place and, and felt that doesn't matter what you do, there's going to be an impact on the environment. So basically the option is uh, stop giving building permits to the east end of Ottawa or figure out some way to get people from the east end because they are car dependent. They're, they're, they're gonna work, they're gonna, they're gonna uh, 
go downtown or do anything else, go to the airport, they need a vehicle. Um, so it doesn't matter what you do, it's gonna have an impact. And, and okay. The thank, feeling thank you for that. Okay. I appreciate, no, I appreciate your answers. Uh, thank you for that. And I just, I, after this meeting, if you get a chance, I would, I would encourage everyone to look up the concept of an induced demand. And that's that when you build larger roads or widen roads, it fills up and it ends up with the exact same congestion that you started with. And so I just encourage, because a lot of people are talking about sort of the congestion and the travel and car centric communities. The solution here is, is transit and other forms of mobility in my view. Um, but that induced demand concept is important to understand in these conversations. So I, I appreciate very much your answers and look forward to further discussion. Thank you. Great. Thanks, uh, Councilman Menard. Councilor Dudas. Yeah, Jim, thank you so much for being here. I know you've been involved in this file for decades. Um, and I do appreciate you taking time, even though you're no longer with uh, the friends at the moment. I just wanted to ask, because there seems to be a lot of confusion about where option seven would run. Would option seven run through the bog? Absolutely not. It, 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 option seven, if, if the double 90 degree turn at, at Reno Road was removed, uh, would, would stay further away from the bog than current. It, it, runs, it runs through fields, Reno Road and, and straight out to the, uh, towards the 417 and, and just look at the map and it's quite obvious. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, and just in terms of my colleagues comment about induced demand, I've done a lot of research, I've looked into it too. It is a thing, I do understand that. Can you run a bus, can you run a bus through a field? Because once again, you know, I'm going, I'm looking back at, we've been talking about transit. This was always the Cumberland Transit Way. It was named Brian Coburn Extension because, you know, the road was named after uh, Mr. Coburn because of his, you know, iconic work in the East End. You've been around for a long time, Jim. You know, we know the transit service, even with the LRT coming in South Orleans, is, is subpar at best just because we don't have the roads to run it. Can we run the buses along Renault Road? Oh, uh, that would be irresponsible at, at the least. I mean, the road can't hardly handle a car. So running a bus would not be a safe endeavor. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Petrie. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Mr. Petrie. I appreciate your delegation today. Uh, next up, we have uh, Giselle Doyle. Do I see Giselle here? Um, do you hear me? Hey, yes, we certainly do. We don't, we don't see right. you yet, but we, we certainly hear you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, by now you all heard many valid reasons why option seven is the option that makes sense. Therefore, I'll make this short. We live on Peugeot and my daughter and grandchildren live in Trails Edge, both sides of Brian Coburn. We have been in Orleans since 1982. I also have a 36 year old son with autism who has had to leave the community in order to live as independently as possible as there is no inclusive affordable accessible housing in Orleans. Therefore, unlike most of you, I was pleased to see the city's official plan supporting intensification and inclusive affordable housing in the suburbs. Particularly, I was excited when I saw the development at the end of Joshua in Becca, uh, in Bradley Estate, uh, by the Hydro Lines, where there are approximately now 60 accessible units. In my mind, when I saw the approval of this development and the park and ride being built, I thought the only logical option for continuation of Brian Colbert would go right behind these apartments, allowing him, if he lived there, to easily get to Blair, to work and outings downtown. I'm no longer looking at these apartments, not only because they are not affordable, but for him to travel to Blair would take him 40 minutes by bus. That's to Blair. And nothing after eight o'clock. I won't go into any detail of how trying it's been 
for the last two years, particularly in January, since he lived in that red zone. He lives in that red zone, trying to support our son. I'm urging the city to continue negotiating with the NCC to trade this land in order for option seven to go ahead or leave your intensification for the inner city, not here. Thank you. Great, oh, there, there you are, we see you now. Uh, terrific, uh, terrific uh, delegation. Uh, I don't see any hands up at this point. So thank you very much, Giselle, for coming out today. And we also have correspondence that we also received from you as, as well, a document. So that is being shared with committee and council as well. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, next up, we have Bernard Wood. I, I see Bernard right there. Terrific. Uh, you have five minutes. The floor is yours, good sir. Merci, le, Monsieur le Président. I've been struck uh, through, throughout the day so far by both the sincerity and the seriousness of the delegations and the discussion on what's obviously an extremely important and complex issue. I'm still forming my own views on the merits of the substantive issues and I won't get into all the shortcomings of past planning or try to pick through the endless battles between the city and the NCC. Instead, when I read the technical materials, I felt I had to give you my methodological assessment of them as a professional evaluator. Having led more than 50 international evaluation teams over the past 20 years and winning the world's most prestigious evaluation award in 2012. Analyzing the reports themselves, I was concerned at how the findings from the initial screening assessment were so dramatically transformed in the subsequent evaluation to overturn the clear superiority of option one to favor option seven. <clears throat> Such an extreme reversal raises a red flag for any evaluator, especially when it's combined with such high pressure and heated advocacy that option seven is the only viable option with no other choice. I know the immediate response will be to argue that only the more detailed evaluation can be relied upon, but it's precisely in those devilish details that the selection, weighting and calculation of the criteria, factors and sub-factors in an evaluation can shape the overall outcome. It concerns me to see how these kinds of results get used selectively in debate on both sides. Let me just give you a few striking examples. On cost, after the initial screening ranked the two options equally, the proposal now claims that option one would cost 60% more than its, uh, than its favorite option seven. This is a shockingly large difference to discover so late. Transportation is clearly a critical issue and both leading options give it major weight. But once again, while option one was initially rated as good and option seven rated lower as only average, now option seven has suddenly been moved ahead to first position by a 10% margin. <clears throat> On the natural environment criteria, in the screening assessment, option seven was the only one of seven to be ranked as poor. Now the city claims it has the least core natural area impacts and the least natural habitat fragmentation. The federal government clearly differs strongly on this point. And paragraph two on page 23 also gives a different perspective. With other debatable environmental criteria and sub-criteria in the report, option seven has suddenly been boosted from its original poor rating. But even with that, option one is still emerges as the strongest on environment by a wide margin. More broadly, the overall weight of the assessment criteria for protection of the natural environment did not seem to reflect its global status as a treaty protected wetland and its indispensable surrounding ecosystem. Breaking it down further methodologically, these startling changes from the initial screening results are heavily influenced by the choices, weighting and rank scoring among the criteria and specific factors included. I'll give you just a couple of examples. One, the difference between 15 and 17 farms and businesses on the respective routes is now given the same weight in the aggregate conclusion as minimizing areas with potential flood risk. Two, being adjacent to one more municipally her designated heritage property is given the same weight as a 40% difference 
in the carbon footprint of the respective auctions. <clears throat> Furthermore, even if the 31 chosen criteria did justify equal weightings, the approach of accrued rank uh, scoring among four auctions in, on this many indicators skews the results. As just one illustration on the sub-criterion for farmland lost, a difference of 4.6 hectares or 22% results in a scoring difference of 75%. Wrapping up, I have to say as an evaluator and as a citizen, that especially if your committee accepts option seven, I am relieved to know that our federal government will soon carry out a separate environmental assessment. It will at the very least serve as a cross check on this critical plan. And we clearly need the very best inputs from both levels of government. Since the NCC is already well informed, the process need not be unduly delayed. And this proposal is far too important to be further bogged down in jurisdictional disputes. But the stakes here are local, national, and even global, so that a key federal role is more than justified. Thank you for your attention. Ter ter oh, never mind. We have a question from Councillor Menard. It was uh, still a terrific presentation, even if I have a question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wood. Uh, I did want to say, I, I, I want to ask you, you know, what, what is your overall conclusion from your analysis, your, your uh, preliminary analysis um, that you're seeing? What, what would you suggest to our um, evaluators that, uh, you know, in terms of the process that has been followed um, and, and what kind of conclusions would you come to? Well, I, I'm only talking about the process right now. As I said at the outset, Councillor, I'm still forming my judgments. And frankly, it's been a long day already, but, but a really interesting one, an important one, listening to all the delegations. So I don't have a firm judgment on the, on the, the substantive issues. I do have a real concern that there's, a, there's not a sufficiently balanced and objective handling in the evaluation results. The, the solution to that, as I see it, is frankly, bang the heads together of the federal and municipal planners and evaluators and have them hammer this out. So I, I think it, 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 in that, I'm probably on the same wavelength as Councillor Kidd's proposal. Uh, but you know, at the same time, I would stress <clears throat> that it's been really kind of unbecoming uh, and frankly, often on the city's side, and the city, of course, is a, a, a live uh, political community, whereas the NCC tends to be a little more constrained uh, because they can't speak out quite, in quite the same way. Get, they've got to get together. We, we pay taxes to both these levels of government, and it, it's really intolerable that they, they spend so much time bickering over this. So I think that's, uh, I, you know, I won't, I won't get too dramatic and say, put them in a room and lock the door. But Well, I would agree with you that they do need to come together and have this sorted out. My concern is today, there's a proposal for us to move forward to march ahead with option seven without that work, without that analysis, without that discussion. The supp supplementary motion by Councillor Kitts, I think, is, is uh, helpful in some regard. Uh, but it's not helpful if we go forward with the recommendation on the table of the original recommendation, because that says we're going with option seven. Now get in a room with us and get to an agreement on option seven. That doesn't, well, that doesn't make sense. What we should I, be doing. Sorry. Is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Please go ahead. You're the delegation. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, please. I, I, I'm not the expert on the, on the political dynamics of all this, but it seems to me that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of lobbying around this. And there's been a lot of outspoken advocacy on the part of the city and a lot of, as I say, lobbying even at the federal level. Uh, it is, so I think I, I have the distinct impression that uh, approve your, your plan to approve or your probable approval of this uh, proposal, this option, uh, is uh, a position that will then be taken into the political arena. And if I understand correctly, uh, it is up then to the federal government uh, to take a stand on that. And uh, so I, I, I gather that, that my, my anticipation from what, everything I've seen and heard is that you want this as a clearly uh, supported position by the city uh, with a lot of local support 
and then use that as a basis for political discussion. But I'm not a politician, so uh, I won't go any further on that. Well, you're very appreciated. Thank you for being here. Uh, really nice to hear from you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Councilor Nard. And uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wood. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad you stayed around all day to witness all the different discussions and passion on this one. Uh, and seeing no further questions, uh, have yourself a terrific day and I look forward to getting back to you soon. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking on the board. Oh, no, no stranger to, uh, to Council. Uh, we have MPP Stephen Blay on deck. And Stephen, I believe you submitted some stuff to our committee coordinator, uh, a couple of photos. So I'll let Chris get that up. Yeah, they really only need to come up at a, at a certain point. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of uh, committee and council. I know that uh, most of you know my professional background, but I feel it's important to state that beyond those positions, I'm a lifelong resident of Orleans. Uh, I've lived here uh, for 40 years and over the course of that time seen it grow from what might generously be described as a large village uh, to a bustling community that in many parts of the province would be a city unto itself. And perhaps more importantly for the discussion uh, this afternoon, I live immediately adjacent to Brian Coburn Boulevard. I can easily hit a baseball from my front door to the road. In fact, I might still be able to throw it that far. Our family uses it each and every day. My son's yellow bus uses it to take him to school. My wife's OC transport route uses it to take her uh, to the LRT. I use it to cycle from one end of Orleans uh, to the next. Uh, Brian Coburn Boulevard, uh, originally known as the Blackburn Bypass Extension, has become one of the most important transportation corridors in Orleans for all modes. Every day, thousands of Orleans residents use Brian Coburn to travel to school and work or to, tra or to traverse Orleans to access local amenities, groceries, daycare, and recreation. But as busy and important as Brian Coburn uh, is already today and will be into the future, it is uh, slowly but surely becoming inadequate for the needs of our growing community. And sections of the roadway are amongst the most dangerous and inaccessible for cyclists and pedestrians today. The Brian Coburn Boulevard extension will allow the city's uh, stated goals of intensification, transit priority, and alternative mobility to be realized for Orleans residents. And Chris, maybe if you could pull up the, uh, the first picture of the bypass. Uh, at present, if a resident of South Orleans wants to cycle into the city, they literally have to take their life in their hands uh, to do it. Uh, sorry, this is Navin Road, Chris. There's a, there's a picture of the bypass. We've stopped the clock while we get the other photo up. Yeah, sure, it's no problem. Thanks, Tim. And then Chris, after the, bas after the bypass, I'd ask you to bring up Renault Road. It'll be up momentarily. Great, thank you. Steve Kelly's wondering which uh, specific picture it is of the bypass. Was it the lost ones that you sent? It should just be called bypass. In, in any event, it's okay. Um, Google Street View, uh, the Innis uh, Blackburn Bypass, and uh, Google Street View Renault Road. Uh, you will see that neither road uh, has uh, a paved shoulder, let alone um, a dedicated cycling facility. There are people who cycle on the bypass. I don't understand it. It's particularly dangerous, especially with speeds uh, north of, of 80 kilometers an hour. But you will see between the rumble strip and the, uh, the steel barricade, there is perhaps maybe one foot of paved, uh, paved asphalt. Um, that is not a safe way to cycle, uh, in, my, uh, in my opinion. Uh, the alternative to those two is to use the Prescott Russell Trail, which is not paved uh, generally. Uh, it crosses heavily treed rural roads uh, at odd angles and has led to fatal accidents, which I believe one of the presenters or several uh, has already mentioned uh, today. But in addition to those things, which are potentially solvable, it is significantly outside of the typical and convenient travel corridors for South Orleans 
uh, residents. As an example, for me, it is a minimum of a nine kilometer detour down uh, busy rural roads with rural cross sections, no cycling lanes and deep ditches, just to access the beginning of the Prescott Russell Trail to then uh, head west uh, into the city. So the Brian Coburn extension will make cycling options more realistic and much safer uh, for Orleans uh, residents. The extension will also facilitate faster uh, public transit. Uh, the city has invested millions in building the Chapel Hill South Park and Ride. Uh, and uh, I believe it may have been mentioned earlier today, it sits relatively empty. Uh, why? Because the buses that use that park and ride are stuck in the same gridlock that any commuter uh, would be stuck in if they were sitting in their car. Providing a more direct and segregated transit facility across the Greenbelt will facilitate faster connections to the LRT at Blair and will allow for a future southerly connection when the Innes Walkley Hunt Club connection uh, is eventually built. You'll note that in 2012, the city's planning department provided a memo to city council. I'm gonna quote uh, sections of that memo. Based on the 2005 origin destination survey, which is the most up-to-date and comprehensive travel data for Ottawa, the transit modal split from Orleans to downtown Ottawa is 64%. Orleans represents the highest modal split to downtown of any community in Ottawa. And it is likely that the 64% transit modal split from Orleans to downtown Ottawa is the highest suburban to downtown transit modal split in North America for any city of comparable size. Well, why is that important? Because whether you live in Orleans or not, whether you drive on Highway 174 or not, Ottawa residents have no doubt heard that much of the city's traffic congestion during rush hour is caused by the Highway 174 split. The split backs up the 417 for kilometers in both directions every morning and every afternoon. So despite having the highest modal split in Ottawa, despite having potentially the highest modal split in North America, the main highway corridor still causes congestion across the entire city. Now, there is limited opportunity to improve the north-south transit connectivity between South Orleans and the LRT corridor along the highway in the north. Uh, Mr. Willis has looked at it. I'm sure council colleagues uh, will be able to show you in more detail. There is just very limited capacity to increase transit connectivity uh, through those corridors. Uh, the LRT will service the growth community of Cardinal Creek Village very, very well. And if the city takes the opportunity with the private sector, it will spur immense vertical housing and mixed use opportunities through the highway and LRT corridor, providing complete communities that include market-based and subsidized affordable housing. It is the LRT and that, uh, that development along the LRT is critical to slowing down the absorption of farmland on the edges of Orleans and will allow for the development limit of Orleans to be frozen. But that still leaves the challenge of the hundreds of acres representing tens of thousands of units and new residents that are already within the boundary south of Innes Road. Those neighborhoods will be built over the next two or three decades. And those future neighbors will need ways to travel into the center of the city. For perspective, those new neighborhoods are more dense than the Glebe. They are more dense than many parts of old Ottawa South. They are more dense than many parts, uh, if not most parts of Nepean. One minute. They are, they, are they are vibrant and diverse communities, couples who are just starting out, families that are growing and empty nesters that are looking to downsize. Orleans residents have demonstrated that they will take public transit if it is fast. The dedicated transit lanes on Highway 174 have ensured that it has been fast over the past and the LRT in the northerly quarter will ensure that uh, going forward. But providing that same kind of infrastructure in South Orleans will ensure that the next generation of Orleans residents will be able to replicate that success. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Great, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Vice Chair Leeper has some questions. Thank you very much. And Steve, thanks for the presentation. Um, in, in, I'm wondering still, why is a big part of the answer in the East End to transit use not north-south connectivity on Orleans Boulevard, Jean d'Arc Boulevard, Tent Line, Trim, to use local buses to get people relatively quickly to the LRT stations that are you know, going to open within a couple of years? 
Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a perfectly fair point. But if you look at the geography of the north south corridors and you look at the built form that already exists today, there is not a lot of space to work with. And so you are really quite, unless you are willing to expropriate uh, entire neighborhoods or along 10th line as an example, expropriate some of the largest commercial centers in Orleans, there isn't physical space to, uh, to expand transit capacity through those corridors. Trim road, poten trim road potentially, but that is on the furthest uh, easterly extreme um, uh, of, uh, of Orleans. It would be like, let me put it, Chris, you might have these maps that I just sent, but to put it in some perspective. So to put it in a, in a more center town perspective, it would be like traveling up Bank Street from Walkley Road to Queen Street and only having two east-west connections. Now, this picture is the, this picture is the westerly uh, version of the same point. It's like traveling from the Nepean Sportsplex to the parkway where the LRT will be located with only having two east-west connections. The only two east-west connections for Orleans are Highway 174 and Innes Road. Imagine trying to travel from Walkley Road to Queen Street and only having two easterly connections. By my quick look at it today, in that corridor, you have uh, Walkley Road, of course, you have the 417, you have, Air, you have Heron, you have Alta Vista, you have Riverside, you have Colonel Bay, you have Queen Elizabeth. On, the, in, on this image for Nepean, you have West Sun Club, you have Baseline, you have 417, you have Carling. And that's not factoring in any kind of side streets uh, and other minor roads that might connect into the city. In Orleans, it is literally Innes Road and the highway. If you're generous, you can throw St. Joseph into, into Montreal Road in there. Uh, but I'm not sure that uh, Vanya would appreciate all, all the through traffic, to tell you the truth. And so this connection is vital to allowing for those South Orleans uh, residents who are already, the city has already planned for them. That land is in the boundary. Those houses will be built. Yeah. And so the question is, are you going to give them a reasonable way to get to work in the morning or not? But the, I, I just don't accept necessarily the notion that we have to add significant transit infrastructure in order to get people to LRT. Those, those local buses that serve a neighborhood uh, and then travel on roads like John Dark, Orleans Boulevard that are uh, relatively uncongested heading north-south seem like a good solution to getting people to the LRT that we're spending billions of dollars on. And I don't want to debate it, and it'll be a TMP question uh, for certain, but uh, I just don't want to discount that as a potential to handle a lot of the uh, Orleans to uh, certainly center of Ottawa traffic. I think in the short term, that's absolutely how it's going to happen, right? Uh, I don't disagree with that at all, uh, Councillor. The city needs to be thinking much longer term. Um, this corridor will be needed. You can freeze the Orleans development area. I, I believe that. I, I, I don't believe that there was much addition to it in this last OP. I think it was just playing around the edges. You can freeze it with the, L with the LRT going down the highway. You can freeze it because it will allow for mixed use vertical developments. There's a lot of empty land or underutilized land along the highway corridor. But you still need to, there's still I'm going to be ballparking here, but there's, there's still going to be close to a thousand acres of greenfield south of Innes Road that are that are open for development. That's that's in the that's in the urban boundary today. That's going to be you know twenty thousand, thirty thousand units. And remember, these neighborhoods are you're looking at uh, forty five to fifty, sometimes even close to sixty units per net hectare of development. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Good to see. You. Good to see. You. Great. I'm. Uh... I'm looking at the board, Steve, and oh, there we go, uh, Councillor Kitts. Thanks, thanks for being here today, Steve. A uh, great presentation. You, you touched on this in your presentation, and just again, right now, speaking to uh, Councillor Leeper, um, but having the intimate knowledge of, of planning files that, that you do, and having um, it, that have been approved in South Orleans in recent years and are still making their way through the city, um, you know, you just spoke about freezing development, um, particularly in new additions to the urban boundary, but there's still quite a bit of greenfield land within our current urban boundary um, that's, that's slated for development. So I'm wondering if you could comment on how critical 
this infrastructure is for the healthy growth of our community and what may be the implications if we continue to delay its construction. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it's essential. As I mentioned, Orleans residents have already demonstrated through history their commitment to public transit. By far the highest modal split in the city, no other, no other community uh, comes, anywhere, comes anywhere close. Uh, I don't have a breakdown in front of me, but I, I would suggest that if you talk to OC Transpo, that modal split south of Innes Road for, for rides starting south of Innes Road would be significantly lower. Because if you have to travel down uh, 10th line, which I think there's 15 traffic lights, if you have to travel down Orleans Boulevard or Jean d'Arc, those are a little bit faster, but they wind, they're not straight. Uh, you're, you're, you're taking, uh, I think uh, Councillor Leeper referenced this to his youth, you're taking 25 to 30 minutes just to get to the east-west transit corridor. Um, for a lot of people, it will be faster uh, for them to drive. For others, if it's going to be equal amount of time, they would, prefer, they would prefer the convenience of their car where they can control the climate, where they can listen to whatever they want on the radio, where they don't have to deal with everything you might have to deal with uh, while, using, uh, while using public transit. And then from a, from, a, from a cycling perspective, you know Brian Coburn today. It, even though it is built to a relatively modern standard, because of the way it was phased, the section between Trim Road and Mare Bleu is the north side of the road, and the section from Mare Bleu to Navin is the south side of the road. And therefore, because only half of the road in either direction is built, there isn't actually on-street cycling, cycling facilities for the majority of that stretch. There is a MUP on the newest section between Navin and, and Mare Bleu, but it ends. And I think uh, one of the presenters spoke about that before. And so you really don't have a safe way. I shouldn't say that. I travel it during the summer. I feel relatively safe, but I wouldn't let kids travel that because there is no MUP. Uh, you don't have that extra level of safety for, from a cycling perspective to really uh, traverse Orleans, let alone try to, try to head into the city. And so if we we're going to be honest about trying to achieve uh, different modes of transportation. If we want to give Orleans residents the same opportunities that the city has provided to the residents of uh, Vanier and Westboro and Ottawa South and, and other parts of the city, you, you have to have that uh, safe and dedicated connection across the Greenbelt. And from my perspective, that's not achievable uh, on the, on the, uh, the current uh, bypass corridor. And therefore, this corridor is the next uh, most logical option. Thank you for that uh, that response. Um, lastly, I, I just want to ask, you know, having having represented this community for so many years, being a longtime resident yourself, would you say that the congestion, the idling, the lack of access to rapid transit, the lack of active transportation options that you just spoke about, are are having an effect on the the quality of life of the residents uh, in South Orleans? Yeah, absolutely. The bypass or the, the Brian Coburn was intended to be an alternative to Innes Road. Uh, the commercial shopping, groceries, you know, your big box uh, model, that's all along Innes Road. And as one uh, presenter mentioned earlier today, there isn't any real interconnectivity between those, those developments. So you have a lot of in and out along Innes, which creates, you know, it can take you an hour to go from Trim Road down to the Food Basics, uh, kind of on the other side of, the, of, uh, of Innes on a Saturday morning. And that might, in normal times, take you, you know, ten minutes, five minutes if you hit the if you hit the green lights, uh, green lights properly. Uh, Brian Coburn is an alternative to that, but because it's an alternative and it's a very popular one, it is starting to obviously see uh, heavier and heavy congestion. But also because of the way that the, again, it's it's easier to see if you have an overhead map, but there the the north south connections from Brian Coburn up uh, up north there are huge distances between those north-south roads. And so you don't have a lot of direct connectivity uh, to the north from the Brian Coburn, uh, from the Brian Coburn um, um, uh, Boulevard as it exists, as it, as it exists today. Uh, and that again, as I said, taking the Prescott Russell Trail as an example is a nine kilometer detour. Whereas if I could simply go straight down Brian Coburn and take that into the city, um, I believe that's I believe that's three kilometers from my front door to get to the exact same uh, the exact same point. And so, if you're out biking for exercise, an extra six kilometers, great. You're, you're trying to get exercise. But if you're trying to use it as a transportation corridor to uh, go into Gloucester or travel all the way into the city, an extra nine kilometers east direction is a significant 
uh, additional amount on your bike, right? Not so much maybe in a car, but on your bike, that's a lot of extra, a lot of extra distance to cover each and every day. Great, thanks so much, Steve. Appreciate it. Great, uh, Councillor Luloff. Thanks for joining us today, uh, Steve. Uh, I do really appreciate your expertise on this. Um, can you spend a little bit of time talking about the geography of Orleans, uh, some of the natural features that are exacerbating this east-west connection issue? Um, I've got some other questions, but I figured we might start with that. Yeah, a lot of it is parts of what make Orleans a great place to live. You know, the green belt uh, is a great amenity to have access to. The Maribola is a great amenity to have access to. Um, the uh, the ravine system through Queenswood Heights is an amazing um, uh, amazing feature to have access to, but those all provide natural geographic barriers to transportation connections. You can't cross that uh, that ravine system through through Queenswood. Um, and again, if you have an overhead shot of the neighborhood, all the road connections wrap around it. There, nothing goes through it. Uh, the NCC has obviously limited how many uh, connections across the Greenbelt uh, they would like to see. And so that has uh, basically created funnels um, into two, or if you're generous, maybe three uh, primary transportation quarters. Again, from the south end of the urban area to uh, Highway 174, it's effectively the equivalent distance of going from Walkley Road to Queen Street. Think about that, Walkley Road to Queen Street and having two or perhaps three ways to go east and west. No other part of the city uh, would uh, live patiently or as patiently as Orleans has, has lived with that kind of limited access to get into the city every day. You know, and, and I mean, some people may submit that there's a, that there's a, you know, one other East West connector being um, St. Joseph or Montreal road. Uh, but I mean, through some of the studies that are ongoing now, we're talking about reducing that to one lane. It's not going to be uh, a viable East and West connection. So I take your point very seriously. Um, some some councils are only it's only viable if the good residents of Vanier want to host 10,000 cars a day from Orleans and I'm not sure that council Fleury would 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 campaign on that this fall so um, it's not really a, a viable alternative fair um, some councils have suggested you know just dedicating a lane on Brian Coburn on Innes and on the bypass as a solution uh, to our infrastructure woes um, you know dedicating it to, to, to public transit uh, and public transit only. Um, I'd like to give you a, an opportunity to address that. Yeah, look, I think I think the city is wise to be looking at interim steps because of the challenges and the affordability of, of Brian Coburn. You know, I do agree with uh, Rochelle and others who have said build the ultimate right away. That would certainly be my preference. But if you need to build uh, the four lane cross section and make one of them uh, HOV or, or transit only uh, before uh, the full six lanes is is done, then I think that's uh, a good or potentially good progressive uh, progressive step provided that the the sidewalk and the and the cycling infrastructure is in that first uh, is in that first phase um, in terms of in terms of Innis Road I think your challenge is that you still end up at the bypass right all roads all roads end up at the bypass or the split that's just the real, reality of living in Orleans the benefit of option seven is that it gets around uh, the bulk of the bypass and takes you almost directly to Blair Road, uh, but the other aspects of the proposal have that, that Blair Road transit uh, priority uh, facility. And so really it's a getting around the choke point. And one last question, just before I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Laura, um, what, what does uh, the kind of ultimate solution to our, our transit woes east-west here uh, in the east end of the city uh, look like in your opinion? Well, I think it's a common, so the LRT is, is, was an amazing first step and it was always planned to be a first step. And the reason the highway corridor was chosen as opposed to the Cumberland Transitway corridor was that it, by putting it down, the, well, one, it was cheaper, significantly cheaper, but two, it also allows you to, to rationally consider that freeze of uh, the urban development area. If you were to put LRT through the Cumberland Transitway corridor, you would, you would, it would absolutely facilitate an urban expansion because you wouldn't have enough developable land within a reasonable distance to justify that expense. And so you would, you would almost be forced to continue to absorb farmland to go further, further west and further south. By putting it along the northerly corridor, you can, you can reasonably contemplate freezing the boundary where it is or close to where it is uh, for the foreseeable future because uh, those lands with, uh, with the capacity to go vertical 
along the LRT corridor will give you su sufficient supply, uh, in my view, for the foreseeable future. There will be a change that's needed. It, it, will, take, it will take time for that, uh, that type of change to, to happen, and it will, take, um, it will take a far greater concentration by both the city's planning department and the private sector who owns most of that land, uh, which I know that you're working on, uh, but that can, that can be a realistic goal. And so the future is LRT in the north, uh, bus rapid transit uh, in the south, and a couple good road connections for those who can't, for whom transit is not an option. If you, I think someone described the, the travel to the south end of the city. If you work in that south end employment uh, corridor, you don't have a transit option today, not a, not a realistic one at least, you have to travel all the way into, um, I guess, Herdman uh, before you can really start making your way, uh, making your way south. By extending Brian Coburn further to the west and building the uh, Hunt Club uh, uh, Walkley connection, I agree a direct connection to the highway would be better, but uh, we're stuck with uh, that legacy planning. Um, you, can, you can realistically create a connection to the south. And again, I go back to Orleans residents have shown they will take the bus but the connection has to be there, and right now it's not. I'll see on top when you see. Yeah, thank you. Great, uh, Councillor Dudas. Thank you so much for for being here. Um, you've been involved in this file for ever, and I recall going to, with you to many public consultations um, about this very matter until we've come to here today. Um, I wanted to. We've talked a lot about residential growth. We know that there's a significant amount of growth that's anticipated in Orleans, even prior to the discussions about uh, the boundaries in the, uh, as part of the official plan. But I wanted to actually ask you as well too, because as long as I've ever lived in the, in the East End, there's been a lot of conversation about economic um, opportunities and the lack thereof because of the lack of uh, substantial um, and sufficient transportation networks. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit in terms of your perception of people not only being attracted to the East End um, and whether or not the transportation networks have deterred people or businesses from coming East, but also too, in terms of people who are employees working at locations such as the Boundary Road, Amazon and their ability to access those sites. Yeah, I will have to be quicker than I would like because I do have another uh, meeting to jump into. But I think for a long time, uh, the traffic pattern from Orleans, at least from commercial property owners, has been seen to be unidirectional. That is, everyone leaves Orleans um, and no one comes to Orleans kind of in the opposite uh, 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 morning or afternoon commute directions. That has the potential to change with LRT. There is so many underutilized property along the highway, whether it's parking lots or old form uh, box store developments in those kind of warehouse like grocery stores that could easily be converted into vertical mixed use communities that include both market based and uh, subsidized affordable housing that include uh, you know, what we might consider more office based white collar jobs that include complete communities with grocery stores that are walkable that are obviously right beside transit. There are enormous economic development opportunities along that corridor and it will require a focus from the city of Ottawa with the private sector to get that done. Thank you. I know you have to leave. I won't hold you up. Thank you very much, everyone. It's great oh, to just, see you. Just real quick, Steve, I want to thank you. Uh, we work collectively together. And just one, one thing, obviously, you support uh, Catherine's 100-day campaign motion. Uh, quick yes or no, I, I assume that's a yes. 100%. I worked on the 100-day committee to solve the LRT problems. I remember having lots of conversations with Jeff uh, during that period. And I think if there's direction to lock everyone in the room uh, to get that done, then there is a reasonable uh, solution with the NCC on this uh, as well. And thank you for that. And thanks for your delegation today. Really appreciate it. Enjoy okay, folks. So we're going to move on to questions to staff. So you can go ahead and start putting your hands up. And we'll start with Councillor Fleury. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so I want to come back to one of the delegations that I interacted with and, and um, the, the point that I was making was in relations to the data that was reviewed and is presented to us. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, there, there's a lot of information out there, right? There's vehicular, um, vehicular movement issues, there are transit objectives, and then there are safety improvements, including active transportation. And I'm, I'm trying to understand the various components. So 
are we asked today with uh, with the report in front of us to look at uh, these investments in the spirit of uh, the needs for the Monday Monday to Friday commute peaks? And if not, then can we clarify um, which what lens we should be looking at uh, this investment? Uh, Chair, if I may, um, I'll just, if I can just step back and give a bit of context to why we have this project to begin with. Um, back in the 1980s or um, around that time when the urban expansion south of Innes was taking place, um, it was uh, determined at that time that uh, there needs to be a new transit corridor to serve this new community to the south of Innes, as well as another road facility. That was named, uh, called, labeled at that time, the Cumberland Transit Way and the Blackburn Hamlet Bypass Extension. So it's been there um, since then, and a corridor has been protected for both. And uh, so particularly, um, well, for the whole section and uh, east of uh, Navin, the uh, Brian Coburn, which is the former Blackburn Hamlet Bypass Extension has been built. Uh, the Cumberland Transitway hasn't, but the corridor has been protected for it. So now we're only dealing with this short um, section. It's, it's, I'll call it missing, but it's not really missing because we had looked at it before, but we need um, to revisit the corridor between Navin and Blair. And so your question was about, is this just for um, morning um, commuter traffic or evening? No, it's for connection, uh, connecting the Eastern um, community to the rest of the city and to other facilities in the city. And, um, you know, there was mention of um, COVID, but COVID and pandemics, it's a moment in time. We're looking at a much uh, city planning to 2046. And so this is, it, this is about city building. It's not about reaction to, um, to a temporary situation. Uh, yes, we're gonna have hybrid um, type um, of work arrangements. So some may not need to travel, but it, this is the short term. We're, we have to look longer term. And this community to the south of Innes requires both facilities. And we're not, um, and it's been in the OP, it's been in the TMP since multiple versions of the TMP. It's gonna be revisited again with our update, but I don't think it's going to be removed from uh, the network, if anything, the TMP update will look at how the new policies apply to the projects and how the projects are prioritized. So I just wanted to say that first, and um, and the team is here to answer any other questions that uh, committee has for us. Thank you. Yeah, sir, and I appreciate the additional context, Vivi. I, I'm looking for a bit of a clear answer. So yes, further out in the development and, and transportation needs. Are those transportation needs in reflection of a peak period or there are needed networks uh, for weekends, summers, evenings, whatever it is like, is it a, are these improvements that you're looking that, that are in front of us today with a lens of peak periods? Yes or no? Like I, that's what I'm confused about in all of this. And if it is for peak periods, then I, I have questions relating to, um, uh, relating to transit use and relating to uh, COVID uh, workforce. So, and I, so I'm just looking for clarification uh, from the city on this. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew is our, Andrew Harkness is our consultant. So I'll turn this to him because of the, the modeling work and the assessment for the need of this project. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, in response to the question, the modeling is uh, that the city uh, undertakes and that we've used for this study is based on uh, peak period demand. Um, I think as Vivi stated as well, though, you know, there is a much bigger picture in terms of uh, making connections that, you know, the, the facilities will be used, uh, obviously, at all times of the day and, and they, you know, they cover all modes of travel as well. So, so if, if what is in front of us with the plan growth or um, if with the plan growth in Orleans, if what was, what was in front of us was not built out, what would that look like for, uh, for the various communities that came to present today? 
Sure, I can uh, <clears throat> respond to that through the chair. The, um, I think we've heard th uh, from many delegations today that there, there are already very um, big challenges in terms of travel across the study area. So there's an existing problem that's been in place for quite some time in terms of uh, meeting travel needs uh, within this area. And those are expected to get uh, worse over time <clears throat> as more development continues to take place. And, and your point is in relations to vehicular movement, transit, like, could you maybe articulate that a little? The, um, the, uh, the needs are, uh, are based on people needing to make trips and, and travel, you know, from various origins and uh, destinations within the city. So it does consider, um, uh, you know, an existing situation, vehicular traffic and trips that are made by transit. Uh, so I'd say there's a combination of needs. There's certainly a lack of uh, uh, facilities across the network, or across the study area, rather, <clears throat> for active transportation. So that's one definite gap. There is, uh, you know, there is transit service, there is uh, roadway capacity, um, <clears throat> but the, the current travel needs are not fully being met by the existing infrastructure. And, and there have been um, growth decisions, development decisions, based on these, uh, the anticipated implementation of these two uh, facilities. We invested in the Chapel um, uh, Hill um, Park and Ride lot. And uh, if, if there was much better um, service, transit service in its own dedicated corridors to move people and pick up people at the Park and Ride lot and bring them up to Blair to back to the LRT station for those communities to the south. There's still the communities to the north of Ennis would more likely um, move north-south to get to the uh, 174, the um, stage two LRT. So there it's two facilities, two corridors that are needed to move people along on, on transit. And this project is not just about the road. There's a very significant uh, transit component um, to this combined project that we've undertaken, as well as the active transportation components that would, that, that would be rolled into the projects as they're uh, constructed. Yeah, I, I just wanna be clear. I feel that you're very, like the team's very defensive. I'm, I'm really simply asking questions mm -hmm. uh, to, to understand the clarity of what is the lens we're being sought to vote on in relation to the report we have. And there'd been a, a various numbers of speakers that spoke to different aspects of this. So I'm, I'm trying to understand as a counselor interested in how we invest in transit, how we um, connect newer development and newer pressures. What is the lens that was you know, reviewed in terms of de future demands and needs for, uh, for that area of our city? And I, 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 I'm still unclear about the data that you have relating to volumes that say, for example, uh, takes the Blackburn Hamlet bypass from four lanes to six lanes and in, in much of these options. I can, because this dates back and I think uh, uh, the, the, the MPP uh, did paint a picture of the, uh, an era period that this dates back for a while. How does COVID influence that need versus not? And is there something in the meantime uh, around um, advancing uh, transit lanes for morning peaks in a direction and afternoon peaks in another to kind of see what the volumes look like and if, if there is increased ridership. So I'm, I'm interested to find out a bit more what, is the, what was the assumptions prior to COVID and with the unknowns of the future peak period demands Monday to Friday, how that's influenced the plan. Maybe that's a, a clearer question. Uh, right, what, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Okay, so when we do our, all of our projects, we're not looking out a year. We're looking out to the full build out. And for this project tonight, it was uh, 2031 because that was the time frame for the OP and the TMP when we started out. And now we're looking at 2046. So uh, we're looking out that far. And, and so the, and I think we've answered the question that it is both for the commuting needs as well as the overall connection of this community to the rest of the city for other services. Um, so, the, so the modeling that we did um, didn't, couldn't justify taking away lanes and, uh, and inserting uh, or replacing them with transit because the demand is so great. 
so great that uh, that's why our interim project at the, at the cost of about 25 million, we're proposing that um, we widen segments to help alleviate uh, the construction and also, sorry, the um, congestion and also to um, put a priority for transit uh, in, in this corridor. Are, are those not solved in two really focused area, the Renault Road 90 degree issue and the uh, Blackburn Hamlet uh, four to six lane, that, that bypass? Like, are those not the two um, segments that are, are, are most of impact to, to what you're describing in terms of growth? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand you know, you're presenting a, a full connection, which is in, which is what's in front of us today. And I'm I, I look at kind of the next steps, right? So assuming this passes committee, assuming this goes in front of council, then it goes in front of the National Capital Commission for the FLUTA review. And um, they've already signalized some um, um, where, where they stand basically on option seven. And I, I wonder, uh, if there are chunks of this that are both supported and needed by communities, the city and the NCC that don't limit some of those improvements that are needed uh, while respecting that there are land access limitations by the National Capital Commission uh, currently. Sorry, Councillor, I understand now. Yes, um, so the, the report talks about the ultimate plan uh, but there's certainly things that we can do in short term, near, to, you know, uh, such as this interim plan that we've got for our transit priority. And that happens to uh, be, you know, within the option one, option four uh, that the NCC prefers. And they also, although they have been non-committal, um, that's something that we need to communicate with them um, and have further discussions because that's what we really need to push on is that interim uh, transit priority um, recommendation. So that's, you know, along in us, uh, as, uh, as um, Angela had shown in her presentation and, um, and it, it falls within the envelope of options one and four. So that I don't think we, sh I hope to have better discussions with the NCC on that and be able to get that moving. The larger picture, the ultimate plan of option seven, of course, is the, the big sticky issue that we would have to get through with the NCC on that. But there's time for that, time for that discussion, because um, you know, it, we're asking for the recommendation uh, for you to approve a report based on a study that we've done and we've provided you with the, the best, uh, most efficient solution. Um, but with Councillor Kitts's motion, um, you know, there is an impasse, so we'll go and discuss with the NCC further. And if there are changes uh, after 100 days, there's an outcome that's different from option seven, option one, or option four, it's different, whatever it is, then we will report back. And then that's the one that we will then seek um, council uh, approval on. And that's the one that we will document and we will file for the formal uh, ministry approval. So today it's more yeah, so about- So I, I guess I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I, I, that was the, a good final point for me uh, that, you know, Councillor Kitts's option does bring all the parties together in a more uh, targeted discussion that is needed for this. I, I, when you look at the situation of option seven as a standalone with the city and the Fluta piece, you say, well, why are we going down a road that gives no outcome, right? So uh, it brings a lot of, uh, hope for some residents in some communities in Orleans, but then it just creates frustration because it, it can't advance, right? So I, I will certainly be uh, voting in favor of uh, Councillor Kitts's point. Maybe on, on um, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at my notes quickly here. I'll, I'll come back on Mr. Chair because it's been a, a good afternoon and I, I, I'm satisfied with the answers so far, but I might have one or two more questions, so I might come back on. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, members of committee, feel free if you have your questions and you want to do wrap up, you can pitch them all together. It's been a long day for a lot of people and we still have a whole other item to go. So uh, we'll go on to uh, Councillor Dudas. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I know it's been a long day, so I won't belabor the point, but uh, Vivi, you had actually answered one of my questions is, you know, where do we go from here? If not only this is approved today in terms of 
uh, staff's report, but also Councillor Kitts's motion, and you, you quite you know, eloquently put it, that it, it opens the door for additional conversation, but also you know, a strong stance from the city in terms of where we would like to see this end up, which is a sustainable transportation network for the future. I did have, I would like to ask a little bit more about what this, you know, pursuing option seven, what this would mean for the future of Renault Road and Anderson Road. This has been a, a bit of a sticking point for the NCC in the past. The Renault Road S-curve directly touches and infiltrates the Ramsar boundary. Anderson Road is a very busy road, about 70% of traffic flowing southbound from the east end it takes Anderson, it's a two lane. Uh, the city, when it went and paved it, wasn't able to pave the shoulders to allow for cycling because of the ecological impacts on the environment. So I wanted you to just clarify what the city would be willing to do in terms of discussing with the NCC about the future of those two roads. Uh, yes, so um, clearly uh, if we have an option, well, seven, option seven has that, um, we would uh, straighten that Renault Road and there would be sections so that it would be no longer required. Uh, so that would be, um, would be something that we discussed with the NCC about. The option seven, I can speak to option seven, not what when we come out of the 100 days. Um, option seven will alleviate the uh, current heavy traffic on Anderson Road. So Anderson may become just an access road to some of the uh, NCC um, uh, facilities that they have. Um, but you know, who would want to go down Anderson Road when there's a uh, better, um, more direct, more, you know, more high, better capacity facility to use if uh, option seven were uh, constructed along with the Innis, um, the Innis to Walkley connection. So that would take you to the, the, the Queensway, the 417. I also wanted to ask too, so the NCC has said that their preferred option would be one or four, but have they committed to even moving forward on that? What was their uh, assessment of those options at this point and their willingness to proceed with those? Mm -hmm. So options one and four are closer to uh, what had been shown as um, in the TMP, in their Greenbelt Master Plan as well, and based on the previous EA. So that's the one that they would, uh, those two corridors, um, sort of those two options are what would become the starting point for discussions because they're not completely satisfied with uh, what we have developed either, um, because there's just that, there's a J that connects to um, the highway. So they would like to have um, us review that, the need for that connection um, more so. So it, it's a starting point for discussion. So even at that, it sounds like there's a there's a, lots of conversation that needs to be held regardless of where we start from. Um, I wanted to also ask too about that future. So a, a lot of the benefit for the communities that I serve and those in the East End is not just the discussion today that we're having, but this would provide that future conversation about a connection to the South End, which is something that right now people are taking, that's why they're taking Anderson Road. They're taking it to get to the RCMP headquarters on Leakin. They're taking it to get to Amazon and Boundary Road. They're taking it to get to the airport. I mean, that's how I get to the airport. I take the back roads and I go through the dark. And I, you know, once again, that's the only way to get there if you want to get back, get there quickly and make your flight. So I'm just wondering in terms of the, conversation about next steps and the options one through four and the uh, option seven. How does this today, if we were to approve your report and your the technical assessment, the environmental assessment and move forward, how does this enable you to have those fulsome conversations with the NCC, not just about what we're proposing today, but setting the tone for the future, for that future connection, connecting the east end to the south end? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, it would provide that connection in order to make, um, that's the first, the east leg, and then we have the southern leg, which is the um, Innes Walkley Hunt Club connection, but we may not have to go all the way, way down to Hunt Club. And that project is, has already been studied. It is already in their Greenbelt Master Plan. And so it's, it's there already. We're just now trying to make that connection over to Navin Road. 
somehow. And option seven is, uh, is the recommended plan. So one of the written submissions that I saw came from the Gloucester Historical or Horticultural Society. And it had an old, I remember seeing it in one of the public consultations. Um, it had an old assessment kind of weighting criteria of different options. We've seen lots of information in the media and different community groups coming out and sharing all these charts and things. Can you clarify for me and just, just for committee members and those watching, how, who was it that was assessing the current technical assessment, the environmental assessment? What was their expertise? How can we um, be assured that what they were coming forward with and what they're proposing, what you're proposing is balanced and an object objective based on expertise and professionalism and not just you know, a whim? We retain Morrison Hirschfield as our consultant on this study. And um, I have uh, Andrew and Kelly Roberts here uh, today, but behind them is a very large team of um, technical experts who are, um, who are specialists in areas like environmental um, uh, impacts, uh, the natural environment, the uh, transportation planning side of things. But I will turn it over to Andrew, uh, Andrew Hartness, perhaps he can elaborate on his team. Sure, thank you. Um, we have, both Kelly and I have uh, been working in the field of environmental assessment specifically for the city of Ottawa for uh, about 30 years plus. So, you know, we both have extensive experience in this type of work. Our, our team, as Vivi said, has extensive uh, experience. We probably had 30 some disciplines involved in the study across a whole range of the areas that were needed to take on this very complex uh, project. Um, you know, you've seen the evaluation, it was a progressive process. The, the, the most recent uh, work is included as an attachment to the committee report. Uh, so there's a lot of detail there. Um, and certainly it's, we built, uh, I believe it's been very transparent in terms of a process. If there's any questions regarding any of that work, we're more than happy to answer them. Thank you. And, and you know, Chair, if your indulgence, I will be very quick. Um, I mean, most of my committee members in the community should know where I stand. I firmly support option seven. I have been engaged in these conversations long before I was elected as a community member. My, you know, once again, I cannot state it enough. And I think it's been clear through all these delegations. None of the options on the table right now go through the bog. They don't go, they don't go through the Ramsar section. They don't go through the bog. They do go through disused agricultural land that is part of the green belt. And I'm not going to deny that that's 100% the case. The fact though is, is what we're looking at is building a sustainable future transportation network for the East End. Something that the East End has lacked since it was built. We have seen that that has inhibited our ability to have an economic prosperity, much like we've seen in the South and West End of our city. We've seen that we're building in leaps and bounds. 41% of our growth is going to come before 2046 in this, in this area for residential development. And whether they're taking cars or transit or cycling, once again, we need we need the transportation networks in order for those individuals to live here and have the quality of life that we all deserve in the city of Ottawa. Connecting to the south end of the city, the jobs that are there, the airport, the economic benefits, that is a huge benefit to the, to the future prosperity of the East End. And right now we don't have that. It's absolutely not the case. And you know, I'm not gonna break this NCC. You know, I've been oh, very familiar with the fact that they have not been willing to come to the table on this. But once again, this is their land. This is privately owned land. So there needs to be a fulsome discussion. I'm so pleased that Councillor Kitts is bringing forth this motion about what will be a, a, an option for the East End so that we can move through our communities, whether it is by transit or cycling or by car. And so once again, I, I'm really imploring upon my committee colleagues to see the big picture on this, to understand that this is something that is not just, you know, been talked about since 2018. This has been decades in the making because it never was built in the first place. And if we could go back in time, we would have changed how we would have developed the East End, but we can't do that. So we need to build the infrastructure to accommodate not just the future growth, but our current residents. And I do ask you to, once again, to support staff's recommendation. It is founded in 
in principle, it's founded in expertise, and we can move forward with that fulsome discussion with the NCC about how to actually accommodate growth with the current population of the East End. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Menard. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks for the conversation uh, today. Uh, I'm wondering if um, the origin destination study has been completed for the new TMP. Sorry, the, uh, the, the uh, survey? Yes, the, the or uh, origin destination survey and study, yes. Yes, okay, the survey, um, we hope to, well, the plan is to start this fall and then uh, that would update all the data and then uh, we would use that to calibrate our model uh, for the TMP update. Okay, and, and would that help inform some of the origin destination um, for the East End for these potential future options, these roads in the future? Uh, yes, it would uh, likely confirm um, and maybe show more pressure, but uh, yes, that's the, that's the data set that we would be uh, using to um, that lens. We would use that for all of our planning work. Okay, because, I mean, it's pri my primary concern right now is is we're looking to make the decision at this time um, when we've said we don't have the funds for the full build out of the project for the interim measures. I think there's funds that could come, but not for the full build out. Uh, we don't have the NCC approval and uh, we don't have the, the final uh, origin destination uh, survey. So I, I guess the question is, is, you know, definitely negotiate, get in there for the next hundred days, let's do that. But, but why do we want to make a decision right now without those other fundamental pieces uh, at our fingertips? I would say, Councillor, that uh, we're catching up uh, rather than um, planning ahead because the growth has already happened. Uh, decisions on growth and development in the East have already taken place and there's more to come. Uh, based on um, decisions back in 1980s, uh, when the expansion area was being considered, that um, it was known at that time that a, a transitway facility was needed, its own dedicated corridor, as well as a new arterial road for the southern part of Innes. So it's there. Um, I, I'd say that two thirds of it has already been, I, um, constructed or identified or protected for a corridor, particularly the Brian Coburn uh, roadway facility. And now it's just this little segment between Blair and Navin that's, um, that we, we took a second look at to see if there was a better corridor, one that would also address uh, safety um, uh, for Renault Road and, um, and also for the, um, the cyclists along that segment and connecting active transportation with other links in the area. And has the NCC ever indicated that they would be willing to approve uh, this route, the option seven route? They've been very clear that options five and seven, uh, that we would not get the land for it, but they are very willing to sit down to discuss with us uh, a solution for uh, the um, connectivity of um, our Eastern community. So, okay. they, so that's why options one and four are there, but they still would uh, say that that's uh, an avenue that's open for, uh, for discussion. Yeah, and I agree with you. The connectivity of the East Transit Service, given the planning that's gone on, is essential. Um, we have expanded communities that have made them car-centric without the you know, necessary transit connections to other areas of the city. Um, in the planning sphere. And, and that's the concern for me, as I've been stating throughout today. Um, did the city previously agree with the NCC that, you know, in 2013, uh, that option one was the preferred option? Was there previous agreements um, there? That was part of the original 1999 EA uh, for the Cumberland Transway and Blackburn Hamlet Bypass Extension. Okay, and, and in the interim, what, what changed, uh, I believe 2013, 2016, the re reaffirmation of that option one as the best option. So what, what changed in the interim? Uh, I, I believe that um, Angela had that in her presentation, it's in the report. There was um, 
uh, the detailed design was beginning for this section west of uh, Navin Road for the Ryan Coburn and the expenses uh, um, for geotechnical conditions, the corridor that we had that would tuck up against Navin Road uh, became a very, we were told it's very expensive, much more than what was in the budget. Uh, perhaps we had underfunded um, the project at the time, but uh, it required us to look, is there another uh, option that we can examine? That's what started the study. And because the road and the transit way are so linked in this area, both had to be revisited for this section. Okay, and I wonder if you can comment on the um, significant shifts that the delegation pointed out, uh, maybe it was Mr. Wood, uh, pointed out with regard to the evaluation criteria. Uh, I believe it's because as we progress, we do more and more refinements in our evaluation, but I'll turn this over to, to Andrew um, or Kelly to, to elaborate on that. Perhaps I'll lead off. Uh, through the chair, the uh, that uh, that what was uh, shown by Mr. Ray, I believe it was, was uh, an early stage of assessment. That was a, a screening that was done of our at the time was a, a list of seven transway plus roadway uh, corridor options. So the purpose of that exercise was to get down to a, a shorter list of reasonable alternatives for more detailed assessment, and that's part of what we typically do in in environmental assessment studies. So it was by no means meant to be definitive in terms of. Uh, making a recommendation. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we ruled out options such as running a transway down uh, Navin Road, a great separated tra uh, transway down Navin Road. So we really were trying to get to four reasonable alternatives for much more <clears throat> detailed assessment. And, uh, you know, the work was quite high level qualitative and certainly it didn't rely on uh, the measurements that you see in the report, the more detailed takeoffs and more detailed studies. So, <clears throat> so we then proceeded into much more detailed work that you've seen in the report today that uh, you know, I, I hopefully uh, explains, you know, the, the relative pros and cons of each of the options under each of the factors. But um, so it was part of the process and more detailed work was done at a, at a later stage of the study. Okay. And would you agree with his assertion that it's necessary to get into the room and have federal analysis, federal um, uh, design specifications and review of that criteria? Um, kind of as a check and balance? Well, perhaps <clears throat> Angela or Vivi would like to answer that. I, I certainly can, but it's really about the yeah. process. Yeah, yeah and, and it was done. Um, the NCC was definitely um, partners with us. Uh, we wanted them to be partners with us to make sure that we had the right criteria to establish that first. And then we also worked with them on establishing the evaluation methodology. So they were there um, and we used their mappings of the, um, the uh, green belt area, all, all of that. And uh, we worked it through, we sat down with them to examine the, um, the results. Um, There's some, some differences of opinion in some things, but uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, we base our recommendation on facts and uh, we would still be very happy to sit down uh, with them to review this again, or to actually maybe set that aside and go move forward and what, um, and we only have a hundred days um, instead of rehashing the, the discussions just to move forward to find a solution that would be the best way to, uh, to do, deal with this. Um, and and they're, I've heard that they're willing to, uh, to work on a solution with us as well. Okay, um, and on option seven, they're willing to work on a solution with you? No, not option seven, because they made it very clear. Okay. Five or seven. Okay, are, are fair not, enough. Uh, Thank you for that. I, I, the report reads that um, um, Indigenous peoples were also contacted. Um, aside from the Mohawk Council, the report uh, doesn't go into who was invited to comment or if there was uh, responses. It, were there other contacts made and any responses received? Um, Angela? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so in terms of the Indigenous groups, there were five. There was the Kitigan Zibi Anishinaabeg, the Algonquins of Ontario, Algonquins of Pikwak Nagan, uh, and the Mohawk Council. We didn't hear back from four of them. We just heard back from one of them. And it's actually fairly typical that they don't respond unless they have a concern or they want to 
they want to um, hear more information, but they have been involved from the very beginning. We send them notices whenever there's any um, events or consultations and including this transportation committee meeting, they were, they were invited to attend here as well. Okay. And we will continue our, our um, co collaboration with them during the finalizing of the report. Okay, thank you for that extra information. Um, the interim measures uh, include widening Innis uh, to be a four-lane road. I, I suspect it, it is some of the intent of the interim measures to induce a, a modal shift. Yes, count. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we are doing localized widening because uh, the intent is to encourage and promote more sustainable modes. So the two kilometers of widening along Innis is the most congested. Um, so we're widening that for transit and, and carpooling, um, as well as the localized queue jump lanes at Navin and the Blackburn Hamlet bypass. And again, it's to avoid the congestion in that area. So we are also including um, multi-use pathways and a pathway from Kalaru to Navin Road to provide connectivity between the communities. So we're, we're addressing all modes, not just, um, not just transit, but also pedestrians and cyclists. I'm glad to see the uh, transit um, uh, priority, uh, but the expansion of the roadway offering more space to cars or just HOV, whether it's single occupancy or, or shared occupancy. Um, usually more space for private vehicles would induce more traffic, more car traffic, not more transit, would it not? I, I don't understand how that's gonna facilitate the shift we're looking for um, if we're expanding um, private vehicle lanes, um, which induces more traffic of that okay. sort. And Sean, uh, just so you know, uh, after the answers there, you may have to put yourself back on the board again. Uh, we've got to the five minute mark and I just want to keep moving through people. Thank you. No, no problem. So Mr. Chair, the um, as you've heard from many of the delegates and our, our um, traffic analysis has confirmed that there is congestion today. So um, by, by widening the um, by widening for um, transit only and and high occupancy vehicle lanes, it does provide that relief um, and a priority for transit and carpoolers. So we want to encourage more sustainable modes of transportation, um, and that at least helps uh, helps us get through the sort of immediate um, travel demand before we before we actually. Uh, implement the ultimate plan. Okay. I'll get back on the list, but it, it, the widening is Sounds for good. Uh, a private, a private up, lane. Vice chair, uh, vice chair. Just to, sorry, just to finish, good chair. The, the widening is for, just to be clear, is for a private car lane and there's a transit lane. Is that not true? The widening is for only high occupancy vehicle and transit only. Okay, yep. yeah, thank you. Okay. Great. Vice Chair Lee. Thank you very much. And I, I'll pick up uh, where, where Council Menard was leaving off with respect to uh, induced demand. I guess the question I would have is uh, in order, you know, we're providing some significantly better road infrastructure for private vehicles, for single occupancy vehicles, um, by uh, getting Rental Road nicely sorted out, um, straightened out. How long? until the congestion is just as bad as it is today. You know, these road widenings seem to always lead to the need to do more road widenings. What is the anticipated um, relief on congestion and for how long? So that's, oh, go oh. ahead, Vivi. So based on the forecast future, uh, we're saying that the, uh, it's the four lanes and the two lanes of transit. And it's unlikely that we will take this to uh, six lanes for option seven at any time at all. And because um, that's, that's the, it's the forecast and we hope to um, future growth, all of that would then shift over to the transit 
so that the transit, because there's always lots of capacity on, on tr for transit if you build the uh, uh, dedicated lanes. So that would absorb more and more uh, demand as a city, even beyond 2046 as it grows. So that's, um, that's our, our plan is just the four lanes of roads for the, um, uh, Blackburn, uh, for the Brian Coburn and the two lanes for the Cumberland Transit Lane. But I just wonder for, you know, in terms of uh, congestion, uh, which is currently being experienced by people, uh, for example, on Innes, and they're, they're experiencing it, uh, trying to get down Reno, um, the widening is expected to accomplish some relief in that, correct? For, for transit and for HOV. For so anybody who's trying to, tr if we accomplish the ultimate plan here, if we, anyone who is traveling by a single occupancy vehicle is not going to experience any relief at all then? They would stay in the regular general purpose lanes, yes. Okay, so there would be, no, uh, and there would be no relief then. In order to experience any sort of improvement in travel time, they need to get onto transit or carpool. Yes. Okay. Um, there's a lot of new asphalt that's been proposed. Uh, compared to option one, compared to the 2013 plan uh, in the TMP. Have we looked at the additional operational costs when we consider the costs long-term? So it's been determined that, you know, option one is a more expensive solution to implement by a significant amount, um, but it also seems to take advantage of more existing infrastructure as opposed to having to create new infrastructure. Uh, have we looked at the operational cost of that new infrastructure over the long term to determine uh, the cost advantage of option one versus option seven? Well, the project is not using existing infrastructure. Uh, options one and four may be widening of existing infrastructures, but you still get the same amount of the lane capacities that this project uh, is trying to um, um, define. And um, so going with options one and four, it is a little longer. They, they, th those two options are longer, whereas option seven is more direct. Um, Angela or Andrew, do you have anything more to add to that? Yeah, I can add to that. Um, so options one and four, um, Although it looks like it's actually hugging Navin Road, it actually is down the escarpment. So it's not a widening of Navin Road. It's actually quite a bit further. So you're you're in new you're in a new road corridor between um, between uh, uh, Brian Coburn and Blackburn Hamlet Bypass. And then once you get to the intersection at the bypass and Innes Road, you're actually doing that new corridor. Um, and this is for, again, both options one and four. You're going through that new corridor, again, down through the green belt to connect to the Innes Walkley Hunt Club. So there's actually new road infrastructure for options one and four than there is for option seven. So option seven oh. puts in less new asphalt. Okay, that's interesting. Um, with respect to um, moral share, if, if compared to status quo for, um, if we didn't put in new high occupancy vehicle lanes, uh, if this was entirely a BRT project, what is the difference in modal share over say 25 years that we can expect between going with a uh, option seven versus doing entirely just a BRT project? Andrew, would you have that information on the modal share? I know that was part of the modeling and it would be based on the transportation master plan. Well, through the chair, we haven't uh, looked at the scenario of only doing the transway. And um, so the, the project has looked at both the roadway and transway components together. So <clears throat> that is something we could uh, potentially take away if requested and, and uh, look into. I, I think I'd be interested in seeing that, although I think there will be opportunity to chat more about it to Councilman Menard's point and the point of 
of many. The NCC has already said no to this, and I'm not entirely sure why we're being asked to vote on it today. Uh, we haven't done our transportation master plan yet. Um, it's It seems premature to be trying to pick a relatively in-depth choice in option seven before we have permission from the NCC. Um, and so I'm not entirely sure why we're being asked to vote on something that is obviously raising significant ecological concerns from the perspective of a significantly uh, improved or a significantly intensified road corridor in relatively close proximity to the bog affecting the ecosystem nearby. Um, that is, uh, you know, can induce a lot of demand as per Councillor Menard's point, uh, when the NCC has said no. I'll be fully supporting Councillor Kitts's motion to strike a working group to go back to the table and talk to the NCC to try to find a way around the impasse. But I, I, can't, um, I can't support building new road infrastructure when there's so little agreement and there's so, uh, so much concern about it from particularly the, uh, the, environmental, um, uh, the environmental groups. So uh, with that, I'll leave it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Councillor Fleury. Councillor uh, Chair, I'm I, Councillor Luloff uh, was before me, and I'm, it's my second time around. Oh, apologies, I, I missed that there. Councillor Luloff, then Councillor Fleury, then Councillor Menard, and then Councillor Kitts. Thanks, Councillor Fleury and Chair. Look, we often support items brought forward by our city councillor colleagues for their neighborhoods that don't fit our worldview because we trust that they know their area better than we do, and they're representing their constituents in good faith. Today, you heard from four councillors, four community associations one environmental group, one MPP, and make no mistake, our two MPs support option seven as well and always have. Our staff support this and have bent over backward to come, out with, uh, come up with innovative ways to get a stubborn NCC board that I'm dubious if they could even point to South Orleans on an unlabeled map of Ottawa in a space to hear um, what we need for our residents. A lot changes in 25 years. Orleans has grown immensely in this time. My residents have talked about the need for a Southern connection or a ring road for decades. Option seven is a step in the right direction and it's what our residents need. We don't have the benefit of mass employment in our wards. You can't walk to work here unless you work retail or in the local service industry. Um, most can't bike to work here. You can bus to work right now if you don't mind sitting on a milk run for hours or waiting two or more years for the LRT and related bus changes. But even then, we don't have the infrastructure to ourselves to quickly connect to it. It might be, it must be really nice to live in an area of the city where you can walk or bike to work. But this is the suburbs. It's not an option here. I'm working on it with the corridor study uh, to bring more employ uh, employment and denser housing around transit. And I appreciate everyone's support for it, but we're years away from it coming to fruition. None of my residents care about our ideology or whether or whatever you know political dogma to which we may subscribe. They care about getting to work on time. They care about getting their kids before they're charged $5 a minute for being late. Uh, they care about being able uh, to move about our community. They care about safety on our roads. And they care about um, how they watch their forever rising property taxes spent on infrastructure improvements in the downtown core time and time again. Option seven has the potential to get thousands of people onto public transit. There will always be people who need the flexibility of a personal vehicle. And there's nothing that we can do to change that. But this is a massive step in the right direction. Give people the option to make the shift to transit because right now that option's not viable. Just listen to them, please. Show them that you care about what people think east of the Greenbelt. Thanks. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just looking uh, at the board here. Uh, uh, Councillor Kitts, did you speak already or not? No, I haven't yet. Okay, you're up. Go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been a long day. I don't have additional questions to staff that I haven't already asked many times, but I do um, want to take a moment to, to wrap up and build off my colleagues' comments um, and really focus 
on the community of South Orleans. Um, this issue has been longstanding in our community for decades. And, you know, it's, it's imperative to remember that what we're talking about today isn't just a road for cars. It's a bus rapid transit network that we desperately need. It is safe cycling solution that is absent, which deters people in the East End from continuing or commuting, sorry, by bicycle um, and jeopardizes the safety of those few who, who choose to. And we can and should have the conversation about how we got to this situation and, and learn from those mistakes. But what I'm focused on today is a solution that we needed yesterday. We cannot continue to delay this critical infrastructure if we want to keep developing in this area. And I will speak to that further when we get to my motion. But you know, the functionality, the environmental impact are critically important considerations, but we also can't discount that there's a difference of $174 million between option one and option seven. That's not insignificant for options that scored similarly. And my fear, is that securing this additional investment would mean years more delay for a transit solution that we need now. And you know, no matter which way you slice it, there's an unfortunate reality here that new infrastructure will come with environmental impact. If we look at the scoring, one and seven are similar, but you heard loudly from the local community, option seven is the local community's preferred option. And I don't think that that should be discounted. The, they are the ones that are living through these challenges. And one of the delegations spoke to, option seven is the only option that addresses the vehicular traffic on Renault Road. That's a high volume of vehicular traffic that will continue with option one and will continue to impose itself on a residential community, will continue to pass through school zones and put vulnerable road users in danger. And you know, some of these ideas and suggestions that were floated today are, are great in theory, but are simply not feasible if you live in and intimately know the design of this community. MPP Blay touched on that uh, in detail in his delegation. And, and I do also wanna reject the characterization that those who are in support of option seven are unconcerned with the environment or with climate change. These are communities and residents that want a transit solution. They want a cycling option. There are negative environmental impacts that come with all options, but there seems to be a lot of hyperbole around option seven. It does not cross the Mare Blair Bog. It would remove cars from a no road, which does not cross or which does cross the Ramsar border. It has less habitat fragmentation than option one, less impact on core natural areas, meaning it would result in the loss of fewer trees and, and the destruction of habitats north of the Blackburn Bypass. It, the the Maribor Bog is a citywide, province-wide national gem, as one of the delegates pointed out, but I don't think it could be closer to the heart for those that live in this area, that, that cherish it, that use it daily. I grew up walking on that boardwalk. The, the residents of the East End, the friends of the Mare Blair, a decades old nonprofit whose mandate is to help mitigate any environmental impact on the Mare Blair Bog and its surrounding communities would not stand for it being destroyed as some are suggesting. And you know, I'm a lifelong resident of Orleans. My parents bought a home in one of the first subdivisions in Orleans, they still live there today. What, perhaps can't be comprehended unless you've lived here for decades is how explosive the growth has been in South Orleans in the last 15 years. And, and what's not captured in the scoring is the thousands of idling vehicles that are trapped in our community every day, the hundreds of hectares of developable land that will be developed in a car-centric way if we can't find a feasible solution. And at what point do those environmental impacts tip the balance? Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you, uh, Councillor Kitts. Councillor Flurry, then Menard. Thank you, Chair, and I, I have uh, one point and, and two questions. Um, so so my, my first question, maybe to, back to Vivi and the team. There are a number of completed EA. I know and remember that this committee did approve the uh, transit, bus rapid transit on uh, baseline and most recently uh, the one on Montreal Road. And 
I wonder, it, like, how does priority happen in those? Because we're a lot of residents and community associations that are showing up today think that this vote, like, seems to change everything the next day. I think by your responses and by the report in the 100 days, there's a number of, of, of elements that will go well beyond this term, well beyond the next term. If, uh, if this uh, carries forward. So can, is there an, a hierarchy of EAs and priorities and funding? And if so, could you uh, clarify it for a committee? Um, yes, Chair. The um, TMP would be the best um, place to uh, look at the network and prioritizing of projects. This is an EA looking at one project within the network that was approved in the 2013 TMP. And so we're just bringing forward um, the results of the study that council asked us to undertake, providing you with the best um, recommendation, best corridor that's most efficient and most effective. So the, uh, in our report, we also stress that there's no money um, for the, uh, the project, both the transit corridor and the, the road. Um, so that'll have to be reviewed um, with the affordability lens in the TMP update. Uh, but um, that's why we went and looked at the, in, um, the interim solution for something that could move this project along, uh, focusing on the values and the policies of the OP and the TMP update focusing on sustainability. And that's why the interim solution talks about transit priority measures and uh, the multi-use pathways and some of the connections and improvements there. So it really, to move forward on this project, even with the interim solution, would require funding from, um, as part of our annual budget discussions and priorities. Okay. And, and then we have a motion in front of us um, in relation to the 100-day uh, solution, which I am, um, interested in and will be uh, supporting, but I, I'm interested to hear from you. Is there a time sensitive uh, consideration for today's report on option seven? Uh, it, it, it sets the tone. It sets the, that um, committee and council are serious about finding a solution for this project. Um, we would hold off on filing the, uh, the documents uh, perhaps we can go ahead and file for the interim because you'll see that our recommendation is a split uh, with the interim approved the interim solution. Maybe we can go ahead and continue with that because that is really, uh, I, I would say that that shouldn't cause a lot of concern for the NCC, although we do need a little strips of land from them. Um, and, uh, and then it does set a message that um, you know, the, the study is done. Uh, from and, and now we will be working on a different compromise. So we could hold off on filing the ultimate plan based on uh, this 100-day discussion. Repeat that last point. We could hold off on? On filing the ultimate plan until after the 100-day discussion, the outcome of that. And possibly there, I don't know what the outcome will be, but we will have 100 days takes us to well, I'm seeing a report uh, to the Transportation Committee and Council in June. Right. So, so uh, maybe uh, to the chair and, and clerk on this. So I wonder from a procedural point of view, if we could vote on um, Councillor Kitts's motion initially uh, and then split the vote on option seven, because I'm fine with the interim condition, but I feel very uncomfortable with... Um, with taking too strong of a stand before we show up at the NCC table. I think the position of staff on option seven is public. It's all we've been discussing pretty much all day. So to me, it's not about, um, it's not about delaying that vote. It's about showing up at a hundred, uh, the hundred day table uh, with an open mind, but with our preferred, um, with our, with the city's preferred uh, option. So, I wonder, uh, clerk and, and chair, if if you would consider a a, uh, a looking at uh, Councillor Kitts's vote as the next item, and then if we do a uh, if you if you do want to vote on the uh, report, that we split the vote on the various items. So, Councillor Fleury, just to save time, uh, we have some a direction from Councillor uh, Dudas 
which I know will be supported. Uh, Councillor Kitts, I got, I got a terrific vibe that that will carry. I think there'll be a, a tremendous amount of support. I'll look to the clerk uh, while Councillor Menard speaks. I also have a wrap up as well to get back to us with that advice uh, after we've both spoken, if that specific item can be broken apart. But I also do wanna go to staff to comment on if it can actually be done as well. Is that satisfactory? Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Menard. Thanks, Chair, and I'm, I'm hoping that um, Councillor Fleury's suggestion can happen as well. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a good compromise. It gets you in a room, it gets you more support from Council heading into that discussion with NCC. <clears throat> um, on that point, the, uh, the report in front of us now, so the main motion, um, is, there a, is there a costed figure for that? I mean, we're going, we, we say we'd be going ahead with these items on option seven without having confirmation from the NCC what is the cost to the city um, moving ahead with those actions um, without knowing if we're going to get an actual deal on that or not? Well, well I, I don't know what the outcome of the 100 days will be, but to be, um, to, to move ahead with this, well, it's basically the work is done. So it's just a matter of um, documentation and filing. That's all there is uh, with this. Um, and uh, one of the things that we may be discussing with the NCC is how do we mitigate option seven to their satisfaction? We proposed some land swaps, they rejected it, but is there anything else that can be done? I know that there are other negotiations when we were dealing with LeBreton Flats, uh, a few decades ago where there was a land swap and, and uh, that um, the region at the time undertook construction work so for the aqueduct and compensation for, uh, for as part of the land swap. So is there anything else that we can do here? So we haven't had that discussion yet. So they did, they were clear, you know, they were strong that they weren't supporting option seven, but what can we do? What can we negotiate on to make option seven more palatable? Um, so that's something that we would bring to the table and what other options are there uh, to do this that's in the interest of at least the city as well as the NCC. Now the cost is a very big uh, concern and uh, costing is um, a factor that the Environmental Assessment uh, Act allows us to use as a criterion for, for decision because um, governments don't have deep pockets. So. So the, the, the recommendation before you just helps us uh, wrap up this project and we'll have it on hold. Um, and if you approve it, then it's there. And then if something else um, occurs um, differently in a hundred days and we'll report on that as well. Okay, yeah, because I'm just seeing the, like the consultation on the 30 day public review on the EA mm -hmm. and uh, the finalization of the- Yeah, we would hold off design. on that. Okay, so you would hold off. Okay, that, that's helpful to know. I, that's what I just think, given everything we've heard today, I think, you know, we should pass Councillor Kitts's motion and proceed that way, um, have that discussion. Um, and I think it's just, it's frustrating because the communities that have been constructed here have been constructed without proper support. And I, I know my councillors in the East End and others talk about this on a regular basis. We get it in the core too sometimes where you just don't have uh you have maybe large buildings going up without that direct uh transit access or rapid transit access and go, going decades later to do it is difficult planning it's 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 not great stewardship of our planning or or our environment and we do need to solve the problem for residents of south orleans um who deserve better than than what they currently have and you know to my counselor colleagues um i think it's important to know we you know we do support you. We do support uh, residents there. And in fact, financially as well, the core of the city subsidizes the vast majority of suburban areas uh, much greater to, to a much greater extent than vice versa. And it's just important that in those decisions, we're, we're coming to a conclusion that has partnerships at the table and trying to get it right. Um, you know, and so I see the proposal where 73% of people that commented on it say they're concerned about option seven. It's not a slam dunk. Um, and so we're, you know, we're in the midst of a climate emergency, environmental emergency. We're talking about paving more roads through a sensitive environmental area. 
um, that serves as an important carbon sink in the city and significant mitigation strategies that we don't know will do the job and protect that area. And the report we have in front of us doesn't sufficiently address those many concerns that have been brought up by residents, the NCC and other environmental organizations. And we're doing the work, putting all these reports out, trying to persuade council to support the plan, even though we don't have the necessary land. And we've been repeatedly told that we're not going to get it. And so, you know, the NCC's Greenbelt Master Plan, the letter of understanding between the city and the NCC makes option seven more difficult um, and very unlikely. And we're talking about $328 million here. Uh, that's a significant amount of money. Um, there will be more traffic in many parts of these areas with expansion in this way, much more traffic. You will induce that traffic to come and that congestion will continue uh, with the plans that we've got in front of us. Um, and so I think to actually build the roads will take money we haven't identified in order to pave over land we don't own. It seems we're relying on hope in that case. And so I, I just, I, I know, you know, I want a brighter future for all of our residents here, but I want to do this right as well. And I think the process of getting in a room with the NCC and hashing this out and working through the, the new TMP and that origin destination study after the pandemic that has occurred is really important. So, um, you know, we need to get something done here and I support you all in doing that. It's, it's the options that I think we need to discuss together that obviously there's disagreement there, but on the whole of it, you know, there's support for getting this done uh, and getting something much better for residents in the East End, which should have been done in the first place. So appreciate the conversation today and uh, all my colleagues uh, advocacy on this. Thanks. Oh, terrific. Oh, uh, Councillor Deeds. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, just wanted to add to the uh, comments that Councillor Menard made that uh, I completely agree with. Um, I just support uh, Councillor Kitt's motion to get in a room and have a conversation with the uh, NCC and see what uh, if there's any positive outcomes that would be in the community interest and the environmental interest at the same time. I think that's an important uh, exercise. Um, but I guess what I was observing today is sort of two solitudes, one where um, many members of the East End communities were coming from a strictly transportation perspective. And uh, considering um, their future transportation needs, and rightly so. Um, and then the other solitude was uh, people coming from an environmental perspective and really recognizing that we're in an, um, a climate emergency, that these are uh, very important environmental lands to our city and to our planet. And that uh, we can't just make transportation decisions, however important they might be, without really thinking through the environmental considerations. And I guess what I what I was left with today is thinking that this should have been a joint meeting. This should have been a joint meeting between transportation and the environment committee, and that both lenses should be considered at the same time when we're making this kind of long-term uh, decision that will both have um, community impacts, financial impacts, and environmental impacts. Um, so, you know, I, I like the idea of um, having the conversation and seeing what the future holds with the NCC. I don't see passing um, option seven if that land is not going to be available uh, to us. And I, I worry about that land being available to us because I do worry about the environment. And I do think that we really need to consider that. Um, so I think going with Councillor Kitt's motion today and seeing where that leads us is, is a good first step. Those are my comments, thank you. Great, uh, thank you very much. I'm just looking around the board. Uh, so seeing no further questions, I'm gonna go to, uh, I'll look at uh, Vivi uh, for a second. So again, we have um, the, um, the direction. Uh, I don't see any uh, conflict on the direction of Councillor Dudas in regards to the gardens component. We all had a read of it at the beginning. Uh, are we all good with the direction to staff on that? I'm seeing everyone's nodding their heads on that one. Yep. Yes. Uh, Councillor Kitts, when it comes to the 100 day uh, portion, is that, uh, is that acceptable to everybody here? Wicked carried. Great, carried, thank you. So we come down to the base, 
base motion, and this is where I'll, I'll look at these, the staff for comment, if it could even be broken apart. Uh, and also, uh, I'll be looking at the clerk if that's also possible. So just for your feedback. Chair, Chair could I ask procedurally, um, could we not ask for this report to be to come back after the 100 days? Like, could we not just table it for today? It is, it is on record. And, um, and that automatically when the 100 days are done, it, it resets where the discussions have been. And if there's not been a resolution, then we have the report in front of us. And if not, it's an amended resolution. I, I, I heard from uh, Vivi that there was no Vivi, time sensitivity. I told him from voting at the committee. Sorry, apologies. Uh, so I, I'm looking around the, the table. I know that I'm receiving some uh, feedback from my Eastern colleagues as well, saying, no, we, we've spent a long time on this today. So I think the option is to look at the motion. Uh, and again, let's let staff and the clerk answer, uh, deputy clerk, forgive me, uh, on if this actually could be broken apart, then we'll do yeas and nays on the components that are required. Vivi? Uh, uh, you're talking about uh, breaking apart the report the recommendations? Correct. Specifically to the item related to item seven, I know that there's some colleagues that don't like that selection. Is there a way to have that so we can vote on that separately? Uh, yeah, yes, because the interim uh, solution is independent of the uh, ultimate plan. Um, and then the third uh, uh, recommendation was for the filing of the 30 day public review. So we may have to wait for that as well. Okay, so that's that's terrific. So on that, oh, I see uh, Councillor Dudas's hand up. Do you, have, do you have a question on this specific one? No, I just wanted to, to clarify, uh, you know, many of our colleagues around the table have spent all day uh, talking about this, listening to this, hearing delegations. This is decades in the making. So, you know, I, I'm going to say we've had lots of yeah. uh, discussions with the NCC to date. We need to embolden and uh, give the tools to our city staff to have a real conversation with them and not just a, it'd be nice to have this could you please give this to us because right. we've had those conversations so I, I appreciate that my colleagues want to have that collaborative discussion attempts have been made for decades so we need right. to actually have a strong stance and send the message that we need to have an answer to the transportation issues in the East End. So I would encourage people to support the report as it stands. Here, here. Okay, so on that, and I'll be doing wrap up in a second, I see Councillor Dean's back on the board and then I'm gonna call for the vote on the broken out items. Thank you, I'd, I'd like to move deferral pending the 100 days because I actually don't think that this is particularly urgent since it's outside the affordability framework. And uh, the conversation with the NCC being the landowners is an important conversation before we set a course for something that we can't actually deliver on currently. So with that in mind, I'm just going to move deferral pending the 100 day uh, discussion. Wonderful, deferral has been like called. To, I'd like to call the vote on deferral. The vote has been called. I'll ask, uh, I'll ask Chris if you can go ahead and so if you're in favor of deferral, you'll vote yes. If you're not in favor of deferral and going with the option to vote today, you'll vote no. Chris? Councillor Luloff? No. Mr. Chair, okay. I know that vote's been called. It's a question on the vote. It's a question relating to just procedure. You're saying deferral, but it's the deferral on 100 days, right? You're completing that, that segment? Yes. Great. Uh, that was a clarification from the mover. So again. Sorry, I think that may have made things less clear. I'm, I'm just looking around uh, yeah. at the place. Uh, so the, uh, the vote that we are taking right now, Mr. Chair, is, if I understand properly, on whether or not to defer uh, consideration of the report recommendations until after the 100 days has been completed. So essentially tabling, correct? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right, we're getting late in the day. Uh, so, uh, Chris, if you want to call the vote. So, again, Councillor Luloff? Also, no. Councillor Dudas? No. Councillor El Shantiri? No. Councillor Deans? Yes. Uh, Councillor Fleury? 
Yes. Councillor Menard? Yes. Councillor Kitts? No. Uh, Councillor Daruz? No. Councillor Hubley? No. Uh, Councillor, I'm sorry, did I call Councillor Elshantiri? Yes, you did, and my answer was no, and I'll give you another no. Very good. Councillor uh, Vice Chair Leeper? Yes. And Chair Tierney? No. That's seven no's to four yeas. Great. And so just before we go to the main motion, I haven't, I haven't got to speak yet. I want to thank everyone for their participation today. Uh, really good dialogues. And uh, look, we had uh, 12 come out and speak passionately in favor. We had five passionately that had major concerns about the environment. And we actually had an individual come out that was leaning one way. And by the end of it, had a completely different appreciation based on all the discussions that took place and was undecided. Uh, I've... <laughs> I've been on council since 2010, and just councillors alone that have had to deal with this portfolio, and remember, it's 20 years long, I've only been there 12, at that, we have Kitts, Blois, Minette, Middick, Dudas, Blay, Lulov, uh, that, that, and myself. That's a lot of people that have been trying to correct this problem uh, in the east end of the city for a very long time. Throw into the fact we're in a housing crisis. Uh, we're, we need houses built and development and industry are basically saying, what? well, how are we going to build? There's no way to actually get there. What I do actually appreciate is a lot of my colleagues that I, I feel that they feel very strongly about the bus component. I think we all agree on that. And, and there was also a great question from a, a colleague uh, saying, whoa, whoa, you're adding on more lanes? No, no, we, we, we're not doing that. We want an HOV. We want people a carpool. We want walking, cycling, as well as a bus route. Look, we already even worked on things like uh, the Blair Road connection. And thank you to my colleagues for supporting me on breaking that EA out because that's another pinch point. And it all leads to the same spot. The south end of Orleans is in a pinch. It, and it, when you think, and we've heard delegations say, oh, with COVID and working at home and things may slow down, it slowed down a little bit, but it's still a traffic nightmare. And I fear for uh, the fact that uh, we've heard the Treasury Minister saying people are going to start going back to work. We're starting to get to an endemic. And when that traffic ramps back up again to its pre-COVID levels, uh, it will be gridlock. And the, the residents of the east end of the city have been looking to complete this for a very, very long time. We tried very hard to work with the NCC. We'll still continue. And thank you, Councillor Kitts, for your wonderful 100 days. I think it's going to help bring, bring them to the table yet again. And hopefully it's a very fruitful discussion. Because again, uh, we're in a very different realm. We're elected. We actually deal directly with the people and the NC and NCC. Uh, we want to work with them, uh, it's, but it does become more and more challenging. We heard that from a delegation today where they were essentially saying, is this some kind of bun fight? Get together in a room and figure it out. And that's what I think we all want. So on that, if we can get the motion up on the screen, there's three specific uh, recommendations in that report. I'll get Chris to pull it on the screen. And then on item one, we can call for yeas and nays and work through uh, item two and item three as well, please. So on item one, yeah. Councillor Luloff? Yes. Councillor Dudas? Yes. Councillor Elshantiri? Yes. Councillor Deans? No. Councillor Fleury? No. Councillor Menard? No. Councillor Kitts? Yes. Councillor Daruz? Yes. Councillor Hubley? <coughs> yes. Vice Chair Leeper? No. And Chair Tierney? Yes. I'm looking at uh, committee members. Seven oh. yeas to four nays. Thank you very much. Uh, I see item two and item three. I don't see anything contentious with those. Uh, and I see the committee members are looking at them right now. Uh, I think the option seven was your concern in one. Uh, so on items two chair, and three. Oh, chair, just on I think item number three, three, Mr. Chair, is. Uh, I don't think item three is going to happen, right? So. Item three is not 
going to happen <laughs> for we heard from staff. So we should probably strike that one. I'm happy to support item two. As the environmental study report. So uh, let's vote on item two. Is that carried? Carried. Carried. Great. And I'll ask staff uh, their opinion on item number three before uh, either we vote on it or remove it from the, uh, from the report. Um, chair, you can vote on it today, but, uh, but with the other, um, and then we'll, we will then um, carry through with your uh, direction to do the 30 days, but we will hold off because there is also that 100 days. So we're, we're going to do the right thing. So if you if you approve it today, at least we have your uh, approval to do so, and then we'll choose the right time to 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 uh, post this. Mr. Chair, I call the vote on the way it is. Okay, let's just do this. Uh, Chris, on item three, the vote's been called. Hey, Mr. Chair, three. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move deferral on that item until the hundred days. Like that to me is, yeah, I, I I'm in support of this it just procedurally it's awkward until the 100 days come back with a recommendation because i we have to come back with a recommendation i'm not trying to be difficult i i will likely support by the way the the discussion if the ncc does come with a consensus i'll likely support but to me like we're jumping cues here there's a conversation to be had with the ncc let's have that and let's come back in front of committee with a a revised direction and at that point consult the public as per the EA requirements Councillor Elshintieri. Well, on procedures, Mr. Chair, the vote was called by one of our colleagues and the vote should take present. So as Councillor Fleury can vote as he wish, but that the vote was called in. And Mr. You can Chair, ask to I'm moving on. deferral. Uh, no, Mr. And Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm... on procedure, Councillor Fleury had his hand up. Councillor DeRuz did not. So Councillor Fleury should have been recognized by the chair first and was not. So on that, uh, I'll be ruling, yes, Councillor Fleury, we'll deal with your deferral first, and then we'll come back to the number three item as well. Thank you for uh, giving me that information. Uh, Caitlin, is that appropriate? Mr. Chair, just to clarify your ruling, we uh, would now be moving to uh, a vote on deferral of recommendation three of the report until the conclusion of the 100 days. Um, and then if deferral does not carry, we would move on to a vote on that recommendation. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? That is, that is correct. Great, Councilman Art. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just, on, just on deferral, um, I mean, I hope everyone in this room supports this. This is what staff have just said they want to do the right thing and that's to have those good faith negotiations and then post this after the 100 days. This is not a political issue. This is very much a process issue. So I just hope we can all get together on the process here of supporting what staff have just said and, and carry the deferral. Thanks. I haven't used the hand feature myself today. So <laughs> I'm just, again, I want to be very clear with, uh, with Vivi. Uh, are we arguing about nothing here? Or I just, I, I'm, I'm having a difficult time with this one. Uh, what's your position on this from a staff perspective? If you defer, it's the same result, uh, but at least a decision, uh, but if you don't defer, a decision will have been made today and we don't have to debate this again. Um, and we would then continue forward um, depending on the outcome of the 100 days discussion, which we still have to go come back and report on to you any, uh, to you and council anyway. But this, this one, it, it's a check mark, it's there, and we're just, we'll just wait for the right time to, to do the posting. So, so there's no impact to the work business that you have to do. This won't delay anything if we were to say, we'll defer item three. That's correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, on uh, is this item carried? Carried. Carried. There we go. Thank you, Mr. All right. Chair. Thank you. Just like spaghetti, we got there. All right. On to uh, on to the next item, and thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, we're on to uh, item number three: the electric kickstart strategy pilot uh, report. Uh, we do have a presentation, so we will allow our wonderful staff to tee that up. <laughs>
while we're waiting for the slide to come up, just want to check you can hear me okay? Absolutely. Terrific, Heidi. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Almost good evening. Uh, my name is Heidi Cousineau, and I am a program manager in transportation planning. Although many city departments are involved in the electric kick scooter pilot program, this past season was once again overseen by the transportation planning service area. We are here today to provide you a summary of the assessment of the second season of the city's electric kick scooter pilot, as well as recommendations to improve the program. Next slide, please. In 2019, council directed staff to study the regulation of electric scooters and to extend the bike sharing pilot provisions to electric scooter sharing companies. In 2020, the province initiated a five-year pilot program for electric kick scooters, allowing municipalities to opt in if they chose to permit them within their jurisdiction. That same year, council enacted the electric kick scooter bylaw, making it legal to operate e-scooters in Ottawa and approved the shared electric kick scooter pilot project. The first season of Ottawa's shared e-scooter pilot ran from mid-July to the end of October 2020 with a total fleet of 600 e-scooters provided by three companies. In February of 2021, Council approved the continuing Ottawa's electric kick scooter pilot for a second season with proposed changes. I'd like to remind you that the e-scooter pilot is not a city program. The, the pilot grants permission to shared e-scooter companies to operate within the city's right of way. The city is not procuring a service from these companies. The pilot's framework provides the conditions that operators must meet in order to be allowed to operate. Next slide, please. The second season of the pilot ran from May 28th to November 30th, 2021. Shared e-scooters were available to rent from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. each day. The city undertook a competitive procurement pro process which prioritized safety and accessibility. As a result, out of six submissions, Excuse me, the city entered into agreements with three companies, Bird Canada, Lime, and Neuron Mobility. The pilot agreements regulated fleet size, fees, speed, geofencing, time of use, and parking. The fleet size increased from 600 scooters in 2020 to 1,200 in 2021, and there was an expanded minimum deployment area centered around the inner urban core of the city. The pilot also included provisions for an optional satellite project of up to 300 scooters outside the green belt for the top ranked provider, but this was never initiated. Next slide, please. Data about the 2021 season was collected by a multiple sources, including data from many other departments, from the e-scooter providers directly, and the end of season survey, which ran from November 3rd to December 1st. In 2021, approximately 492,000 individual e-scooter trips were completed through the shared e-scooter program. This is an increase of approximately 260,000 trips compared to the 2020 season, which was about 79 days shorter. There were approximately 127,000 total unique riders across the three providers, which is an increase of approximately 54,000 riders compared to 2020. Throughout the entire season, an average of approximately 2,600 trips per day were completed. During the busier part of the season, in July and August, daily e-scooter trips averaged approximately 3,200 trips per day on weekdays, and 4,400 trips per day on weekends, with some weekends as high as 5,500 daily trips. Total trip distance was approximately 985,000 kilometers, an increase of approximately 559,000 kilometers compared to the previous year. But the average trip distance and duration is very similar to 2020's data at about two kilometers or just over 14 minutes. The average daily utilization rate of the individual scooters decreased from about 4.69 trips per vehicle per day in 2020 to about 2.64 trips per vehicle per day in 2021. The busiest period for e-scooter usage occurred in the evening, very similar to 2020, with the busiest hours from 6 to 10 p.m. Next slide, please. Residents have expressed their support for the pilot, indicating that the e-scooters were convenient and alternative to using a car and how they supported physical distancing during the pandemic. Survey results show an increase in the percentages of respondents who indicated that the most common reason they used an e-scooter was for utility types of trips, like to and from school or work or appointments or to and from social activities, dining and shopping. And there was a decrease in the percentage of respondents who indicated the main purpose was for fun or leisure or just to try them out. There were very similar travel patterns as in 2020 with a concentration of trips starting and ending in the Byward market 
and along commercial streets such as Elgin, Bank, Wellington, and Preston. Similar to 2020, approximately 42 to 45% of trips started or ended in a BIA. Almost 50% of survey respondents indicated that the main purpose of their trip was to get to or from shopping or a local business or to or from dining. Of these, approximately 45% reported spending more than $50 on a typical visit to these local businesses. Most respondents who rode e-scooters were repeat users. The percentage of respondents who completed more than 10 trips grew from 23% in 2020 to 43% in 2021. Next slide, please. Overall, 74% of riders responding to the survey noted that the introduction of e-scooters changed the way they traveled. There was an increase in the percentage of respondents who noted an increase in their use of transit and a decrease in their use of personal vehicles, whether as a driver or passenger. This may indicate that e-scooters are becoming more successful at promoting alternative modes of travel over time. Approximately 4% of all trips were combined with transit trips. This represents an increase compared to the 2020 season, which saw approximately 2% of all e-scooter trips combined with transit. First and last kilometer trips to and from transit stations averaged between 1.5 and 3 kilometers, with longer distance trips tending to occur at stations further from downtown. 33% reported taking a shared e-scooter to connect to or from another form of transportation at least once. This is similar to 2020. 92% of these respondents connected to transit, either bus or train. This is similar to the rate from 2020 as well, which was 89% in 2020. 40% of survey respondents reported that they walked more with the introduction of shared e-scooters. This is up from 29% in 2020. Next slide, please. The primary issue with the 2021 season was the misparking of e-scooters. The electric kick scooter bylaw permits e-scooters to be parked within the furniture zone next to trees, light poles, street furniture, and bike parking, while maintaining a continual throughway clearance for pedestrian traffic. The challenges in the 2021 season included streets in the e-scooter deployment area with narrow sidewalks or no furniture zones, a lack of user compliance in the furniture zone areas, and the allowance for up to one hour for providers to respond to misparked e-scooters. According to the end of season survey, 83% of respondents encountered misparked e-scooters, which is up from 69% in 2020. 77% of them indicated that they left the misparked e-scooters where they were, and only 16% reported them to the city or e-scooter providers. Specific strategies to address parking included some provider-led education initiatives and foot patrols proactively correcting misparked scooters and responding to complaints. The pro providers also audited the required end of ride photos that sometimes led to surcharges or suspensions. There were also incentives for riders to park in preferred parking areas that were identified in the providers apps or in the five physically designated parking areas that the city installed later in the season. Some new localized no parking zones were established in all of the providers apps based on feedback received. And finally, the city also led some education and communications through social media posts as well as video, a video and poster campaign. Next slide, please. The city does not permit e-scooters to be ridden on sidewalks. However, sidewalk riding has been reported and observed. Sidewalk riding was monitored in a variety of ways throughout the 2021 season, including using myovision traffic cameras, weekly data reports from the service providers, and through complaints to the city directly. Although the number of complaints decreased over the course of the season, which could be attributed to several awareness blitzes and initiatives, the issue remained. According to the end of season survey, 79% of all survey respondents encountered sidewalk riding, of which 67% did not report them to the city, the providers or the police, and 64% felt uncomfortable and unsafe. 31% of respondents believe that riding behavior has improved since 2020 season, and 30% believe that it improved over the course of the 2021 season alone. Strategy, <clears throat> strategies to address sidewalk riding included geofencing of key corridors where feasible and provider-led initiatives like their foot patrols, education events, and messaging campaigns. The city also requested that the providers add messaging in large print near or on the footboard of the e-scooters indicating no sidewalk riding. There was some city-led messaging campaigns like the installation of wind signs in high volume areas through social media posts and a video and poster campaign. The Ottawa Police Services also carried out some enforcement blitzes targeting riding behavior. Finally, the providers have piloted various sidewalk technologies 
on e-scooters at various times throughout the season. However, this technology was new and still under development in 2021. Next slide, please. Staff conducted an online survey end of season, uh, uh, which provided insight on the benefits and issues associated with the e-scooters. This year's survey had a total of just over 1,700 respondents, where the majority of res respondents did not ride an e-scooter. So as presented here, about 38% of respondents rode an e-scooter in 2021, about 23% rode an e-scooter in both 2020 and 2021, and about 60% of respondents did not ride an e-scooter. During the 2021 pilot, staff consulted with specific ward councillors where shared e-scooters were deployed and the city's accessibility advisory committee. Staff also assembled a multi-departmental working group and an external accessibility stakeholder working group to discuss ongoing concerns and issues during the pilot season. Feedback from councillors, the working groups, the accessibility advisory committee and residents through 311, the city's e-scooter email account and the end of the year survey along with staff experience, have contributed to the development of recommendations for a future pilot season. Next slide, please. The city's Accessibility Advisory Committee convened two special meetings to receive presentations from staff and provide feedback. At the end of the second meeting, they voted on a motion, which is paraphrased here. Given the issues related to missed parking, sidewalk riding, reporting and enforcement, it is understandable that the Accessibility Advisory Committee is advising council to not conduct any more pilots that would allow e-scooters, whether personally owned, borrowed or rented to be used in public spaces, to decline further participation in the Ontario pilot program, to immediately prohibit use of e-scooters in public spaces, and to dedicate adequate and ongoing resources for real-time enforcement of the prohibition of e-scooters in public spaces. However, the e-scooter program does, does provide broader benefits as described in this presentation, and staff are proposing additional tighter controls to mitigate the problems that impede the safe mobility of vulnerable users of sidewalks and multi-use pathways. Next slide, please. Staff recommend improvements if the pilot program is to continue in 2022. As I mentioned, the pilot sets the conditions under which providers would be allowed to operate in the city's right of way, and the operators must manage their business to meet these conditions. The goal is to set conditions that respects and ensures a safe environment for pedestrians while providing residents with access to an, alter an, to an alternative mode of transportation that helps reduce car dependency. The changes include limiting the number of shared e-scooter providers to a maximum of two selected through a competitive process with a reduced combined total fleet size of 900 maximum e-scooters. Amending the fee structure in the agreements with the e-scooter providers to fund additional resources required to effectively manage the program while remaining revenue neutral. Strengthening agreements with the e-scooter providers aimed at enforcing a high compliance approach to improper riding behavior and misparking. Streamlining the mechanisms used to report and track issues or, or concerns and moving forward with sound emission improvements for shared e-scooters in operation. Next slide, please. The recommendations to address parking would include a competitive pro provider selection process that favors the newest technology solutions that must be demonstrated and proven to work, as well as initiatives that the providers include in their operations to comply with the city standards that would improve the verification of proper parking. Elements that would be evaluated in the selection process include strategies such as geofencing no end of ride zones or other proven technologies, greater provider staffing numbers, incentivize preferred parking options, end of ride photos, fines or bans from the apps and other enforcement strategies and education and communication campaigns. We are also recommending that the required response times to address issues related to missed parking be reduced from one hour to 15 minutes. The city would install more physically demarcated parking areas before the season begins. And finally, we are recommending an increase of enforcement of parking by city staff, which I'll describe further in a bit. Next slide, please. Similar to parking, the recommendations to address sidewalk riding would include a competitive provider selection process that favors the newest technology solutions that must be demonstrated and proven to work, as well as initiatives and strategies that the providers include in their operations to comply with the city's high standards. Elements that would be evaluated in the selection process include strategies such as better geofencing or other proven technologies, better verification and enforcement of proper riding, greater provider staffing numbers, in-app education strategies, and other education and communication campaigns. 
Next slide, please. When it comes to sound emissions, we recommend that all shared e-scooters in use would be required to emit a continuous sound to be in operation immediately on day one of their operations. The city would provide specific criteria about the sound parameters such that the sounds from each service provider would be as similar as possible to each other. Recognizing that the city is leading the industry to push this technology in advance of any worldwide standard, the providers would be required to have the cap capabilities to adjust the sound parameters during the season as more refinement is undertaken. More refinement could include things like adjusting volumes based on location or time of day, adjusting volumes in neighborhoods but louder on key corridors or around intersections, or based on feedback received throughout the season as the sounds are monitored for effectiveness. The providers would also be required to educate the riders about the need for the sounds. Next slide, please. In addition to the compliance measures that the e-scooter providers must carry out themselves, staff recommend increased proactive enforcement activities by city staff. In consultation with bylaw and regulatory services, we are recommending the addition of seasonal bylaw officers dedicated to e-scooter enforcement during the shared e-scooter season, who would help uphold the 15 minute response time by providers. These temporary positions would be funded by the increased e-scooter provider service agreement fees. These officers would be creating service requests, collecting data, reporting issues, and monitoring the provider's response times. They would be relocating and removing misparked e-scooters if providers fail to do so, and they would be taking enforcement actions, including issuing fines or impounding any misparked e-scooter at any time, regardless of the 15-minute response time allowance. This would help ensure that the providers manage their operations to minimize the potential for payment and fines. The Ottawa Police Services would continue to undertake enforcement blitzes, which would be aided with data and or support from bylaw services staff. We are also recommending some amendments to the existing city bylaw for the use of e-scooters to clarify language to facilitate enforcement activities and to add a provision to authorize impoundments, similar to how the city impounds shopping carts. Any impoundment would be carried out by bylaw officers and they would be stored at a city roads yard. A fee of $75 per e-scooter is proposed. Next slide, please. Finally, staff recommend changes to the, process use, the processes used to collect inquiries and complaints and to track all the data associated with these complaints. These new processes are still in development with the city's innovative and client services department, but essentially would consist of a new dedicated e-form specific to e-scooters, such that residents can self-report any concerns directly to one platform. All communication methods, either through the city, such as the city's website or app, or through, the providers, or through the providers directly, their apps or other contact methods would be funneled through one platform for better tracking. 311 agents would continue to receive inquiries by phone and this data would be tracked with the data from the eForm platform. This system would automate the redistribution of the reported concerns to the appropriate city department. Most concerns like misparking could be directed to bylaw and regulatory services who would then forward the complaints directly to the e-scooter provider as appropriate to action. This will allow bylaw and regulatory services to have access to all service requests to aid with the monitoring and enforcement activities. Next slide is just thank you and we have for questions uh, after the delegates. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Heidi. I know how much work you put into this and I know some of our scooter companies aren't too happy about our new strengthened measures. Uh, just before we uh, go to delegations, uh, I believe there was a couple of motions. Um, and if we can get Chris to pop those up on the screen so we can get those read in uh, before we go to delegations. That'll be up momentarily, Chair. Thank you, Chris. While we're waiting for it to pop up, uh, it was a very cold day. I'm trying to remember when it was. Was it was it November, Jeff? Yeah, it was it was cold, and we got to take a bit of a, a toot around and test out the new technologies. Very interesting. So, and I know that uh, the three providers that demoed some of their new technologies uh, that we got to try are here today speaking to it. So, let's see what happens. Oh, Chris. Okay, so we have one by Councillor Leeper. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, can I say a few words about it? 
Uh, certainly. I want that later. Sure. So um, this is killing me because I think uh, residents and uh, committee members know that I've adopted pretty much an entirely scooter based lifestyle. Um, I, I do own my own and it has changed the way I get around the city. The rental program uh, is an issue with respect to misparked scooters. I think that if the scooter program uh, continues, it is going to, we are going to solve the sidewalk riding problem. We're going to solve the um, constantly emitted noise problem, but I am extremely skeptical that we are going to solve the misparked scooter um, problem, and that's that's a, a huge accessibility concern for me. So my support for uh, continuing the scooter program is going to. Uh, hinge on whether or not uh, this motion passes, which is to allow scooters to park on the street. Whereas the Transportation Committee is considering an extension to the electric uh, scooter pilot project in Ottawa, and whereas accessibility concerns continue to be predominant, particularly with respect to the improper parking of devices, where those impede on the traveled portion of city right-of-ways, including sidewalks, and where those block safety infrastructure, such as bag buttons, I'm sorry for the use of the provocative term um, and where I would have changed that and whereas 83% of respondents to end of season survey of residents encountered misparked scooters of whom only 16% reported those to the city or to operators and whereas the CNIB Foundation of Ontario East notes that it is opposed to the continuation of the e-scooter pilot into a third year whereas permitting electric kick scooters to park on in, uh, in on street parking stalls would be a marked departure from current approaches with a high degree of potential to mitigate the challenge of misparked e-scooters. Therefore, be it resolved that the traffic and parking bylaw be amended to allow electric kick scooters to be parked on any portion of the highway where motor vehicles are normally allowed to park. And be it further resolved that where parking is allowed on portions of the highway where motor vehicle parking is normally allowed, electric kick scooters will be subject to the same rules as motor vehicles, including time limits. And and be it further resolved, parking fees in paid parking areas be waived for electric kick scooters. Uh, folks, when I'm walking down the street um, all over the area where scooters operate uh, and one is parked in my way on the, uh, on the sidewalk and there's curbside street parking, that's where I put the scooter uh, out of the way. Um, so I will leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Great. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Vice Chair. And uh, I'm sure we'll have questions to staff when we get to that point. Uh, is there another motion, I believe? Yes, uh, Councillor Fleury has been working with staff. I want to thank him for that. Uh, a lot of good work going into this. Councillor Fleury. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll introduce just more general terms. So I see maybe a bit broad, broader than Councillor Leeper. I see that there is a parking issue and then there is a compliance of where people are riding, following the direction of the lanes and not riding on sidewalks. So my two motions reflect further clarification uh, on these matters. So whereas the city is entering its third year of the electric kick scooter pilot project, a number of concerns with misuse and mismanagement of e-scooters such as miss parking, sidewalk riding as a result in areas where the pilot program must improve. Therefore be it resolved that the support that to support the success of this e-scooter pilot program, council directs staff to implement these additional requirements for e-scooter operators to receive a permit to make their e-scooters available for hire for the city's right of way to further clarify those that staff will already be including in the RFP process and agreements with the providers. So one, require all e-scooter providers to implement technologies and strategies to ensure all users receive approval from the e-scooter platform before releasing the device, so when people park. And then two, require all e-scooter providers to geofence city sidewalks within their GPS technologies to stop the e-scooters from operating if sidewalk riding is detected. And then three, require all e-scooter providers to include strategies and technologies to address the illegal violation of e-scooters traveling in wrong directions on city streets. And then I have another one relating to enforcement, uh, Chair. Yes, we'll get that up right away. So Ottawa Police have done a number of blitzes, as um, uh, Heidi was highlighting. I 
the, the blitzes are a sexy thing. I want enforcement daily. Uh, if you if you if you if you drive poorly on a vehicle, on a bike, or on a, an e-scooter, you should be treated the same way. So that's the spirit of this motion here, uh, Christopher. I wonder if you can put it on the screen. Sorry, councillor, it's coming. I see, we have a visitor. Always good to see kids on the screen. <laughs> Oh, here we go. Excellent. So, um, whereas the city's electric uh, kick scooter bylaw, which is number 20. 2174 regulates the operation and use of electric kick scooters in the city, whereas this bylaw reinforces the provincial regulation, established parking regulations, and includes set fines for various infractions like riding on a sidewalk or parking where not permitted, and whereas enforcement of any moving violations, including riding on a sidewalk, is undertaken by the Ottawa Police Services and bylaw and regulatory services as the ability to enforce other provisions of the bylaw. And as the Ottawa Police Services carries out monthly blitzes, in sh uh, issuing warnings or bylaw infractions tickets under the uh, city's e-scooter bylaw, whereas the 2021 OPS reported 14 tickets only, up from nine uh, in 2020, and 10 warnings up from five in 2020 for uh, moving violations under the city's e-scooter bylaw, with set fines ranging from $80 to 150, depending on the infraction. And whereas the proceeding with charges related to misuse of e-scooter under the Highway Traffic Act requires significant administrative efforts on the time of OPS uh, for OPS, then a typical traffic offense notice because of the lack of set fines under the provincial regulations relating to e-scooters. Therefore, be it resolved that staff recommend that the Ministry of Transportation to obtain set fines for moving violations created under uh, Ontario Regulations 389-19. Great. Uh, thank you again uh, for working with staff. Uh, we'll just jump right into the delegations at this point. First up, uh, no stranger to this group, uh, Chris Schaefer uh, with Bird Canada. Thank and you, I believe Chief. you have a presentation. Uh, I believe Chris will pull that up for you right now. Thank you. Uh, hello, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Chris Schaefer. I'm VP of Government Affairs at Bird Canada. Next slide, please. Bird Canada supports the staff recommendations before you today, encourages their adoption. Next slide, please. Briefly, we'll touch on um, a bit of the data in the staff report and some of the new uh, scooter and technologies related to the new e-scooter that uh, we hope to bring to Ottawa if the pilot is to continue. Next slide, please. Data, we've analyzed from the data that was presented at the staff uh, report, year-over-year um, -year growth of 107%. Uh, shared e-scooters are very popular in the city of Ottawa. Unique ridership is up 74% uh, year-over-year. Average trip, trip distance is up about 6% year-over-year. The leisure trips are down 28%. I think this is suggesting that people are using it more for a legitimate uh, commuting option as the percentage of commuting trips, for example, to and from school and work are up 75%. Next slide, please. I think we'd be hard pressed in the city of Ottawa to find something that has changed commuting behavior of local residents as much as shared e-scooters. Uh, people reported again in the Ottawa data that was presented to you 98% reported driving less or being a passenger less than an automobile. 35% reported they've walked more because of e-scooters. Um, they've transited more because of e-scooters and they've biked more because of e-scooters. Next slide, please. We ran some basic math on, in terms of the data that was presented in the staff report about economic contribution of shared e-scooters. Our estimates put it at about $10 million of economic activity as a result of the presence of shared e-scooters in Ottawa. Next slide, please. 
this is the bird three. This is the model that we had at the lands down demo where we brought the new technology to Ottawa this year. Ottawa was the first city in Canada to see this technology and the second city, I understand, in North America. Um, needless to say, the e-scooter bird three model that we would bring exclusively for the entire fleet in Ottawa, if the pilot continues, is the latest and greatest. Next slide, please. Um, with a new e-scooter, the new brain and new chips on board, we're able to do some exciting things such as, you know, more precision with parking, uh, detecting sidewalk riding and geofencing. Next slide, please. We can be much more precise with the drawing of the slowdown zones, no ride zones and no park zones for enhanced precision. Um, we can also customize them. So for example, if you had a school zone, you wanted scooters to travel more slowly through that zone at certain times of the day, Monday to Friday, we could do that. And then outside of those hours, Monday to Friday or on the weekend, they could travel at their normal uh, higher speed of 20 kilometers per hour maximum. Next slide, please. Smart sidewalk protection. Um, next slide, please. Older models of e-scooters relied on GPS technology, which had its own challenges in terms of sight lines in dense urban areas. With newer technology comes more precision. Next slide, please. This is what we would look to deploy uh, in Ottawa. New brain and new sensor chips allow us to know a lot more about where the vehicle is using wheel speed and turning data, uh, sensors that detect acceleration and other atmospheric data. Next slide, please. The result is the scooter will respond much more quickly because the scooter knows where it is in the real world. So you're looking at a response time about half a second or less. Older models and older technologies, somewhere around 30 seconds to respond. So a distance that a scooter could travel on a sidewalk would be much greater under older generation of, of technologies and scooters. Of course, we'd be bringing the latest and best uh, to Ottawa and hopefully get selected through the RFP process. Next slide, please. Smart precision parking, next slide, please. Again, new technology, we can do exciting things such as virtual docks. Next slide, please. Basically the user would, when they get to their destination, would scan the surrounding buildings. That camera positioning system would locate them within a precision of about 20 to 30 uh, centimeters, whether they were inside a virtual box that would be compliant with local regulations for parking. If they're not inside that invisible virtual box, the trip does not end, and the app provides instructions of where the rider is to go to park properly. Next slide, please. I'll summarize here. We demoed this technology at Lansdowne. 98.8% of trips on the sidewalk were prevented and 100% uh, compliance with parking. Next slide, please. Thank you. I look forward to any questions you may have. Great, uh, thank you. I, I have Vice Chair Leeper and then Councillor Fleury. Thank you very much, Chair Chris. Hi, it's good to see you. Um, so the parking issue is the one with which I am uh, most concerned. So many of our sidewalks don't have a, a realistic furniture zone in which you can park um, on our main streets in, in Hintonburg and, and elsewhere. Uh, the reliability of your parking tech now uh, does it rely on having every conceivable allowable parking space mapped? Through your chair, it's a great question. So as you know, during the pilot last year, we, would, we deployed a whole range of technologies, the geofencing of no parking zones, and then the preferred digital parking zones in app. And we incentivize those. Basically, we were deploying a whole range of available technologies at the time for the different built forms in Ottawa, narrow sidewalks and the Glebe, et cetera. The technology that I talked briefly about in my presentation was not deployed because that technology wasn't simply available last year. What we would do is we would map in compliance with the local rules for parking. We would map areas in the city that were compliant with the rules. And we would basically be able to layer those virtual boxes on otherwise permitted street furniture zone parking, assuming that model continues. So what it would be is a layering. You would, where I would argue is where you have good street furniture zone like an Elgin, you wanna encourage the use of that. But in areas where the built form or geography is more challenging, you deploy other technologies like the one I showed you 
with the camera positioning technology where you wave your cell phone and it locates you within about precision of about 20 to 30 centimeters, whether you're inside that virtual box or not. City also has those physical real world boxes with the painted box uh, as well. So again, there's been a layering of parking technologies and that's consistent, frankly, with other cities uh, with pilots across Canada. So I didn't hear that everything is mapped. Like, I, I think I would like the technology that you pointed to in the, um, uh, the presentation, I think could be really, really promising if, you know, every conceivable allowed parking space were mapped. But it, I don't think you're going to get to that point, and certainly not this year. Through you, Chair, uh, we could map uh, as many of these um, as there would be space to provide them. Um, so that the issue isn't the mapping. I, I would suggest that that's not the issue here. Um, it's it's certain areas of the city I think are are better for this technology. Where, like for example, the the designated physical real world parking that the city installed on city land, um, that was those areas I believe were chosen strategically where there were challenges with parking, particularly the Byward Market is one example. That sort of technology makes sense there. What you want to do really in, in recognizing that cities like Ottawa, frankly, you know, pick your city in Canada, have been built over the decades with different ways of building the built form in cities. Now we build wide sidewalks like on Elgin's regeneration. Before I recall when I lived in Ottawa, very narrow sidewalks. So what, what we've done and what we've been able to do, I think, together is layer on different parking approaches, um, particularly last year, based on what the built form was in a particular area. So like the Glebe with the narrow sidewalks, we just geofence that as a no park zone, but knowing in that larger Glebe no park zone, there were particular areas that the parking was, you know, good where, a good place to park. We created that preferred digital parking zone and the app incentivized, pushed, encouraged riders to park in those areas. We could now use the camera positioning um, technology that would locate them with precision of about 20 to 30 centimeters, whether in fact they're actually now in that preferred invisible virtual box. But I believe we're only going to have, we're going to increase the number of those to 20, I think, according to the report. So it's, and I'm just taking a look at all the side streets. So in Hintonburg, for example, I'm, I'm seeing a steady march of no park zones, right? There is no street furniture zone on the side streets in Hintonburg. Um, and I'm just wondering how useful it is to turn entire um, residential areas that are off the main street into no park zones because the built form characteristics are such that you know, it, it wouldn't be allowed. Um, it strikes me that allowing scooters to be parked on a curbside parking lane would greatly increase the flexibility of users to park much closer to the destination that they want to park at. Because these aren't just to go shopping on main streets. People are using them to go home. Um, how do you feel about allowing scooters to be parked in the curbside parking lane anywhere where that is normally allowed by uh, for motor vehicles. Through you, Chair, um, our main goal of Bird Canada is compliance with local rules. So if that was the regime that was implemented, we would comply with that and work to the best of our abilities to make that parking um, permission a reality and make it successful. With that said, there are challenges, of course, with that uh, model. However, our goal is compliance and we'll work with the city under whatever parking model is, is ultimately adopted uh, by, by committee and council. Okay. All right, uh, Chris, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Councillor Fleury. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I'll begin by a bit of a preamble, but I think it is uh, necessary as the area where there is most rental of uh, e-scooters in the city. Uh, Chris, if it wasn't for Bird, and you know, I, I do want to see improvement, but this would be at a the the report and committee would not even consider an ex, a review of the pilot. And I, I I've had these conversations with staff and, and the chair, and 
I have to say that uh, so far, uh, the abilities of Bird to uh, resolve matters in real time on the ground, ban people and be open about that as, as demonstrated um, what we are expecting as a city. Uh, at the very basic. So I want to I want to uh, be public about that. I, I've shared that with you, but I, th I think it, it is important that uh, to me, Lyme and Neuron did not meet even the basics of standards, I would hope. Now, um, on the matters that uh, are in front of us today, it really we're talking about improvement to technology. And there are two areas I'm looking for technology to solve issues, which is uh, on uh, parking. Um, and then the other one is on writing. So um, I want to understand from you um, what technology elements, I, in the report there's reference to uh, Glebe uh, residential streets. I think Lower Town residential streets and Sandy Hill residential streets are of the same era, so uh, the same problem. Um, what, uh, what measures uh, beyond what the city's asking of you can you put in place to make sure that uh, no one in a wheelchair, uh, no one walking down a sidewalk uh, is impeded by, uh, by bird, by, by bird uh, e-scooters uh, this coming season. And through you, Chair, great question. Of course, our goal is, is public safety right off the top. So everything we're doing is, is geared towards that. Everything we did last year is geared towards that. But the future we're talking about, Councillor. Um, I talked briefly about that technology. It's it's, it's the, the new brain that is on the latest model of e-scooter and the microfusion sensor chips allows to allow that computer processing power to take into account many more variables than what was possible before. All of that means in a nutshell, in a very simple way, the scooter knows where it is. Whereas the old technology, if you think about it, uh, uh, you know, Uber Canada, if you open the Uber app, sometimes the old GPS technology bounces off buildings and the driver thinks you're over here and you're actually standing over here. It's because the satellite doesn't always have a clear signal. That's why the new, um, the new scooters, new brain, new chips take into account turning of the wheel, the speed at which you're traveling, other factors, bringing it all together to be able to be much more precise about where it is. Then you can do some interesting things. If you know precisely where the scooter is, you can slow it down and have it come to a complete stop much more quickly on a sidewalk than you could previously. As I'd mentioned, the old technology, A, relying almost exclusively on GPS, would sometimes think you're on the road when in fact you were on the sidewalk. Um, and that's not good. Um, but that's the technology that was available at the time. The newer technology much more precise in terms of where you are so we can slow the scooter down and stop it on a sidewalk. The same goes for the parking technology. The scooter knows where it is more precisely. We can do interesting things in terms of validating whether a, a user was, is, is within a compliant area for parking. Oh, you're on mute, Councillor Fleury. Sorry, I, I have the habit so that there's no bounce back on sound just to, to mute myself. Thanks, Chair. Um, on the uh, aspects of technology, because I, I do agree that you know, the, the spirit of an e-scooter makes complete sense in where we're going to connecting to LRT, to not using the car. Like I like the principle, but the issues are real and they have to be taken extremely seriously. Um, this year, what you've showed us at the end of the year was the ability to stop the motor if someone is on a sidewalk. Can you confirm that with today's report, you, that technology will apply in Ottawa uh, for, board, for BIRD um, in, uh, in 22? That's three, Chair, great question. We, as you know, we demoed that technology at Lansdowne Park. Uh, and so we, if this program continues, I hope it does. I think it brings real value to the city. There's challenges. But, but brings value. Our intention would be, of course, staff are saying we need to have this and we need to demo and prove this technology exists. We have it on the scooters and it actually works. We've done that already at the Lansdowne demo, but we'd have to demo and prove that again through the RFP process. If we can't meet that threshold, we're not gonna get a permit to operate. And if we can't continue to meet that threshold, according to the staff report, we won't continue to operate in your city. So the burden is really on us uh, and we're prepared to step up uh, and meet that threshold, as I think we, we, we've strived to do uh, through two years of this pilot. 
the last question. Um, if I travel to uh, Toronto and need directions, not that I do, but you know, uh, for, for as an example, um, I would put put in my phone and the maps and say exactly where I'm going. And the GPS, if I take a wrong turn, would would recognize that I'm I'm not in a legal movement or I'm going counter to my objectives. So, from a principle, the technology is there. Um, what you have been able to do and work with the city on and, you know, kind of get the other providers on is to red zone some areas, particularly the market. And I'm thankful for that under the old technology. What could be a much better solution is if e-scooters are stay on the street and follow the lane directions. And I, I'd love for you to comment on, on that. And I, I'll put it out there. Like, I'm glad to review the red zone of the market if e-scooters follow the lane directions and stay on the street. Thank you, Chair. Great question. Um, so a couple things. Um, the the technology you reference in terms of knowing, you know, you check your Google Maps and if you're driving, the Google will tell you, hey, you're heading down the wrong street. The reality is, is the car will continue heading down that street wrong way or not if you're driving it that way. Um, my understanding with the, the technology is it, it, it won't be able to prevent um, a rider going down a street the wrong way. Um, the reality is in particular areas, what I would suggest, again, there's this technology, if you think about like a, a car every year, you buy a new model, the technology on that car gets better. So what I'm telling you now may be outdated in six months time, give or take. Um, but where there is a particular problem um, of that happening, what I would suggest in the interim is a couple things. One is we would locate, as we did throughout this uh, last season, upwards of 15 to 20 staff members to be positioned throughout the city at key points, Bird Canada, Safe Street Patrol, and flagging, educating, fining, and banning riders for doing the behavior you mentioned until such time that the technology catches up with the desire you're expressing. And, and I want to achieve that through technology as well. Um, there's other things we could look at doing um, as a sort of escalated measure if the problem was um, of a you know, concern or, or persistent, such as using various geofencing technologies just to prevent riding in, in a particular area. Yeah, and thank you for that. I, I think as, as you're talking about the evolution of technology, I think my motion, uh, the first one on use of technology does capture the intentions there. I think you and your team have a lot of work to to differentiate sidewalks. I'll give you the example of, of Rito Street with the bi-directional lane. It's very different than a wide sidewalk array. So, you know, as a final point, can I get your commitment that even if the condition is dangerous, which by the way, would also be as dangerous for a, 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 a bicycle. And that's a bigger conversation we need to have as a, as a city um, that you will not, uh, that you will ensure that there's no movement uh, that the motor is shut shut off on sidewalk on city sidewalks. Uh, through chair, absolutely. So the as I understand the staff report, uh, upon my review of it, is that it's mandated that technology be available uh, by providers in order to win the RFP and be selected and and to continue in the program. So absolutely, we demoed that technology to city staff and at Lansdowne. Our intention would be, of course, to apply to the city. RFP process with that technology be evaluated on that basis and to have it available in the city of Ottawa um, if this program continues and I hope it does. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flurry. Uh, Councillor Kitts. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Chris, really quickly, um, when scooters are parked in the wrong spot, do you have any data on how long it takes from a resident making the call to 311 and then a bird crew um, showing up to resolve it? Through you, Chair. Great question, Councillor. So uh, as staff mentioned, the um, standard in our contract is one hour response times. However, we at Bird Canada go above and beyond that. Our average response time is anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes. It's rapid um, and that's been validated uh, time and time again. Uh, we, um, we get um, you know, um, people reaching out to us in a variety of ways. Either it's uh, via 311, it's either via our local email address, customer service support numbers and contact on the scooter neck itself um, and social media. And, and so we respond across all mediums like that. And our response time 
uh, I think, look, I can't speak on behalf of staff, but I think the proposal to move from one hour down to 15 minutes is based on their analysis of the manner in which Bird Canada responded to those issues in a timely way. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Great, uh, and th thank you very much. And I don't see any more questions. So real quick, uh, Chris, we've worked together for a few years and uh, apologies, uh, we're, we're getting a little more strict yet again. And I know industry would love nothing more than be, have a permanent program. Uh, but I think you can even admit that um, we wanted to see the new technology. I mean, the other ones was just a scooter. There was no brains on it. There was no accuracy on parking, sidewalk riding and accessibility. You've made the commitment to me, your old uh, antiquated scooter stock You've gotten rid of it. You've brought in what's been used overseas, which has been very successful. And that's what, if you are successful through the RFP gates that our staff will have to test, uh, you're confident that you'll have, it will be all a new fleet. There won't be any of the old fleet, correct? Uh, three, uh, two, Jer, correct. Okay, good, good, good. And I, I, I echo Councillor Fleury. I appreciate the pickup times. I think you guys did a terrific job. Uh, keep it up and uh, uh, good luck. We have other delegations to get through and we'll lots of questions to staff, but thank you for coming out today. Thank you, Chair. Next up, uh, we got, uh, uh, please, I'm not, I hope I'm not butchering a, a name here. Uh, Vanglees Nikias. Vanglees. And please help me uh, correct that if I've mispronounced it. And just uh, for people that are in the waiting room, um, uh, in order, the next following three will be David Leprovsky, uh, Philip Turcott, Philip, and yeah, Isaac. I'll put you on speaker. I'll put you on speaker. Yeah. Chair, um, we're going, we're having trouble connecting with Mr. Lepofsky, but I, we figured out a workaround. I hope it works. He's going to speak uh, from my phone via the speaker phone. And so please let me know if you can hear him. Okay, and just before that, though, uh, uh, what happened to speaker number two? Mr. Nikias is not available. Okay, thank you very much for the update. Mr. Lacasse, you have five minutes. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Test one, two, three. Yes, we do. Can they hear me? Sir? Yes, you know? yes, they, yes, they can, Mr. Lakowski. Oh, you can. Okay. Uh, let's begin again. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. To speak to you. My name is David Lepofsky. I'm chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. We've been leading advocacy on this uh, e-scooters issue from a disability perspective. I want to begin by alerting you to two very serious accessibility issues regarding your meeting today. And I'd like to ask you to adjourn the discussion of this matter to a future meeting to give us. The first is that the, the Zoom uh, platform you're using is not the Zoom meeting platform, it's another one, and it's not accessible. I, I, I use Zoom all the time, and I can't get into your meeting as a participant. And that's a very serious accessibility barrier. The second thing is that we uh, blind folks did not get access to accessible versions of the documents posted for this meeting until last uh, late yesterday afternoon. Uh, and we were early provided inaccessible versions and at one point being told that one of them was accessible that wasn't. And it's with our own safety and accessibility fall at, at stake, the idea that the uh, would go ahead uh, under these circumstances, uh, we'd like to suggest would not be fair at all. Um, and is certainly not fair at a meeting where the very issue is accessibility and safety for people with disabilities. But I'm gonna give you the feedback that I can, that I can give you uh, right now based on the limited information we've got. And I filed a brief on it. It is now undisputable that if the e-scooters in Ottawa have in fact presented a safety and accessibility danger for people with disabilities, both from sidewalk riding um, and from parking, uh, misparking of e-scooters. So that's not debatable. Now, 
Mr. Schaefer, you just heard, has told other cities, oh, that's not a problem at all. And indeed, that, that, that Ottawa is a gold standard for deployment of e-scooters. But it, in fact, is a problem, and it seems to be undisputed now, based on the city staff report, that it is a problem and a serious one. And it's a problem in any city which has already got accessibility barriers. The last thing that should be done is anything that makes things uh, worse for people with disabilities when your obligation is to make it uh, into an accessible city. Uh, given that, I, I should tell you that those two very dangers, I warned the mayor's office and senior transportation officials about uh, before the night before uh, you were called on to first vote on e-scooters two years ago. In other words, we warned this would happen. Uh, that warning was disregarded, and these dangers have, in fact, happened. So that's the first thing. So now let's turn to the proposed solution. Uh, our, we are suggesting that you not approve an e-scooter third pilot, uh, that you send this back to city staff, and that you do so saying, don't come back with us on a promise that you'll only approve accessible technology. Send it back and say, come back to us when you can prove the technology actually works. In other words, once you know there is this danger that you are subjecting your own residents to, and once you're aware of that danger, so it's not, oh, we didn't know about it, you've been warned about it. And once your own accessibility advisory committee has, like the committees, similar committees in other cities, have warned their cities not to allow e-scooters in, then instead of hearing Mr. Schaefer and his colleagues saying, oh, we've got new technology, oh, we've got new technology, please essentially trust us. Uh, let the staff work it out with us. Uh, respectfully, that's not the way uh, we say it should work. Instead, you should send it back and say, once you've come back, you can show us the technology, you can demonstrate it, not just to one of us on a couple of rides, but with proper objective critical scrutiny to show that the danger will be eliminated, then, uh, then you can have this conversation. Let me conclude by just pointing you to the fact that the Report by city staff has two fatal flaws, we say. The first is, and I think you heard from city staff's presentation. Okay, so people with disabilities are saying don't allow it, but there are benefits. In other words, our accessibility is being weighed. Our safety is being weighed against uh, what they think are other benefits. Safety and accessibility under our uh, human rights code and our charter rights come first. So that's the first fatal flaw. The second fatal flaw is their solutions aren't solutions. City staff didn't tell you that one of their solutions, parroting the e-scooter corporate lobbyists, is to put Braille on the e-scooter. Braille on the e-scooter. So I, as a blind person, supposed to run at 20 kilometers an hour after something that races by and start feeling out there in case like or I was tripping over one of these e-scooters and then e-scooters. I'm supposed to grope around and start feeling for Braille because it would be helpful information reported. It's laughable if it wasn't so offensive. Similarly, the beeping option, you heard about the beeping option. They worked with a, a committee of people with disabilities and as the report says, they didn't find an appropriate level. They did not find an appropriate level. So you've been told, oh, let us do it. We'll find an appropriate level. No. So don't have this come back to you until they can say they worked with people with disabilities and they've in fact established an appropriate level. So, and I could take you through all these other proposals. 15 minutes to collect the scooter. It's Ms. Park. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I gotta tell you, that means 15 minutes of danger to people with disabilities. That's 15 minutes more danger than you should be allowing. And that is 15 minutes after it's reported. What if it's not reported? You've heard about, oh, the GPS, they can prove that they are right. Great. 10 the seconds, if you could please wrap up. I will wrap up. I'll say, if they had technology that proved that they could not make sure that no one will ever ride on the sidewalk, Thing, it's new technology. Keep on saying it's new technology. 
So we say, well, please bring this back. And we can actually read all their documents because there's so much more we want to be able to say if we can read it. But let us come back to you. And tell staff to come back to you. Not with this hope. David, thank you very much for your delegation today. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, uh, we'll move over to, uh, I don't, uh, oh, um, just be, before Eli asks a question, I do have a, a two quick questions to staff. Uh, Jeff McEwen, um, I, I remember being in a few ACC meetings. I just want to know how many touch points you've had with the ACC and also what what platform do they use uh, to be able to do the meeting? I, I thought we used Zoom last time. Um, yes, Chair, we did use Zoom last time. Um, we've met with uh, the accessible stakeholders uh, at least five times over the, over the course of last year. Um, and then we had two um, meetings with them, one in, in uh, December where we talked about, we did a run up of the um, of the year end results. And then we met with them again in February to go over our recommendations to this committee. So um, all the information that you, you have before you, we have also previously discussed with them. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Councillor uh, Elshinter, you had something? Uh, it's just a question for Dave because his sound was cut out. Does he have his presentation written? He can email it to us so we can look at it. I just feel bad we didn't catch most of his presentation because he was cutting out. Yes. Um, this is David Lepofsky. I've submitted a brief. Yes. Um, the key point, if, if you didn't hear me, then even more so, we need to do this on a platform that is accessible. You're using Zoom webinar. It has accessibility problems. If you've had prior meetings with Zoom, meetings it's a different platform and it's extremely accessible i use it multiple times a day i ask for a chance to speak to this committee where i can actually ensure that you can hear me that is a basic basic request when our safety and accessibility is at stake uh just david just to be uh, very clear i've confirmed with uh the clerks it's the exact same platform we use for ACC. So uh, we will bring this up to, to staff during staff questioning at the end to ensure that there is a compliance and uh, standardization across the board. Uh, so there will be a copy of the presentation on the SharePoint drive, I believe, Caitlin, about the submission. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, okay, the written submission has been shared with all members and is Perfect. on the SharePoint drive. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Philip, thank you very much for coming out today. I really look forward to your presentation. Uh, thanks, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, I'll be reading, I'll be switching my screen. So if you need to interrupt me, just uh, unmute yourselves and let me know, because I can't see you while I'm reading my notes. Uh, so Chair Tierney, uh, Vice Chair Leeper, members of the Transportation Committee. Uh, my name is Phil Turcott. I'm Chair of the Accessibility Advisory Committee for our city. Uh, before I begin my formal remarks, as a settler on these lands, I wish to acknowledge the privilege that I have to live, work, and play on them, and that they are the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg Nation. The advisory committee has learned a lot about e-scooters over the past two summers. It's our experiences and our expertise that led us to pass a motion by a vote of seven to one to advise council not to extend the e-scooters pilot for a third summer and to withdraw Ottawa from the province's e-scooters e pilot project. That motion is in staff's report. I want to turn first to the dissenting views of our vice chair, Brian Wade, as his views are important and they deserve your attention. The vice chair supports the continuation of this pilot project for a third year. In his view, the proposal before you would address the safety issues that we've raised consistently over the last two summers. And he also feels that e-scooters can serve as mobility aids for some within the disability community and that the e-scooter pilot should continue for those reasons. I'll turn now in the time that I have uh, to the views of the majority of the advisory committee. It's our view that unfortunately, the experience of the last two summers uh, even, and even the recommendations before you show that there's no viable pathway to making e-scooters safe enough for Ottawa. From the very beginning, we've raised four areas of concern, improper parking, noise emission, enforcement, and private e-scooters. So I'll discuss each of these. With respect to improper parking, our comment to staff in preparation for this report was clear. 
Furniture zone parking is a non-starter from an inaccessibility perspective because it creates incentives to mispark e-scooters on sidewalks. Unfortunately, the proposal that you have before you would continue furniture zone parking. As staff mentioned, 83% of survey respondents encountered a misparked e-scooter in 2021, which was a 14% increase over 2022. This alone is reason enough not to continue the pilot project for 2022, because it shows that despite all the efforts put into public education, user training by providers and enforcement, park, simply being able to park in furniture zones leads to misparking. Improved technologies in 2022 might be able to reduce some misparking, but would only work if sidewalks everywhere without furniture zones have been fenced off in provider applications. We've heard today that that's not a guarantee that's going to be in the staff's proposal. The only feasible option to address misparking would be to only allow corralled parking in designated spaces, but that's not what's being proposed to you today. In terms of noise emission, uh, as we've identified in the past, the illegal riding of e-scooters on sidewalks unfortunately happens. As the stats showed you, 79% of respondents encountered sidewalk ridings, 64% of those felt unsafe before of the, because of this, and importantly, 45% of respondents felt that sidewalk riding had not improved over 2020. Blind pedestrians in particular told us how dangerous this is for them, since they can't tell if an e-scooter if an e is riding on the sidewalk. And they also raised important questions before our committee about the fact that uh, potential injuries to guide dogs and service animals from illegal sidewalk riding. An injured guide dog that is unable to work could take years to replace, and that's an essential feature for uh, an essential service for a blind pedestrian who uses a guide dog. For these reasons, we've been firm in the last two summers that audio that e-scooters should only be allowed if they're capable of making an audible sound to provide warning to pedestrians, whether it's on sidewalks or on multi-use pathways. While we commend staff for recommending such a sound, what we learned from our experience is that there is no consensus yet on what sound works. All of the sounds that have been identified today don't work. And there's no guarantee before you that the, that the sound staff proposed to develop would actually be sufficient. In terms of complaints, um, really to be frank, uh, being able to complain about a misparked or illegally ridden e-scooter is of little comfort to people with disabilities when if you've been able to undo, to not get to your errands before you encountered a scooter, or if you've tripped over one, or if you've had a close call with e-scooters zooming by on a sidewalk, complaining after the fact just isn't enough. And particularly, uh, blind pedestrians told our committee how impractical these complaint mechanisms are for them, since they wouldn't be able to see uh, what scooter uh, company or what company a scooter belongs to when it's zooming past them on the sidewalk, nor would they able to be, be able to find the information they need when the scooter's tipped over or when they've tripped over it to be able to make a complaint after the fact. The city's data clearly shows how prevalent misuse is and how often it goes unreported. It's unclear that any of the improvements brought forward by staff today would actually reduce misuse, certainly not in the complaints mechanism. And finally, if time allows me, um, I'll just comment on private e-scooters because they're the reason that we've recommended that the city fully withdraw from the provincial pilot project. Participating in the pilot project also means that private scooters are allowed to operate in Ottawa. And even when the pilot project for commercial scooters, when the season's over, uh, the fact that we are in the pilot project in Ontario means that e private e-scooters can still function, even when there's no commercial e-scooters on the streets. For us, uh, privately owned e-scooters pose all of the same safety and accessibility risks that commercial e-scooters do. And uh, even if we accept that there was adequate technology in the marketplace today to uh, address a lot of the issues we've provided to you, uh, which we don't accept, but even if we did, uh, none of those technologies would be mandatory for private e-scooters. They would have none of the benefits of the technology that some companies say that they can bring to the market, they would not be required to make an audible noise, nor to my knowledge does any e-scooter provider that currently sells them on the market provide any of these technologies to the broader public. 
for that reason, private e-scooters are fundamentally even more unsafe for uh, pedestrians with disabilities and warrant us withdrawing from the provincial pilot project at this time. In closing, our recommendations to you as your advisory committee is that you should be looking for innovative technologies that include persons with disabilities, not exclude them. You should welcome technology that removes accessibility barriers, not creates them. And finally, you should demand technology that makes our streets safer for seniors and disabled pedestrians, not less safe. There may well be micro mobility technologies that meet all of these goals, but e-scooters unfortunately are not one of them. We urge you to send a strong signal to disabled Ottawans that their safety and sense of inclusion in our city matters. We urge you to recommend against adopting staff's proposal. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Phil. I've always uh, enjoyed taking part uh, in your uh, meetings. Oh, oh, we have a uh, Councilor Minard has a question. Well, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Phil, for being here. I just wanted to go into, I'm sorry if you hear some background here. Kids sorry. just got home not too long ago. Um, I just wanted to go into um, uh, some, some more on the parking on the sidewalks. Cause I know we've, we talked about this uh, when I attended the last um, uh, ACC, um, excuse me, AAC. And um, I just wanted to talk about that particular function because that is the majority of complaints that, that we receive. Um, the vast majority are, are the, the missed park scooters uh, and the issue for people with accessibilities and others who are walking on the sidewalk. So um, Councilor Leaper's proposal, I, I understand uh, uh, what you're saying. Councilor Leaper's proposal tries to address some of that um, uh, and have these park in parking spaces. I just want, if you're able to go into a bit more detail on sure. that particular proposal, um, and what, if there, is there any um, method that you see that would allow for e-scooters to, to uh, proliferate in Ottawa uh, that would be supportable? Um, or is it a, a non-starter right from the get-go? Uh, and of course, you'll, you'll know, I, I really want to see a bike share in Ottawa. This is something that, you know, we, we really need to see in the future uh, is a bike share. And one of the reasons staff have cited that we don't have a bike share is because we have an e-scooter pilot. So I'd uh, love your thoughts on that as well. Sure, um, I think there are three or four points I would make uh, on that. The first point is I think uh, Councillor Leeper's motion tries to get at the heart of the issue, which is that if you allow them to e-scooters to be parked near a sidewalk, then naturally the incentive is just there to uh, park them in the wrong place or they may fall over. There's a bunch of reasons why they would wind up in the right of way. Um, and Frankly, I think my assessment is that that's part of the business model, not the misparking, but the very idea of an e-scooter is that you can take it from point A to point B, go from door to door. Uh, and so I, you know, I have questions about whether the business model, the very idea of the e-scooter, uh, really allows for something uh, outside of, of um, furniture zone parking. And if that's the case, uh, if furniture zone, park zone parking is essential to the business model, then we say that's not compatible with an accessible city. Um, the challenge, uh, unfortunately, with Councillor Leeper's motion uh, is that it would conflict with past advisory committee motions on preserving on-street parking for people who um, hold an accessible parking permit. Uh, we've already stated to the city that uh, there's not enough parking for people with disabilities on our streets. Um, and we've asked them not to take away any of that uh, parking that could be eligible for accessible parking permit holders. So that's on-street parking that's available to the general public, but also uh, no parking zones where we're allowed to park. Um, so uh, I would love to support Councillor Leeper's motion, uh, but without that nuance of trying to find a balance between preserving parking spaces and losing some, I think what it's pointing to uh, is corralled parking, so only allowing parking in specific spaces. And perhaps those corrals could be certain on-street spots. That might be something that could work. The challenge there uh, is that Montreal uh, tried this. And when they tried this, they had a 20% compliance rate. Uh, so again, I think that feeds into the question of, is the business model, the idea behind these fundamentally incompatible with accessibility? And unfortunately, I'm, I think so far, 
uh, the question is yes, because a lot of this is you, it's fundamentally about the user, right? You can have all of the great technology that you want if you can prove that it works. But if people find a way to mispark them, they will mispark them or misuse them, they will misuse them. Uh, and what we've seen from the last two summers is that there's been a lot of training. I don't think e-scooter providers or the city could have done more to educate people on how to use e-scooters properly. And despite that, the rates of misuse increased from one summer to the next. Um, on the bike share program, um, I know some people have said, you know, there's inherent dangers with bicycles as well, uh, which I agree. There's, there's a lot of improvements we can do for cycling infrastructure and for cycling. Um, but bicycles are already in our city and that cycling infrastructure already exists. What we're talking about here is a new technology that we have the ability to stop now before it creates problems. And that's, I think, what we're asking for. Um, but absolutely, uh, we're not anti-technology. Um, I think you know, the disability community is one that innovates in technology all the time. Um, but we're just saying, we'd like you to look at other options. Um, and also, if I can say, we'd like you to look at options that are actually inclusive of people with disabilities. Uh, you know, uh, the vice chair has said that some people with disabilities can use these scooters, uh, but wheelchair users can't. Uh, people who, who have difficulty balancing can't, uh, blind pedestrians can't. I, I would hope that there's better technologies out there, perhaps adaptive bikes that can be rented. Um, you know, maybe that's something to look at, but e-scooters so far don't really seem to, to cater to the disability community. I hope that that answers your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Furry, then uh, Councillor Luloff. Je suis en train de modifier puis merci de ta présentation. Euh, merci à toi. Euh, je, voulais, je voulais revenir sur euh, quelques points. Euh, je, le, le dernier point que tu as, tu as soulevé, c'est vraiment au niveau de l'utilisation. Puis ça, c'est un, une, une constatation euh, très, très vraie. Là, donc, je ne veux pas, euh, je veux pas euh, minimiser son impact ou euh, l'enjeu. Mais euh, mes questions sont plutôt euh, spécifiques aux, aux deux enjeux cible que j'ai signifié euh, dans, euh, dans mes commentaires, dans le rapport, puis aussi dans mes, les, mon intervention au niveau des motions. Au niveau du stationnement, je suis curieux. Euh, si, si, la, si les éléments technologiques font que le Clearway euh, est, euh, est respecté, si euh, les équipes interviennent en temps réel, autant au niveau des, des pourvoyeurs que euh, de la ville, euh, avec les amendes que la Ville a, a signifiées, un petit peu comme les shopping carts, qui étaient aussi un enjeu d'accessibilité euh, il y a quand même plusieurs années. Euh, je me questionne au niveau des sta du stationnement des e-scooters. E euh, que, Quelles demeurent les inquiétudes, à part que ces éléments-là, euh, si ces éléments-là, il y a des failles? Je, comp je comprends que ces éléments-là, tels que présentés, euh, ont des failles, ça, on parle d'un autre, autre, euh, autre aspect, mais si ces éléments-là fonctionnent, quel, euh, quel élément demeure au niveau du stationnement? Euh, donc, pour nous autres, ce serait, ce serait vraiment de, euh, de s'assurer que ça fonctionne. Puis je pense que l'inquiétude qu'on a, c'est que ce qui est proposé euh, par la Ville dirait que... Euh, on va regarder ces composantes-là de, de quelqu'un qui voudrait participer dans, dans le projet s'il continue l'année prochaine. Mais euh, d'après ce que j'ai vu, ce n'est pas une exigence critique qui voudrait dire que euh, il y aurait peut-être peut autre considération qui viendrait à être plus importante que les questions d'accessibilité quand, qu quand les, la ville évaluerait le tout. Donc, si on pourrait avoir peut-être... Euh, une direction ou un engagement de, de la ville que les normes d'accessibilité à la base vont être essentielles. Ça pourrait venir nous, nous rassurer euh, qu'on ne va pas mettre d'autres considérations plus hautes que l'accessibilité euh, quand on va décider le, les, ben les permis à émettre s'il y en a à émettre. OK, euh, parfait. Je demande... Oh, je suis oui. désolé. Je suis désolé, non, euh, je... J'ai demandé, demandé cet élément-là à la Ville tout à l'heure parce que d'après moi, quand je lis le rapport, c'est pas mal euh, les, euh, le, le processus d'approvisionnement, c'est « devra, devra, devra » et non « pourrait ». Donc, je vais, je vais le clarifier tout à l'heure. Euh, L'élément au niveau de la, de la, du mouvement, euh, 
assumant que euh, le mouvement de la, les éléments de, de la route sont appliqués. Euh, je parlais des, des enjeux là, au niveau euh, des policiers tout ça tout à l'heure. Euh, Est-ce que les aspects sonores sont sensiblement l'élément le, risque? Parce que je, quand je pense à un vélo, par exemple, sur, dans une voie cyclable ou même sur une, une rue, euh, j'y vois pas moins d'enjeux euh, potentiels. Donc, je suis curieux, le, assumant que les règles de la route sont suivies, est-ce que les éléments sonores sont si respectés, si obli obligés, euh, sont satisfaisants? Puis là, moi, moi j'essaie de comprendre. Là, je, je, on a, on a un, un, une présentation. Je sais, je sais que la communauté d'accessibilité a été très engagée. J'ai été à plusieurs rencontres, quelques-unes dont tu as fait partie, qui est vraiment, nous autres, on n'en veut pas des scooters, puis je le comprends. Mais moi, au, au, aujourd'hui, comme les membres du comité, on est, on est devant une présentation qui dit on veut euh, euh, voir le projet pilote. Donc, dans ce contexte-là, je te demande les questions à ce niveau-là. Je comprends que la, la communauté d'accessibilité a peut-être une perspective autre. Je la respecte, mais euh, moi, moi je, je suis vraiment spécifique sur le rapport qui nous est présenté aujourd'hui. Oui, absolument. Puis, euh, ce que je pourrais dire pour l'élément sonore, s'il fonctionne, euh, ça répond à un critère majeur et une, une, une inquiétude majeure qu'on a eu les deux étés passés. Donc, ça pourrait être un, un, événement, un élément qui est fondament, fondamentalement différent euh, pour un, un, un été futur. Euh, C'est sûr que... Euh, il y a deux questions. L'une est une question de sécurité. Euh, et donc, s'il y a la technologie qui parvient à interdire euh, la présence des, des trottinettes sur euh, les trottoirs, ça, ça va répondre à, à cette crainte-là. Euh, il y a quand même la question de, de l'aspect sonore pour ce qu'on appelle, et là, j'oublie le terme en français, euh, mais les multi-use path, multi path, multi pathways. Bon. Euh, donc, pour nous, tout ce qu'on a entendu, c'est qu'à cause de la vitesse euh, des trottinettes, c'est essentiel que l'élément sonore soit là pour prévenir euh, les piétons euh, que, que, le, que le scooter est, est là parmi eux. Donc, si l'élément sonore fonctionne, je pense que ça répondrait à ces craintes-là. Euh, bien entendu, qu'on qu puisse interdire euh, les trottinettes euh, sur, euh, sur les trottoirs. Et je, réponds, je rajouterai juste euh, tes motions, euh, je supporte essentiellement. Je pense qu'il aiderait à combler les, certaines des failles dans le rapport euh, de la ville. Et euh, ce que j'ai compris d'une de, 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 de des motions, c'est que justement, on demanderait aux fournisseurs de faire le, le geofencing dans l'ensemble de la ville. Puis je pense que ça, c'est essentiel. Euh, il faut que les, euh, les applications soient capables de savoir est-ce qu'on est sur un trottoir où il y a, un, il y a une zone, de, un furniture zone ou non. S'il n'y en a pas, on ne devrait pas être capable d'arrêter un, une trottinette là. Ça, je pense qu'on s'entend sur ça. Mais la seule façon que ça peut réellement fonctionner, c'est si l'application connaît ces sections-là. Puis je ne pense pas qu'il y a une autre façon de faire qu'exiger que, que ça, ça, ça soit fait sur l'ensemble de la ville où ce que les trottinettes vont être permises. Okay. Ben, regarde, je te, je te remercie beaucoup de ton intervention, puis de clarification, je vais, je vais faire le suivi tout à l'heure euh, sur, sur les éléments qu'on discute. Merci. Parfait, puis merci pour euh, la chance de répondre en français aussi. Bien, merci. Euh, Conseiller Lulof, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup, M. le Président. Hey, Phil, thank you so much uh, for coming out again. I know that the AAC has spent quite a bit of time uh, on this issue over the course of the last four years. Um, and I just want to extend my appreciation for your engagement on it. I think that the feedback that you have provided uh, to, uh, to us here at the City of Ottawa has in, improved the pilot two years in a row. I want to make sure um, that if this is approved today, uh, that it is not an indication Uh, that council or this committee does not take uh, your concerns seriously. Uh, we certainly do. I think that there is a general willingness uh, among council to see um, how the further improvements uh, to the technology and the extremely tight uh, changes that were made to the ability of, uh, of these operators to operate in our city Uh, play out over the course of this summer. So I just want to make sure that, uh, that I get that out there, that it's, it's not an indictment uh, of, uh, of the concerns that have been raised by the AAC. 
and I wanted to give you an opportunity um, uh, to, to wrap up on, on any of the, uh, any thoughts that you have on the two motions uh, that are before us, um, whether or not you believe uh, that, uh, that they strengthen um, the report, uh, and just to, uh, you know, give you an opportunity to provide your general thoughts on, on both motions that you may not have been able to through questions and answers. Uh, thank you, Councillor. And um, I'm happy to have the chance to, to speak to the motions again. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if the committee has simultaneous interpretation, so I'm happy to, you know, to provide some of my answers in English as well. Um, first, I, I'd like to echo uh, your point as well that um, our position as a committee is not an indictment in any way of, of staff and the work that they've done. They've been excellent. Uh, I think this, uh, this consultation has taken a lot of their time, it's taken a lot of our time, uh, but they have really been responsive. Uh, a lot of the changes you, you saw today, uh, I think you know, there was a suggestion of where did the 15 minute response time come from? That's an ask from us. Um, a lot of the things that you've seen today in staff's report are things that, that we've asked for. Uh, and to be frank with you, um, until we got to the last, our last meeting, uh, where we had some of the recommendations. And to be fair, we didn't have the full recommendations and we didn't see the report before it was tabled. Um, so there's some stuff in the report that's new that we hadn't seen um, in terms of the technology and how well it could work. Um, but I'll say to that, that before we, we got, or at the last meeting, I had been prepared to say, I think you've, you've listened to us, you've done enough, thank you. We'll see how it goes for a third summer. What really changed my mind, and I think what really changed a lot of everyone else's minds, uh, was that all of the delegations we had and all of the written comments we had from the disability community told us, please don't do this again. We don't have enough confidence in the new technology. We don't have enough confidence that there can be enough parameters built in, enough safety built in that will actively prevent barriers to our safety. And I, I think I wanna stress that we're not just talking about making something safer, we're talking about making it safe, you know, point final, as we'd say in French. Um, and I, th I think for me, those questions are still unanswered. Um, and the part, the, I would hesitate to leave that to a, we'll see what the RFP process brings out. Um, there's, there's a danger there and the, the part that I, um, I was asking Councillor uh, Fleury about, uh, you know, the, the getting clarification on where these requirements would stand um, is perhaps my my lawyer brain, but you know, if I I would like to see the commitment that if none of these are met, there's no permit, and that there is there's not a possibility that something else will overweigh uh, those considerations. Um, so if staff could provide through you uh, that clarification, I'd be I, I would welcome it. Um, and the last point, um, I think, to, to Councillor Leeper's motion, and I know that Councillor Leeper has his hand up. Um, I think what it, what it shows really is that the, the better option is, is designated corralled parking somewhere um, to again to remove the incentive to to uh, to park to mispark them, uh, or if the technology fails, right? If it if it the the challenge is if if we find that the technology doesn't work then the barriers will already have been lived. Uh, the inconvenience to people's days will already uh, be there. Uh, people will already have, you know, had to reroute themselves, were not able to do their errands. People may have tripped over them. Um, and the, yeah, the last point is, you know, only 16% of people who encountered these issues actually reported them. And I bet you that most of that 16% is people with disabilities. Um, but to me, that, that also reports that, you know, people just kind of got used to seeing them all over misused and people don't do much. And I, I'm just, I think overall, sorry, I'm kind of rambling. It's late in the day. <laughs> I appreciate how hard you guys work. Um, but um, it's just, we, we do have concerns about whether or not this could actually work in the real world. Uh, and I think that's, that's where we went to say that the risks of it not working are too high for what we're asking the disability community to go through if it doesn't work. Great, uh, thank you for that. And just, oh, just so you know, uh, Matt is there, he's having a small video issue. Uh, he is partaking. We just I wanna am make here. sure we have enough people on this call. Thank you. Just, for, uh, for just, just one last question, Chair. Just one oh, last comment. 
Oh, no, no, that's, it's my fault because you, you can't see me. Um, so into these so, Phil, I, I completely take your point uh, when it comes to the parking issue as well. Um, whereas there, there, there may not be designated street parking uh, for accessible vehicles, the closest parking spot to you know, a venue or a restaurant uh, may be the most attractive place for someone to pull up something like an accessible van uh, because of its proximity. Uh, so I just wanna make sure that, uh, that you know that, that we take your point very well. Perfect, thank you, Councillor. Great, Vice Chair Lieber. Thank you very much, and uh, Philip. Thank you very much for the uh, the presentation. Obviously, I share the accessibility concerns. Um, I think I'm a little bit more confident than you are with respect to sidewalk riding. Uh, I've seen some very impressive technology, and I would be willing to uh, let it go for another year. But it is the Miss Parks uh, Miss Park scooters that I think are uh, um, a serious accessibility consideration from what I heard and I was able to participate in the CNIB uh, workshop uh, months ago now I can't even remember when that was. Um, with respect to my motion, um, like I'm open to some nuance on it. Uh, but the key piece of nuance, I think, is that I think it's implicit in the motion, and maybe it's not, is that I'm not suggesting that scooters would be allowed to park in a no stopping area, which uh, is parking that would ordinarily be used, um, uh, or is ordinarily permitted to be used by those who have uh, permission to do it. Uh, so there would only be in areas that um, uh, would normally permit parking by people who don't have an exception to park uh, for some other reason. Um, the And then the other piece of nuance, I guess, would be um, it's possible that if more people use scooters to get to shops and they park on the street and they behave, I guess, and, and park scooters close to each other, one scooter in a block should leave more parking spaces than were previously available. And that person who's on a scooter is probably visiting uh, the main street for the same reason that anybody else is. They're, they're going for a coffee, they're going to a store, they're going I wanna try to understand a bit better the objection to losing any street parking when in my mind, a scooter is a substitute for a car. Sure, and I appreciate that point. Um, and perhaps that's, so the way I had understood your motion, I would guess there would be two parts. The first part would be that the only option would be on street. So they we would take away furniture zone parking and say e-scooters have to be parked just like a vehicle. So that was the first part that I had understood. To which, if that's, if that's your intent, then that answers our concern about furniture zone parking and our view that it's not a non-starter. Yeah. Um, the concern I would have is if people are using one parking spot per e-scooter, right? And then we you have this situation where if you have five e-scooters, that's five vehicle spots. Yep. Um, there may be some ways to work around that. I mean, I can, <laughs> not to make more work for, for our committee, but uh, you know, we would remain available, of course, to work with staff uh, on designing uh, an option that would work for on-street parking. Um, I think what we would want to perhaps avoid is that it's a it's a free for all, and that you know we could see an entire city's block filled up with e-scooters because then I'm sure people who come to the downtown with vehicles for a variety of reasons would also <laughs> uh, not be happy about that. But if there if there's a way to address that, should your motion pass, uh, our committee is is more than happy to work uh, with city staff on that. I think what I had in mind was that um, uh, almost education where if somebody has parked their scooter next to the curb uh, and you're coming along into park in the same block, please park your scooter next to the other one that's already parked, um, yeah. right? Uh, but we also know that bad behavior is, uh, is somewhat endemic um, uh, in terms of every road user's uh, behavior. So, uh, no, that's, uh, that's interesting. The other consideration I had was that I... I'd like to make sure that there is an adequate amount of scooter parking available uh, in places where people want to go. And so, um, you know, any given block of uh, Bank Street, Elgin Street, of um, Wellington, of Richmond Road, uh, is potentially someplace where somebody might want to visit a business or, or, or park their scooter. Um, rather than designating 
a scooter corral in every block in order to ensure that there's attractive scooter parking, which would take away a significant amount of parking. I think the BIAs would uh, have want to have discussions with me. Um, it's easier just to sort of let it be a little bit more organic than, uh, than putting it in place. But I am willing to uh, consider any any amendments uh, to my motion before we vote on it uh, to take into consideration the uh, the comments that you've made. So I appreciate those. Thank you. Thanks. And if I could make uh, one last comment, since I think Thank you're you. my last question, so I'll, I'll take the chance to do it. Um, the only other element um, that I think is not addressed by staff's report at all, and perhaps you may seek the opportunity to ask them questions about it, uh, is as we've raised about private e-scooters. Uh, we don't mean to bash private e-scooter users at all. I know, Councillor Leeper, you have one of your own. Um, but the real challenge that we have is that there would be a disparity between these new hyper-techno-centric e-scooters that do all these wonderful things to remove accessibility barriers if the technology works, and then privately owned e-scooters that have none of these technologies. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I mean, and I'm not sure how you fix that issue, um, but I just wanted to flag it as kind of, it's a big question mark for us that that's not, um, that's not raised. And again, my understanding from staff is that even outside of the commercial season, e-scooters can still operate. So, you know, we don't necessarily get to a point where we can say, ah, uh, okay, the season's over. We don't have to worry about these barriers anymore. E-scooters, private e-scooters can operate year a year long. Yeah, they're, um, it's, I can't ride mine right now. It goes away, it went away as soon as it began to snow. It's, uh, it's not right safe to ride in, uh, in the snow. Um, but I do have questions for staff about the relative behaviors of, of private e-scooters versus um the rentals. My impression is that the private scooters uh, tend to be ridden by, uh, you know, very, very good people like me, uh, who obey the rules. Uh, we don't park them. Um, we don't park them in a furniture zone of, of or uh, on across the street because you know they're 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 expensive and we don't want to have them kicked around. Um, but I will be asking about that. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Philip, for uh, coming out today. All right. Next delegation is Isaac uh, Ransom uh, from Neuron. And I believe, I'm not sure if there's a, Isaac will have to inform us if there was a presentation. I don't think there was from my notes. We'll just wait for Isaac to join. I'll, I'll give you 20 bucks for your uh, scooter, Jeff. Uh, I'm here, oh. Councillor. I appear to be having a, oh, there we go. Uh, there is a presentation you. that was submitted, um, uh, Chair Journey. Uh, oh, here, here it is right now. Perfect. There you go. Perfect. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members for having us, uh, I guess, this evening now. Uh, I am joined by my, our, my colleague and general manager for Canada, Ankush Carwall. I'm not sure if he's been promoted yet in the meeting, but he is on hand to uh, help uh, answer any questions this afternoon and provide insight into the presentation. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank staff uh, for this report and working with them this season. It's uh, been a, a great adventure and uh, hopefully we uh, are able to return to Ottawa uh, this coming season. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here we're just providing a quick overview of the city of Ottawa for this year and just some of the, uh, the key findings that we thought might be of interest uh, to committee members. Um, you know, we had a, quite the uptake this year as a new uh, operator in the city of Ottawa. And we saw some uh, pretty interesting results in terms of user behaviors. And I think similar to the presentation you saw before, we're starting to see a lot of users use these for everyday transportation needs. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we're really proud about in the city of Ottawa is that, you know, we've done a lot of firsts uh, within the city uh, in terms of safety. Uh, this includes being the only voice uh, assisted e-scooter that's on the street in both official languages. This is part of our approach to ensuring that every user um, uh, knows who we are and is able to contact us if they have an issue. Um, so the scooter does speak to you uh, during the trip. It helps inform you where you're going and creates a safer ride. Similarly, when the scooter is parked, if you interact with it, uh, it provides you with contact information on how to reach us so that we can resolve any issues you might be having. having. Uh, and this is a pretty, um, pretty popular feature, not only in Ottawa, but other cities in terms of reaching out to us to ensure that uh, we can respond to any concerns. 
Uh, we also brought in Canada's first upright parking enforcement. This means that you couldn't end a ride unless the scooter was parked upright. Um, so that was a feature that was in Ottawa this year. And of course the helmet lock to ensure that we were able to provide the safest ride possible on the streets. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a quick overview. Uh, you know, our, our CEO couldn't be here today, but um, you know, we embrace the feedback. We're looking forward to the discussion today with committee. Um, we have, um, you know, really taken this to heart and we'll talk a little bit about how we've done this in the city of Ottawa over this season. Next slide, please. So one of the things that's in the staff report is around QR code reporting and how this makes it easy to report e-scooter issues. Um, I just wanted to flag the committee, this is the process and, and what is on our e-scooter today. There are a multitude of ways of reaching out to Neuron Mobility in order to inform us of an issue with an e-scooter. Um, not only do we have the phone number and email, um, if you were to touch the stem while it's parked, you would be able to do it uh, by touching the braille if you read braille. Uh, and the QR code is the most popular reporting method. There are no barriers to reporting with us. Um, you don't need to have the app. You don't need to send a picture. You simply just need to scan the QR code and we are able to resolve the issue. Um, and this is the flow of what it looks like for the user um, on the street. And in the back end, uh, we are then informed that there's an issue with the e-scooter. So this is, uh, you know, as you may have seen, um, a lot of, a lot of um, reporting. Um, this is a result of that because we've taken a leadership position on wanting to know what's going on with our e-scooters on the street and wanting to respond to those. And on average, our response time is 35 minutes. And we look forward to uh, meeting an increased uh, response time of 15 minutes this season. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we did in Ottawa as a first this year as well is 100% of our fleet and 100% of the city um, received our new tech into trial this year. This is our HALT technology, uh, which detects a scooter's uh, location within 10 centimeters uh, and it has a response time of 0.3 seconds. Um, this will provide unparalleled uh, management within the city for e-scooters in terms of sidewalk geofencing and parking uh, with our new technology that we're bringing into the city of Ottawa. Uh, we've had that in market for a while now, and uh, we hope to uh, you know, return to the city with the same tech this year and improve upon um, our trial of the technology from last season. Uh, next slide, please. The other first that we brought to Ottawa this year uh, was that we were the first to bring the AVAS system or this noise emittance. Um, the reason why we're able to do this is that we um, design and build our own e-scooter, uh, which allows us to have unparalleled control over adding features into an e-scooter quickly. Um, we did a three-month trial with 100 e-scooters with trips that originated in the Glebe in Little Italy. Uh, we developed a dozen, a dozen sounds, and we brought four of those into trial this year. Uh, and we are the only large-scale project of this nature in the city this season, um, and this was always on. Um, so we've been able to share that information with the city and hopefully these key learnings will help inform this program for next season. Uh, next slide, please. These are just some of the many features that you'll find within the Neuron e-scooter. Um, I suspect this will be circulated amongst committee members following this uh, presentation today. But as you can see, you know, safety is at the heart of everything we do. We are continually innovating and continually making the ride safer. Uh, and there's a lot of technology which is in our e-scooter uh, in the current model and with the new models that are in, the, in now with the enhanced geo, uh, geofencing technology that will be on the streets next year uh, that will be able to de do, detect things like dangerous riding, um, our safety center, our parking audit features, and of course AVAS. So uh, a number of good things coming back to Ottawa next season if selected as an operator. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what's in store for next year? Um, obviously our enhanced sidewalk control uh, will be a, a key part of, uh, you know, building on uh, next year's program or this year's program now, AVAS and QR code reporting. Um, that includes our enhanced AI powered operations for speedy resolutions and missed park scooters and a full suite of parking technologies, including the high accuracy parking stations. So uh, Ankush and I look forward to answering questions on these today and we appreciate uh, you taking the time to have us before the committee today. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I see uh, Councillor Fleury has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and Isaac, it, it's interesting to hear from you. Uh, it sounds like a rosy picture, but when you see the staff presentation with over a thousand complaints and 
I've seen firsthand uh, the lack of real-time responses by by Neuron. I struggle to to uh, to to see how we're on in the same planet. So, how how can you respond clearly to why did Neuron get so many complaints this year, and and why uh, what were the limitations to have real-time responses? Uh, which were required under uh, the the environment last year, but not fulfilled. Sure. Um, so there's a few things there, and I think Ankush might be able to add more to the answer to this question. But uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the um, the the issue around uh, more complaints, as you saw in the report, has mainly to do with our QR code reporting. This means, um, compared to other operators, the barriers to reporting are frictionless. You basically just open your camera app and you can report an e-scooter. Um, so this means that you don't need an app. You don't need to send a picture. You don't need to go on a customer service line. Uh, you don't need to spend a lengthy amount of time reporting an e-scooter. You simply turn your camera app on and submit the complaint. And then we respond. Our response time average in the city of Ottawa is 35 minutes uh, this season. We understand that that's not maybe as, ac as timely as other operators. Uh, but, uh, you know, we look forward to the challenge and we, we appreciate the feedback and we hope to do better next year if we return, but we were within the 60 minute allotment that, uh, was prescribed by the city this year. Um, if there are issues, you know, uh, specific ones that, uh, uh, were of note that weren't resolved quickly, I'd be happy to look into those and, and take that information offline to see why that may have occurred. But uh, in general, um, our complaints uh, tend to be quite a bit higher because of how easy we make it to complain and the information that's provided to our riders um, through the app, through the 1-800 number, through email, through the QR code, through the scooter talking to you with the phone number and the complaints that come in through the various channels of the city. Uh, we wanna know when there's an issue. Uh, we're not here to try and say that there aren't going to be issues. If we don't know about it, we can't fix it. And uh, that's the issue there. What I would say though, is if you look at our sidewalk riding numbers, they were zero. Yeah, no, and I can appreciate uh, the, the issue of reporting will completely shift next year because we're centralizing it through the city and I, I will confirm that. So there won't be any discrepancy on the data from, uh, I, I assume there'll be one provider, but if there, there are multiple, that, that issue's gone. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can only speak from my experience, and I'll, although I, I did see uh, your vans going around and dropping a lot of scooters, I did see a lot of abandoned scooters uh, in Sandy Hill, particularly. As you know, they're pretty obvious. They're orange. I, yeah. I, I recognize that you guys are a local company, but I have to say, from my perspective, what I've seen, uh, you know, the helmet was great, but the technology elements are just not not where we need it. Um, and if it was just up to uh, to your organization or Lime, I would not feel comfortable even with the changes today uh, to advance. I, to me, um, you know, I, I think um, the aspects of how people ride, if the direction of the lane, if the lane goes northbound and uh, a rider on, on a neuron is making a southbound movement, that's an illegal movement. That motor should stop. And, and, and that's as much of a violation as riding on a sidewalk, not to minimize the sidewalk riding aspects. And um, I, I felt that there was a lot of units that were bulked together. And although you're saying that your average was 35 minutes, I think you're missing the point, which is if you get a lot of requests, then your average at 35 is quite high. Um, to me, it's, it's looking at the extremes. And I think your extremes will likely show you that units were either moved by residents because they were in crosswalks and on sidewalks or, um, or, or the response just wasn't, uh, wasn't to par. So, you know, I, you, you've made your point on data. I guess I'm rebuttaling saying careful of just generalizing your, 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 your average because that doesn't show the picture of the extreme. And, and I'm struggling with the extreme as a local counselor for the busiest spot of the city. Abandoned scooters, those at crosswalks, those in clearways, Writing uh, against the um, the movement um, to me is, is major issues. I'll find. I'll ask you on one final question. How many riders did you ban last year? I don't know that number off the top of my head. Um, and Kush, who I should be on this call, I don't believe he's been invited in. Would be able to probably answer that, but I can provide that information to you offline. Um, I know there were a number of suspensions last season in the city of Ottawa. That's something that we took very seriously. 
Um, there were warnings and there were suspensions and bannings from our, our, uh, our platform. Uh, so um, I can circle back with your office on that counselor. Um, I, I, don't I that. think for the record, it is important. So uh, Chair, I'd look to you if there is someone that can answer that from Neuron. So yep. I, I'm looking for how many, just so I clarify my question, how many uh, riders did you ban without the city requesting it? So sell from your app by the behavior of that driver, you chose to ban that person. That's the number I'm looking for in Ottawa. Yeah, so um, I could answer that, I'm fine in. Um, so we had a total of about 31 riders who we suspended and we'd warned more than 95 riders um, on repeat cases. And, and for the, your first point, the 31s, none of those were uh, requested by the city? No, these are, so we have our own patrol that goes out on a daily basis. We will take a look at people riding, um, if there is any instance of bad riding, bad parking. Um, the city team will um, have the ability to either send a warning or to ban depending on the level of um, issue that's there. Um, at the same time, these would also be, this would be inclusive of certain complaints that we received directly from uh, other pedestrians around or other reporting mechanisms. Okay, I, I'll, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning to Isaac. To me, if it was just for uh, your organization, I, um, I would move a motion to stop the pilot. I think there, uh, there are technology, there are on the ground resources that were uh, major lacking, which contributed to the two sorts of issues that are structural, how people ride and where they ride and parking. So thank you. Great questions, Councillor Lula. So if I'm um, walking along the sidewalk and I'm blind and I trip over a neuron e-scooter, um, how do I report it? Um, there's a number of ways, um, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, there are a number of ways that you can report a neuron e-scooter um, if you have a visual impairment. Um, the first is it will tell you the 1-800 number. It will speak to you uh, if you were to encounter it uh, just by a small touch. Um, so you would receive that information immediately of what the 1-800 number is. Um, in addition to that, we did work with the Accessibility Committee on a universal Braille uh, sticker uh, that's placed on all of our e-scooters in the same position, so you could receive the information that way. Uh, the other way is that if you did have some site capability, um, our AODA compliant website uh, would work with the scanning of the QR code. Uh, we also look to ensure that the label uh, to read was as large as possible given the space. Um, and uh, obviously you could report through the city as well if there was an issue. So there was a number of avenues um, that we worked with the accessibility community on and, and tried to share that information as best we could uh, to ensure that there was a mechanism to make reports for, for our e-scooters. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you very much. Uh, on to our next delegation, Dr. Kate uh, Rocamini. And we do have two submission documents that are in our drive. Sorry, hello, can you hear me? Oh, hey Kate, yes, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, for giving me the chance to speak to you today uh, about the e-scooters and the city report. I really appreciate it. Um, it is worth noting, as David Lepofsky mentioned, that some of the documents weren't very accessible. I just wanted to point that out in the beginning, so it did give me some trouble in reviewing some of the documentation as a person with sight loss myself. Um, however, I did manage, so I do have some uh, points to raise. First off, uh, to sort of give you the conclusion first, the CNIB uh, recommends that the e-scooter pilot be discontinued. Uh, we are glad to see that city staff have taken some of our recommendations um, to heart and, and are recommending things in the report to improve the e-scooter program, but we feel that it does not go far enough and will not in fact prevent the accessibility and safety barriers that e-scooters pose. 
Uh, first point is the large number of infractions people reported from the end of year survey. Around 80% of people reported both missed parking and sidewalk riding infractions, and the vast majority of them didn't report those um, what they saw. So the numbers of complaints are going to be vastly underreported. Um, we are glad to see that the city is recommending uh, greater enforcement and the um, increase in time to 15 minutes to uh, um, rescue an abandoned scooter, if you will. Uh, however, it's worth noting that that 15 minutes presumably starts once the company is made aware of a, of a scooter, which relies again on citizens to complain, um, which they haven't been. So, and, and the thing is, as someone with a visual impairment myself, it's not a great help to me that an e-scooter is going to be gone in 15 minutes if I've already tripped over it and potentially hurt myself. Um, I would prefer the e-scooter not be, you know, being a danger and tripping hazard in the sidewalk in the first place. Um, and the concern with enforcement is, again, I, I'm worried that while they are increasing enforcement, it's not going to be enough to actually curb the large amount of infractions that we have seen over the last two years. Um, I am also glad to see the city encouraging the entire fleet of e-scooters have the latest proven technology from day one so that we don't end up with something like this year where we saw some e-scooters piloting some technologies for some of the time. Uh, however, what I've seen so far is um, reports from the e-scooter companies about their technology uh, without independent verification. And I worry about what happens if the technology doesn't live up to expectations. Um, Will the uh, e-scooter program continue? What is the, the recourse for that? The report doesn't really specify. And the worry, of course, is that we end up with essentially what we have this year, where some of the e-scooters have some of the technology some of the time, but the majority of them don't. And we're left with the same accessibility barriers and safety hazards that we have had to put up with for the last two years. Uh, in regards to parking, again, I am glad to see the city is planning on um, having more designated parking spaces. I do know the report only suggested about 20 um, new parking spots for e-scooters, and there is going to be a fleet of 900, um, so that doesn't seem adequate. The other point is that while the city is creating more parking, they are not requiring the e-scooters to park in it. So they'll still be able to park in furniture zones, um, which I think means that we will not see the reduction in misparked e-scooters that we would like. Um, I also have a concern for um, streets that have smaller furniture zones or people who are maybe uh, trying to park their e-scooter correctly, but not doing so very well. Uh, an e-scooter that is half in a furniture zone uh, is still a tripping hazard if the um, back wheel of the e-scooter is sticking out into the road, even though the front half is in the furniture zone. Um, that's still a blockage that I might very easily trip over as I'm walking down the street. Finally, I'm glad to see that the city is going to be requiring all of the e-scooters to make a sound while they're moving. Um, this is important for knowing when an e-scooter is approaching um, so that I know whether I should you know, be concerned to try and move out of the way, something like that. Um, however, and, and I'm glad to see that it is a consistent sound across the whole fleet. So we're not trying to contend with this sound and that sound and this other sound. And I have to remember all of these different sounds that all mean e-scooter. I only have to you know, pay attention to one and that's great. But it is worth noting that the accessibility stakeholder community um, committee last year, uh, the stakeholder group, we were not able to find a sound that was sufficient that could be heard over traffic. Uh, and an inadequate sound is almost as bad as no sound at all because it's not doing what it is, it is supposed to do and warning us of these e-scooters approaching. Uh, so given all of these concerns, while I'm glad to see the city is considering environmentally friendly methods of transportation, and while I'm glad to see that they are taking into account our recommendations, um, the site loss community finds e-scooters to be a very large safety hazard. When we had our town hall in November, all of our participants recalled instances of 
uh, finding misparked e-scooters e in the sidewalk, um, nearly being hit by someone riding on the sidewalk, all of these things contribute to sidewalks um, feeling less safe uh, and, and more dangerous so that it becomes, um, you know, much less of a, a, a desire to go out and use the sidewalk. Um, and that's really a problem um, because of this, these safety hazards that are on our streets. Therefore, the CNIB remains opposed to the e-scooter pilot. Um, we would like you to discontinue the pilot for the third year. While it is possible that technology will be there in the future, I don't know that it's there yet. And unless you can prevent all of the sidewalk riding and misparking, um, or at least you know 90% of it, a very very large amount, it is too dangerous to allow these to continue on our streets. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Kate. Always uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you. Uh, seeing no questions, thank you very much for coming out today uh, and giving your delegation. Next up, we have Kim Kilpatrick. And I'm not sure if we have Kim in the room. Yes, I'm here. Ah, true. Oh, hey, Kim. Yes, Great. I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm not turning my video on because my Wi-Fi gets a little um, bad when I do. So we're, we're so all I having those issues. Mind. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, thank you very much, counselors. And I, I'm, I'm in awe of the long day you've had and all of the facts and figures you've had to listen to. Uh, my name is Kim Kilpatrick. I'm totally blind travel with a guide dog and live in the downtown core. I must say the last two years have not been a fun time living in the downtown core, including the last few weeks, uh, very challenging. Um, the e-scooters have made my life pretty challenging and I won't go over the figures that people have stated already and, and you know them. Um, I'm just gonna tell you from a personal perspective, walking around the downtown core has been very challenging uh, in the past two summers, I regularly tripped over scooters, run into scooters, had scooters almost run into me, had them blocking audible pedestrian poles, had them on the end of the walkway of my house, um, found them in the intersections when I've been trying to cross streets. And I, I know there are other times when they've been around me, but I didn't know that. Uh, sometimes when I was with sighted people, they would point out scooters parked um, or driving towards me, especially, which I didn't hear them at all. Um, last September, I got a new guide dog after two years of wait uh, through COVID. And the gentleman who trained me with my dog at home was appalled at how many scooters were on the sidewalk, how many were driving, how many were misparked. Um, and was concerned for our safety and for the safety of my dog. I waited two years for that dog. I don't want that dog to be hit by one of these uh, scooters. I don't want to be hit, but I almost feel like it's a matter of time before I get hurt or someone in my community gets hurt. I'm a confident traveler. I've been blind since birth. A lot of people uh, lose vision later on. They are not as confident as me. We are putting up extra barriers to travel when there are already a lot of barriers to travel anyways. Um, I feel very nervous about these. I, I was on the uh, stakeholder group. I agree with Kate and with others. We did not find a suitable sound. Um, I really uh, am thankful to Philip and his committee for voting in such a strong way to discontinue the pilot. After um, last season, I, I was very tempted to give up all my advocacy work um, with the city. I, I felt very, um, very hurt by this and uh, felt that we weren't being listened to and heard. Um, I've done a lot of advocacy for the city over the last many years in many capacities. And I love the people in the accessibility office and I love, uh, I'm proud to be from Ottawa. I've lived here all my life, but I really felt uh, burnt out and, and very disheartened. But I told myself, I have to speak not just for me, but for everybody around me in the disability community that probably feels the same way, but isn't speaking up or doesn't know how to advocate or how to speak up. So I told myself, I have to carry on with this advocacy and I have to try um, and, un and, and explain myself so that you understand that I'm not uh, being a drama queen. 
even though I'm a professional storyteller. And I really feel that this is this is crucially important that this not go on anymore. Um, it's it's someone is going to get hurt. Someone's service dog is going to get hurt. Uh, something's going to happen. And I feel that these companies have not shown us the technology. They say they're going to have it. They didn't have it last year. Um, they say they're going to have a sound. Who's going to test that sound? Our community, we have to test it under many, many uh, different conditions to make sure it would work. You know, I just don't trust. I don't trust the companies uh, and I don't trust this pilot. And I really hope that our voices are heard and listened to because it's been a hard enough time to be someone with a disability in this community. And I really want to feel that we are valued and we, we, our concerns are taken seriously. So that's all I'll say. I know you've had an extremely long day and I, I really appreciate uh, the chance to come to you with this. And I also put in a uh, written submission as well. Great, thank you, Kim, and uh, I really appreciate it. We, we certainly are listening and I loved uh, taking part in other discussions with you in the past. Uh, seeing no questions, we're down to, and Chris, if you can make sure that they're brought in, uh, we have Derek Robertson from Lyme and David Pritchard are the final two delegations, and then we'll go to staff questions. Um, so Derek Robertson, is he in the room? I am chair. Wonderful, Derek. Uh, did you submit a presentation or are you just speaking to us today? Uh, I, I, did, I did not submit a presentation. I'm That's wonderful. He can answer any questions that, that you and the committee members might have. Oh, just straight up answering questions and answers? Um, well, no, I, 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 I've got, I've got, a, I've got oh, a okay. statement you, and, then, and then I'm prepared to answer any questions. Great, you got, you got five minutes, uh, Derek, go for it. And then I'm sure we'll pepper you with questions. All right, so, sounds good. Um, Chair, mem members of council, th thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's been a long day, so I'll try not to take too, too much time uh, from you. My name's Derek Robertson. I'm the Senior Manager of Government Relations for Lyme in Canada. Uh, I'm, I'm here to speak in favor of the, the staff recommendations for a third year of the pilot. Um, obviously, obviously, as a number of councillors have mentioned, uh, over, over the course of today, uh, there, there is a climate emergency that is happening. Uh, as a result of that, drastic action needs to be taken in order to divert um, commuters and, and residents and give them options uh, that do not revolve around having to get into a vehicle. I think over the last two seasons, the, the data has, has shown very clearly that Ottawa has really accepted micro mobility and 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 the and the data particularly in 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 the 2021 season report it shows a very good picture that that we are starting to to divert people from from who would otherwise uh, have to rely on the vehicle for example 40 percent of uh, survey respondents in the last survey said that they walked more 60 percent said that as a result of micromobility, they actually drove less. This is exactly the mission that Lime is on. Lime as a company uh, it, it is on a mission to create a, a future of transportation that is shared, affordable, and most importantly, carbon, fee, carbon free. Uh, obviously, there have been a number uh, of, of issues raised in, in, the, in the staff report, as well as um, th through the uh, deputations by members of the accessibility community, uh, one of which being parking. So parking line definitely takes seriously. Uh, there are a number of different strategies that that Lyme uh, can implement in, in various cities and have worked hard with, with the city of Ottawa staff uh, to, to address those issues as, as they come up. Um, we're addressing uh, Councillor Leeper's amendment. Th this is something that we are supportive of. Uh, th th this is something that we do in a variety of other cities across the world, uh, wh whether it is preferred parking, uh, where, where we provide a financial incentive in order, to, in order to get our riders to end their trips in these particular areas, 
or in, in many cases, mandatory parking areas, whether it be in high volume areas or right across the city. So, so this is something that, that we are supportive of uh, and, and, and would, would certainly uh, support city staff and, and, and this program um, expediting uh, the introduction of more parking spots. Because we know that if you give uh, riders the opportunity to, to park properly, most of the time they will. Um, and and when, it, when it comes to those who don't, there, there is a variety of actions that we can take. We, we, like to, we like to lead with education because like I said, mo most people don't know that they're breaking the rules. So a simple reminder, whether through, through the app or through email, um, corrects most of that. If, if, if they continue uh, to miss park and, and break the rules, we have no problem progressing up uh, the disciplinary scale, whether it is um, more serious warnings, fines, or at the end of the day, um, as an absolute last resort, banning them from the platform. Uh, when, when, it, when it comes to technology, you, you, you've heard from my colleagues uh, and other operators about, about the next level of technology that is being brought to Ottawa. Thank you. Um, next, next level of technology that's being brought to, to Ottawa this year. This, this year, we are committing to bringing the Generation 4 scooter, uh, which is our newest and most sustainable scooter on the market. What that, what that has in it is, is high precision GPS, which is accurate to about 20 or 30 centimeters. Uh, so what that does is, it, in the case of parking, in the case of um, slow zones, no parking zones, things like that, uh, the, the pickup of, of, of the scooter sensing it is, is a lot more accurate than in, in past generations. On, on top of that, what we've done in the new scooter is we actually have installed the different zones through, through collaboration with city staff and then with city requirements in order to uh, get rid of that potential lag that, that sometimes happens with older generations where, where all the information is stored up in the, in, in the cloud. This is actually on the scooter. So the lag time is, is much uh, shorter uh, when, when it comes to um, when, when it comes to sidewalk riding, we know that this this happens less than four percent of the time. And once again, it's a matter of education. Uh, we we know from from our data that those who are riding on the sidewalk either once again don't know that they're not break not following the rules, or they don't feel safe in the motorway. And 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 really, I I think through one investments in active transportation infrastructure, as well as the, these new no, no sidewalk zones, as well as the constant audible sound. I, th I think that it addresses these issues. And, and I believe that, that this committee and, and council sh should renew uh, the pilot for a third year. And with Thank that, you, Derek. I, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, Councillor Fleury's on the board. Yep. Thank you, Derek. Um, it feels like Lyme is too big to care. So I, I'd like to understand where do we fit as a, a, a city and, and specifically how many, um, how many uh, line team members did you have on the ground uh, last summer uh, on average? Yeah, so, so, so to your point about line being too big to care, that, you know, that, that is not how we operate. I, I, I build close relationships with, with every municipality that, that we operate in and, and really, um, really spend the time with them to, de to develop those relationships required to actually being able to address issues collaboratively. collaboratively. <laughs> Sorry, collaboratively. It's been a long day. I know it's been a longer day uh, for you guys. When, when, it, when it comes to how, how many on the ground uh, team members we had, I believe it's somewhere between 15 or 20, but I, I will confirm that and and uh, send the exact number to you after after the meeting. Who who's as part of the team was on the ground, not uh, responding to in real time to scooters? Because I, you're saying 15 to 20. I, I certainly saw vans moving uh, Lyme. I'm not debating that. 
uh, but I didn't see uh, individual operators being in real time responding uh, to, to tweets, to poorly parked, to uh, a number of elements. I even saw a Lime scooter on the Nicholas off ramp um, going southbound where there's no sidewalk. Actually, there was two. They were abandoned there for two weeks, uh, flipped on the side, not moved. So that shows me like your team is not uh, is not on the ground. They're not active. Can you can you maybe explain what is the the model that you uh, you 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 have in Ottawa that is uh, that from your perspective would make makes your time your response time effective. Yeah, so I, I can only speak for the time that I've been here, which, which is about five months. Um, I, I know that we did have an on the ground operations manager that, that coordinated, uh, whether it's de redeployments, whether it's rebalancing, whether it is to your point, going and collecting uh, scooters that are where they should not be. Um, we, we, we coordinated whether it was getting complaints through 311, through our uh, customer uh, support line, whether it was through our email address, um, to, to ensure that we were addressing those issues. I, I know that later on in the season, our operations manager actually ended up going back to, to, to university. Um, so, so we were running a little shorthanded at the end of the season, but go, going into a, a, a new year of the pilot, we, we've actually just hired, brought on board a, a new general manager for Canada. Uh, we will be hiring a, a dedicated operations manager for um, Ottawa, as well as bringing back our staff, which is complemented by Lime Patrol, which is a, a group of our uh, em employees that, that go around the, the city cleaning up uh, scooters that might be misparked or in areas that they shouldn't be as they go. I go back to my first point to you. To me, it sounds too big to care. Like Ottawa is the capital city. We need to know the face of the organization. That face needs to be on the ground, available with team members. And when you're making reference to Lime in Canada, you lose me. I, I'm not Canada, I'm Ottawa. I care about the Ottawa program, care about how those units are parked, care about how they're riding and how you're responding in real time. So. I'll say what I said to uh, turn her on. If it was just a consideration to approve or not an expansion and Lyme was the only consideration, my vote would be no today. So obviously there's a clear procurement with much needed uh, higher standards. If you meet them, that will be your prerogative. But I, uh, I can say that from what I saw last year, it was not up to even the basics of what we would expect uh, in our capital city. And we know that organizations like you need to do well in the capital city because then Toronto and Vancouver and others look to us to say, hey, capital city can do it. We can do it elsewhere. So when colleagues are calling me out from Toronto or Montreal or Quebec, I say, wait a minute, don't deal with these guys or here's what you have to put in restrictions. So I just want to put that on record that, you know, I, I, I recognize you've only started five months ago. That, that's not your problem. But I'm, I am speaking to the organization of Lyme. And it is. It did not meet uh, what residents of Ottawa should expect uh, on, on the pilot, and and the city uh, is clear on that. So I'm not asking for a response unless you feel like it. But to me, uh, you're you're a bit in the same box as Neur and as Neuron. Neuron feels a bit more local when uh, you know I've described uh, how how I feel about the, the too big to care for the brand. Yeah, I I, I would like to briefly uh, re re respond that I'm 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 I'm, I'm sorry that you have gotten that impression of Lyme. Um, obviously, like I said, I've, I've been at the company for about five months. And, and when, I, when I did start, I, I actually did reach out to your office just, just to try to introduce myself and, and did not get a response. So in, in, in the coming year, if, if we are so lucky as, as to continue serving Ottawa, I, I hope that we, 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 can, we can start a dialogue and I, and I can show you exactly how much Lyme actually does care about Ottawa and, and, the, and, and, the, and the residents that we serve. Yeah, you, I shot at, at Lyme, you shot at me personally. Uh, when did you send me that email? Uh, which month, which day? Um, I, I don't have an exact date. I believe it was October or early November. 
Uh, yeah. but we'll just so I'm clear for the record after the season. Yeah. Uh, no, it was it was during the season. It, it was uh, it was within the first month that I started counseling. Okay. Well, here we go. I, I starting at the end of the season is the same as starting too late. I recognize you, Derek, joined the organization. We had been through a pilot that was unsuccessful, and it was the tail end of that of that season. So, for for the record, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Fleury, and. Um, I as well. I, I think, uh, Derek, I have mentioned to you myself, I, I, I think Lyme had a really crappy record last year. Uh, I did like the energy uh, when you spoke with me uh, about what your plans are, uh, but the proof is in the pudding. And I think that's what it's going to come down to. And staff will need that commitment. Uh, I, I, I don't want to take any more of these emails about uh, uh, scooters sitting around for a week. I don't want to have to, I will have to work with these people and they're the ones that are being affected the most. So you've seen what some other uh, uh, ride providers uh, have done, uh, whether it's interns, people out in the streets doing all those things. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two things that I had mentioned to you. Uh, one, uh, it has to be the new bird device. We don't want the antiquated piece of garbage. You can't even get through the gate on that to be able to get into our city to do business. Uh, and you've committed to that. Uh, that's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, and I, I fully committed to bringing the generation four. And I know there was challenges last year specifically because of procurement, but those procurement things are all out the window after two years. People have to uh, show their stuff. Uh, part two, uh, you've, you've heard from Councillor Fleury. You've heard from my other colleagues, uh, Vice Chair Leeper. Uh, I'm hoping you have a, I, like, I don't see you running around picking up the scooters. Uh, so uh, you've got to be able to achieve that 15 minute wait time. Uh, do, do you have a firm understanding of hearing that from today's committee? Absolutely. And, and, and 15 minutes is our commitment. Terrific. And, and I will be asking, cause I did have another colleague uh, and maybe somebody else will ask staff if people don't achieve what they claim to do out of our two companies, what is the ax factor within our agreement uh, I think that is a big, a, a big component. If, if, if this committee does go ahead and support, uh, we've we've made strength in everything else. Uh, but uh, oh, I see Councillor Hubley there. Uh, that is a big factor in everyone's mind. So I do thank you for coming out today. Uh, we do have, uh, and and we did actually able to connect with a couple more people that came back in. So uh, is Claire on the line, Chris? Thank you for time. Thanks, Derek. We are finding out, Chair. And if not, uh, we'll just proceed with uh, David. Hi, sorry to interrupt, it's Claire. <laughs> Perfect, all right, Claire, thanks so much. We, we can't see your video. I'm glad you're able to make it I know, I know, how are you? Terrific, terrific. So if this is your first time here, you have five minutes and the floor is yours. I'm gonna keep it um, short and sweet, if that's good. Um, so hi, my name's Claire. I'm a student who works in um, part-time in Ottawa. The e-scooter program has allowed me to get around the city as I don't have access to a car and transportation on the um, O train has been less reliable than I would like. Um, e-scooters help me get from point A to point B when it's too far to walk. They're easy to access on the app and are a cheap form of transportation for people in school like me. They are safe and convenient and make the city more accessible for everyone in the downtown area. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I just think that they're um, positive for people who don't have as many options um, as those who can buy cars. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to keep them around. And yeah, I just wanted to keep it short and just say why I like them. Oh, I really appreciate that. Oh, uh, we have Vice Chair Leeper that has a quick question for you. Yes. Uh, okay, good. Uh, uh, Claire, just to say first, uh, thank you very much for coming out as someone who uses the scooters. Um, I, I believe you're the only one who has done that. There are mm -hmm. thousands of people who use these scooters and enjoy using them. Um, and your experience is one of the reasons why I would like to see the scooter pilot become a success. Can you just describe for me um, what what trips do you make with a scooter? And second question, they're not cheap. How do you find the affordability? 
Well, compared to um, an Uber, I do find them a cheaper option and they're definitely um, easier to access. I mean, especially if you're just walking around in the downtown core, you can just pick one up right away. Um, open the app on your phone and jump on and get going, which is super awesome. Um, not for everybody, they would be cheap. I, I can see that. For me, it is uh, in a price range that I can afford for I'm not staying on it for an, like an, a long period of time. Um, so it is, it is pretty cheap if you want to just travel to, um, say, the mall or to get to class um, or if you want to hang out with friends like it's just it's my really my, fun as well dinner, it's really fun as well and um yeah just things like that they are a ton of fun um how do you uh, experience parking uh, sorry uh, how do you experience one um the fact that they're prohibited on sidewalks uh mm -hmm. so do you ride the sidewalk and I'm, I'm i'm sorry your real name is there but we won't hold it against you um <laughs> do you find them safe no. to ride on the road no, or do you have to ride them on the sidewalk yeah i'm definitely going to be honest with you when i um when they first entered ottawa um i was super excited to just get on one right away and i wasn't fully aware of all of the rules so the first time I did use it, I actually was on the sidewalk, but I learned pretty quickly that um, I shouldn't be on there. <laughs> okay. And um, I feel like the longer that we have these scooters in Ottawa, the longer we'll be able to sort out these problems and you know we can find solutions to everybody's issues that they have with them. Um, but I, I don't think that you know, um, cutting out uh, e-scooters from Ottawa would be the best idea because it does benefit a lot of people. And I do realize that it has a lot of negative effects on others as well. But I think together we'll be able to work out these problems. And it's been a short amount of time. Um, so I think if we hold them here longer and, and we try and find these solutions, we will. Claire, thank you very much. Of course. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much for letting me speak. Absolutely. Thank you for yeah. coming out. And we have uh, David and then we have uh, Vangel. So David? Oh, I'm back on. Yes, we got you in. <laughs> <laughs> you are so kind. Well, no, it's a pleasure. Please, you have five minutes. The floor is yours. Is it me? It is. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. You are very generous and very flexible. I was at the dentist earlier today. That's why I couldn't participate. And now I'm looking for your um, assistance here. And uh, thank to, uh, I want to thank Chris for uh, enabling me to participate. I have sent in uh, written comments and uh, basically I have indicated that the technology is not mature enough and um, E-scooter user experience uh, is not where it should be to allow for a third uh, pilot. <clears throat> so I am against the continuation. Now, many other people have provided specific evidence against the continuation, and I will not, um, I will be very, very brief. Uh, there are two or three points that I want to make. One is that what I have heard so far today in terms of the technology is a promise. Um, and uh, promising technology is an excellent thing, but it has to be proven before it is applied, implemented, where we are unwilling uh, participants uh, in an experiment. I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's valid uh, for, for the city of Adva to continue to do. Um, let them prove their technology. As you said, the, the proof is in the, in the Putin. So they haven't done that yet. The only thing we have seen is um, we heard some sounds last November. We thought they were not good enough. If there have been any improvements since then, we are not aware of them. Um, and they have to be tested before they are accepted. 
Now, the second point um, is very important, I think, in terms of you making a decision today. Uh, out of respect uh, for the disability community, even if you are inclined uh, to approve uh, a third pilot, you should not do that today. Over the last two weeks, even though we had asked uh, the staff to, pre to make sure that when they came out with reports and documents that they are accessible, over the last two or three weeks, uh, we have experienced serious document accessibility barriers. Um, the documents that may be accessible became available only, uh, I believe, on Monday evening. It is not possible to review them and analyze them carefully. <clears throat> so I would suggest to you that if, even if you want to make a positive decision, um, if you made it today, it would show disrespect uh, for the issue of accessibility and our community and um, accessibility, uh, the provision of accessible documents and the avoidance of discrimination is the law in Ontario and in Canada. And in respect of this legal provision, you should not make a positive decision today. Thank you. Great, I'm glad you were able to join us. Uh, seeing no questions, thank you for coming out today. Our last participant delegation is David Pritchard. David? And just prior to that, uh, maybe Chris, if you're able to throw up the motion to extend the meeting uh, in the event we, uh, maybe there'll be no questions, we'll end before seven, uh, but that would be hopeful. Uh, uh, Councillor Leeper, would you mind reading the motion to extend past 7 p.m.? Thanks. Uh, be it right resolved now. that the meeting time be extended past 7 p.m. pursuant to subsection 81C of Procedure Bylaw 2021-24. Wonderful. Is that carried? Thank you very much. I, I know you're a little cold. <laughs> All right, so we're back to David. David, you have five minutes. The floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you very much, Chairman and Councillors. I must say I'm absolutely aghast that you're letting this go through. Um, you know, even your own disability committee has recommended you go against it. Uh, as I pointed out in an email to some of you, uh, most major jurisdictions around the world have banned them. The gentleman from Bird neglected to tell you that while they are in Britain, it's only for their e-mopeds and e-bicycles. All of Britain does not allow e-scooters on public land. Um, Toronto doesn't allow it. Montreal doesn't allow it. Nowhere in BC can use it. So I just don't understand, given that so many jurisdictions are restricting them, where you're thinking it. As to Councillor Leeper and his uh, What's the best way? Of, his virtue, you know, this, this sense that people who do alternate things are virtuous. I will relate a thing that happened to me last year. While at Queen and Bank Street, some cyclists mounted the sidewalk and knocked me over. Uh, I was fortunate there was a person there to help me up again. I suffered nothing more than scrapes and a few bruises. Had I been seriously injured, I would have been SOL because he just rolled it up. He didn't bother to check me. As I also mentioned in my email, a few days ago, I was starting to walk into my driveway and my driveway is sheltered by a porch, my neighbor's porch on one side. I was just steps away from the sidewalk and some guy came whipping down on an e-scooter. Had I been two or three steps further, I would have been struck. My neighbor, uh, again, and she walked out, um, there's a hedge protecting it, and she walked out, she would have been struck. There was I, I must say, I have, you know, I got my driver's license the last time when the Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. Um, I have driven all across this continent and for several years in Europe, and I have never seen such poor cyclists as the cyclists of um, Ottawa. Um, you know, it's care. I don't know whether it's just a case of carefree to the point of careless, but I am sorry. I do not see any method in, of enforcement. You know, I keep hearing about enforcement during the discussion this evening. Let me tell you about enforcement. 
Councillor Fleury will be aware of this. We had an influx of traffic on our street in Banye and in some of the neighboring streets, um, which not only increased the volume, but we had people doing speeds of 50 and 60 in residential uh, zones. Enforcement hasn't stopped. We've been complaining about it for months. So if you're gonna tell me that somebody from the city is gonna come around and capture all these people that are riding on sidewalks, sorry, I'm, you know, I'm somewhat dubious. Um, you know, as you can tell, I am quite upset. Um, you are placing my welfare and the welfare, every person that's come on tonight that's had a disability has been opposed to this. And this is coming from our experience. You know, I'm, I'd like to say that I thought better of uh, people who, who use things, but you know, I can't even walk out my front door, it seems, without being run over by a scooter. Um, I, you know, I, I, I just don't understand where you're coming from at all. When every place around the world is banning these things and yet you want to keep going. So I'll leave it at that because I'm just too upset to go any further. Thank you. Okay, terrific, thank you. I don't see any questions for our delegation. So at this point, we'll move to uh, discussions of staff. Uh, we have the three motions. Uh, we'll deal with everything together, by the way. So you can ask your staff questions related to the motions, not to the motions. And, uh, and then we'll vote on the actual main motion when we've completed the first uh, first three. So uh, five minutes uh, for questions, for wrap up, whatever you like. We have our staff here that are ready, willing and waiting for you. And uh, first up, uh, Councillor Fleury. Thank you, Chair. And, and let me begin by thanking Heidi. Uh, Heidi and I probably exchanged thousands of emails over the, the period and her patience with me, my community and, and her um, thoughtful uh, proposals that, that are in front of us uh, mean a lot to to me sometimes we want actions in real time and I think you know we have to let uh, the, the pilot year kind of end so I, I want to thank uh, Heidi for certainly her her availability and patience um, Heidi on the front of um, what was presented and uh, the delegations I have a few uh, a few clarifications. I think uh, Philip Turcotte kind of raised uh, a few aspects. So the um, requirement, what I understand to be requirements as part of the procurement process for accessibility elements in terms of response, in terms of noise, can you confirm that they will be requirements and not additional, not just points to procurement? No, absolutely. They will be requirements. We will be setting the criteria that the companies must meet. Um, and then the companies will be telling us how they will be able to meet those criteria or, or not. And then if they can't, not considered. Okay, that, that's, uh, that's very important. Um, the, um, in the report, we talk about, um, I, I think, you know, the chair and I go back now a number of years on this committee. And uh, one of the, the, the project the chair had done uh, was the, um, the uh, grocery uh, gro grocery carts, and you know they, they're sort of a similar environment. They're, they they were left as nuisance in communities and had impacts. And uh, I think you and I chatted that as I read the report, the fifty pages, it didn't. Yeah, the chair has the card. It didn't. Um, it didn't. Uh, it it didn't come obvious to me that uh, we were aligning the shopping cart. Uh, strategies, bylaws, and fines to this initiative. So I wonder if you could uh, clarify uh, what we will, what we're going to see, and ultimately if staff, bylaw, David. or public works will uh, will remove the e-scooters uh, if they are improperly parked, and and if there are financial consequences for that in the coming year. Yeah. So I. I apologize that it was not clear enough in, in the body of the report, but uh, yes, as part of the uh, amendments that we're proposing to the um, bylaw that regulates the use of e-scooters in Ottawa, uh, we've added in a provision for um, impoundment of, of e-scooters. And so uh, bylaw services staff would be empowered to impound any misparked e-scooter regardless of the 15 minute response time. That would be one of their tools that they can use in, in terms of it helping with the enforcement. Um, impounded e-scooters would be uh, brought to a roads yard 
um, and there would be a $75 fee to um, uh, that incorporates the, the storage and then the, the releasing of it. Okay. Thank you. Um, in terms of intake, so in the past, it was quite confu confusing, uh, and we saw that through the data that's presented today. I, I think one of the providers did speak to, you know, they feel that they got more complaints because they were more accessible. So uh, can you confirm that wherever, whoever is decided as a provider will streamline and that the city will all, always have an interface in terms of the community complaint and the response? Yes, so our, our recommendations is that everything be funneled through the city. Um, so uh, we still want to have the multiple um, avenues that people can use to complaint. Um, and uh, uh, as the, the one provider showed that the QR code was a, an easy way to complain, we liked that initiative of having it as, an, as easy as possible way to complain. But the, the, the complaint would be directed to a city platform so that we have all of them all together. Um, and then we can have better tracking. Uh, we can then follow up and with the individual complaints and, and, and have a better tracking of when they've been responded to and, and addressed. Okay. okay, well, thank you. And uh, I, it is an important read. I mean, there are so many aspects to consider and, and changes that are proposed. Um, if those were not proposed, I have to admit, I, I would have hoped for a different report. I think with the changes that you're proposing, uh, it is squeezing them on really modernizing their technology and, and addressing the, um, the parking and, and moving uh, challenges that are real and that we, ne we need to address um, going forward. So if there wasn't changes to our procurement or to our requirements, I would not be supporting an extra year of pilot. But with these changes, I, I am uh, comfortable. As I've shared with uh, one of the providers, if they have very good uh, tools that limit writing of sidewalks and direction of vehicular movement, uh, I will gladly look at removing some of the red zoning uh, in, in the Byron market. And you know, as, as the chair said, the, the, the proof will be in the pudding. So we have the rules now and, and we can always take a look. And I know that staff have been quite, uh, quite effective in, in responding to that. So Heidi, again, thank you. I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to be um, um, sim simplistic, Mr. Chair, in some of the accessibility issues that were raised today. I did speak to our Chair of Accessibility um, Advisory Committee, Philippe Surcot in, in, Surcot in uh, French, and I do think it's important to re-raise again for the record that although uh, the committee is not supportive of the pilot, the actions that are being proposed, if implemented, can make a significant difference in terms of ability to walk safely or move safely uh, for uh, residents with accessibility on sidewalks, particularly the clear way. And that if the sound requirement is in place, which that's, that's what it states in the report, then there are less concerns with moving violations or, or moving issues on streets. So I hope that I paraphrase what was a, a, frank, a French conversation with our advisory chair and, and recognizing that the advisory committee did not support the pilot, but also uh, wanted clarification that these elements were not just good to haves in procurement, but a requirement uh, for the pilot going forward. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks for your hard work working with staff on your two motions. I know they support them. Uh, uh, we're on to Vice Chair Lieber. Thank you very much. And I will keep it brief. Um, my question actually has more to do with the private scooters. So obviously, the, the big decisions to be made here today are around the continuation of the scooter rentals. Do you see um, any difference or have you given much thought to uh, continuation of the scooter pilot for private scooters? Because those two are only legal under the provisions of the, the municipal, or sorry, the um, provincial regulation change. So yeah, so private scooters follow the Ontario regulations and all the regulations that go for, for dictating what must be included as part of those scooters. We, they are then allowed in the city of Ottawa because of our bylaw that um, um, dictates how that e-scooters are permitted within Ottawa. If the uh, shared e-scooter program was discontinued, private e-scooters would still be permitted um, unless we also revoked the city bylaw. 
And have you given that any thought at all? Like, do you have any insight as to the behavior of, of private scooter um, owners and operators? Um, we, we know they're out there. We know they're in use. Um, certainly we see that the, 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 the biggest issue that with the shared program was the parking of, of mis the misparking of e-scooters. And that is not as much of an issue with private scooters, as you mentioned earlier, um, um, they're not just leaving them um, on, um, uh, where they stop, uh, they are being parked um, and often even locked um, or, or brought into their homes um, um, at, at the other destination. So the parking is less of an issue with private scooters, um, but there, there could still be some um, um, riding behavior that would be targeted through education and, 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 and enforcement. Okay. Um, and I, I should uh, ask as well, staff don't support my motion to allow scooters to park in, say, curbside parking lanes. Um, let's explore that. Uh, what is the staff objection? So there's a couple things and I can ask too, I, I think Phil Edens is here from traffic services as well. Um, there's a couple things that uh, we would find it, um, we, we support the idea of creating dedicated parking spaces on street uh, with signage and, and pavement markings as we tested one of them this year. Um, but having uh, e-scooters just parked anywhere um, is the, the reduction um, in available parking for everybody. Um, uh, is, is, a, is a concern. Um, and we heard from the Accessibility Advisory Committee too that uh, they don't support the reduction of parking on street um, for those who have accessible permits. Um, and, but then I think that probably the, 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 the bigger issue is that the Highway Traffic Act uh, would not allow it as well. Um, E-scooters under the Ontario regulations um, are not considered a vehicle. They are to be treated as a bicycle. And so uh, they can't just park anywhere that vehicles are allowed to park unless it's in a designated sort of corralled area. Um, I feel, Edens, I'm, I'm not sure if you want to uh, supplement that. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I don't have the same understanding of the, the provincial regulation. Uh, they're not vehicles. Uh, I, I certainly um, uh, understand that, but I don't have the same understanding of the provincial regulation that they're to be treated as bicycles. They're, 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 they're a category unto themselves. They're e-kick scooters that are defined and um, regulated according to the provincial regulations. Uh, I, I can't see a legal hurdle if my motion passed to uh, putting e-kick scooters as a, an eligible device to park in um, uh, on the highway wherever motor vehicles are allowed to park. One aspect of that, uh, Council, through the Chair, as Phil Edens, uh, is that uh, the regulations also state that uh, no person operating an electric e-scooter shall leave it in a location that's intended for the passage of vehicles or pedestrians. That's within the provincial regulation. Uh, the fact that they're not to be uh, a motor vehicle under the Act precludes uh, a lot of that kind of activity. The Act also in the regulation allows their use like a bicycle in while traveling, such as uh, in bike lanes, they, they must be in a bike lane if there's a lane provided, uh, and uh, conversely uh, within a traffic lane for the movement purposes. Okay, um, I don't want to. I don't want to wordsmith the regulations. I still have a um, a different understanding of what the regulations would allow at this point. Um, if, so, with the corrals, I think you know everyone is in favor of carving out corrals uh, across the city. You're only proposing twenty of those. Uh, so, at any given time, you know, uh, I don't know, twenty times, let's say four, you know, eighty of the city's nine hundred scooters would be able to park in corrals. Um, that doesn't seem like a sufficient amount to provide incentive for people to properly park uh, their, their devices. So the, the physically demarcated parking corrals is um, in addition to all of the other permitted uh, and, and restrictions in terms of parking. So it's just one more tool in those areas where we know there's, there's a high demand um, and, 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 uh, potential issues. Um, the, the 
the, the, the 20 locations is, is sort of what we're recommending this year in terms of our resources to be able to, um, to choose and, and con consult with the local counselor and the BIAs um, to choose the appropriate locations and then the resources to, to implement the, um, the signage and, and, and pavement markings. Um, the number of spots that can fit within each of those corrals would be different depending on, on where they are. Uh, some of them we, uh, we're, we are looking at could be as many as you know, 20 scooters. Um, so it, it depends on sort of each area where, where we're fitting them, where we're, where we're placing them, and finding that balance between um, minimizing the impacts on, on, on parking spaces um, and in, in, in incentivizing uh, uh, proper parking behavior in, in areas where there's concerns. Okay, I'm, I, I won't get into debate. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that that's sufficient to stop the uh, improper parking uh, in, in many areas of the city where the furniture zone is simply inadequate to, uh, to try to um, uh, park a scooter. And in many areas like residential streets, uh, we don't have a furniture zone at all. Um, and I, I just can't see that we're going to put uh, on Hinchy uh, a designated corral it's not going to be a priority so okay um uh, i will wrap up uh, uh, very quickly by saying that you know if my motion to allow uh scooters to park on the street passes i believe that will go a long way towards solving the improper scooter parking issue which is such an accessibility concern uh and if it doesn't i'm despite my uh, uh fanboy uh approach to electric scooters i love those things uh, i'm not going to be able to support the continuation of it for another year thank you chair great thank you vice chair uh councilman r thank you very much chair i just want to follow on Councilor leaper's uh, line of questioning there around the um parking in parking spaces, uh, as well as the 20 different spots we're going to identify. The, the 20 spots are supposed to be parking spaces, right? They are, uh, for all intents and purposes, where like a car would park that we would repurpose into um, scooter parking. Is that correct? No, not necessarily. Some of those physically demarcated parking spaces could be um, in areas um, uh, like on large ball boats or um, um, like this year, we, we also had one in front of the parking garage in, on 2nd Avenue in the Glebe. Um, and so it's, it's not just on street, um, but we are uh, looking at also having some on street spots and um, for on-street parking, it would have to be in a, in a corral with signage and pavement markings. Okay, so there would be some, some on-street in parking spaces that would traditionally be reserved for a motor vehicle, uh, but we'll have scooters there instead and it's demarked. Or, or it could be on-street um, in areas where we can't necessarily fit a, a full vehicle sort of in parking bays. Um, you know, the triangular sections at the end and entrances to parking bays. So we're sort of limiting the impacts on, on vehicular parking, but it's still uh, in an on-street uh, space. Okay. Uh, and I appreciate that. I know, I think, you know, you saw a lot of our emails last year. Heidi, we talked a lot, uh, yourself and uh, Vivi Chi, just about, because we were getting complaints like every day. <laughs> so we would, we would write to you about these complaints. And one of the big things we had suggested in the inquiry we did was to have more of these types of spaces so that we weren't seeing the accessibility issues, which uh, many people have spoken to so eloquently here tonight. So I guess the question is, if we've got these corrals coming in in certain spots, uh, are the scooters still able to park on the sidewalk in the proximity of those corrals? Like if you've got a corral on one of the blocks or you know two blocks and there's one corral there for those two blocks, are, are, are you still going to allow scooters to park anywhere in the furniture zone in those two blocks? Or will it just be like, no, this is the designated spot in this area. So go park it there. You know, you're still close to businesses. You're still able to, to walk from your area, but you're not going to be able to just park anywhere near that corral. Um, it would be a, a localized decision in, in every single case. Um, I think we would still be permitting um, furniture zone parking where it's appropriate. Uh, one of the, the, um, amendments to the bylaw is um, um, only in furniture zones where the sidewalk is at least two meters wide to begin with. So um, not in areas where there's not enough space. So we would not be permitting furniture zones where it's, you know, it's way too narrow. Um, so de de each 
a physically demarcated corral would be have to be considered in the case by case is if adjacent um, uh, furniture zone parking is appropriate or not. Um, uh, and that's to say, I want to add that on top of the physically demarcated parking zone uh, areas, there will also be ones that are um, sort of digitally corralled. And we sort of heard from the, the providers of some of the new technologies that exist to uh, really defined limited areas where parking would be permitted and where um, the users would get real time um, awareness that they're not within those areas. So it would be a combination of some that are signed and, and pavement markings to be highly visible, some that are only identified uh, within the apps um, and meeting all of the, uh, the restrictions that we will be imposing in, in our uh, RFP criteria. Okay, that's helpful. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping to do sooner rather than later uh, if this pilot goes ahead is to, to identify those spots with you. So what, how will that process work? I mean, obviously in my, in my area, we've got a lot there. Uh, Lansdowne's like a major, major hub it was last year in the years past. I know other councillors have been to try the scooters in, in Capital Ward. So just what is the process? Do you, are you going to come to us and suggest here's the 10 spots or 15 spots that we think would make sense or what's the process? Yeah, so working with our colleagues in, in parking services, uh, we will uh, start with an initial round of, of areas that we would be proposing and we would be consulting with the councillors and, and local BIAs on those. Uh, once we have uh, providers um, um, uh, an agreement with the chosen providers, we would continue the collaboration with those providers um, and um, also work with the councillors offices on, on establishing um, other areas. Um, and as we said in the report, it may require even a gradual deployment um, of, of the fleet as we're sort of solving these localized parking solutions uh, across the city. Okay, okay, um, that's helpful. I do, uh, I'd love to hear more about um, councillor Councilor Leaper's motion um, because I think that would, it would help a lot. I don't see it taking away like motor vehicle parking. If you're putting a scooter beside the curb, you can still park beside it. Um, uh, but it would help because then you're sort of saying to people, look, this is where they can go instead of blocking the sidewalk where we know there's major accessibility issues um, and restricting it to, uh, you know, parking spaces that are not demarcated for accessibility parking specifically um, would help. I think, I think that, that that could go a long way to helping to alleviate the challenges that we saw last year. I just have to say, like, just from a staff time perspective in my office and, you know, counselor time, we spent so much time in the last two years responding to people on this, working with yourselves. This has been a big um, workload increase because of the issues we've seen. And I think this, you know, in the, in the, I'm willing to give the pilot another go, but I'm just so, I'm really, I'm really like, we need to solve it this year. I'm hoping that the, the fewer scooters, like the, the 900 number, the fewer numbers of providers uh, can really help with that, uh, the new uh, technology that's being implemented and the geofencing that came in um, it improved last year. We've seen improvements. Uh, it has been gradually improving and that's what I'm hoping for again this year. But if we're gonna see the same thing this year where it's like all this time and effort, huge accessibility issues, constant complaints, then you know that's where my concern will come. So I just, I, I would love to know from you on the counselor leap promotion specifically, um, you know, uh, your thoughts on parking it there versus right in the middle of the sidewalk, which we know could happen again. That's my big concern, what I raised with the AAC with them as well. Um, and then secondly, what your views are of improving um, the rollout of this program and what we're gonna see this year, what, what your thoughts are on the improvements we'll see. I mean, if you still think there's gonna be issues, that kind of thing. So I'd love those two pieces and then I'm all done, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilman Ark. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I will repeat that we are not supportive of, of allowing e-scooters to park just randomly anywhere along the curb without providing the proper guidance of where they should be parked. Um, we feel there would be a lot of um, um, safety issues with um, uh, just even, you know, even the scooters parked too far from the curb and then now they're in the travel lanes. Um, uh, and it's not... Um, 
it is definitely not a, um, a practice that is used in any other jurisdiction. Any on-road on parking is all in sort of with uh, signage and, and pavement markings in, in corralled areas. Um, there's also sort of operational challenges of dealing with um, the, the time restrictions and the um, 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 costs for parking um, and the loss of revenue um, if they're taking up parking spaces that could otherwise be used by, by vehicles. Um, and uh, yeah, and then again, we we believe, and I can I can ask Phil to to reiterate here, but we believe that the the Highway Traffic Act would not permit it. Uh, that's correct. Uh, also, in the context of what you're talking about, there we have within the uh, e hick scooter bylaw specific uh, terminology in the definitions of a uh, parking facility that allows for things like the compounds, the marked locations and so on, but not random parking. Is that, is that good, Councilor Minard? Yeah, on the first question is good. If I'm getting a bunch of issues again, emails, what, what's my path? Like that's the final question that we had, that I had, it wasn't really answered, it was what you think it's gonna be a lot better, I hope it is this year. But, but if, we're, if we're getting a ton of feedback again, just like last year and it's not working, what, what do you suggest? Because uh, last year was really untenable for us. Um, so we agree a lot of our recommendations are meant to um, uh, reduce uh, that burden on, on, on staff and, and your offices. Um, the, as you said, the fewer number of scooters to begin with, um, the fewer number of companies that which will make them all each more accountable and the increase in, in, in staff resources that are gonna be a lot more proactively um, uh, relocating and, and moving scooters that are, that are out of the way. Um, uh, we, we are also having um, stronger language in the um, um, RFP um, criteria so that we're sort of meeting those higher standards of, of, um, of what, we're, what we want our providers to achieve. Um, there will also be um, stronger language in the, in the RFP in terms of um, penalties should they not be meeting our standards. Um, and then there's an ultimate, um, excuse me, termination clauses um, if things are really not going well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Menard. Uh, I don't see any other speakers. I'm just gonna, and I promised my colleagues I'd keep it brief. We've been here all day and I really appreciate all your supports. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanna thank staff. They've worked tremendously hard on, on this. And I know uh, I've seen and heard some of the conversations with some of the scooter companies. Uh, they're not letting them get away scot-free. They are putting the clamps on. And a lot of that work came from uh, Councilor Menard, Councilor Leeper McKenney and Flurry that really uh, pushed hard for a lot of these items. Now, I agree with you uh, that um, <clears throat> this is a pilot for a reason because we're not convinced yet because they haven't delivered the product like they should have last year and COVID may, would it be, well, we're past that point. They must deliver on the product. Um, you know, the 15 minute ride times, the, the scooter pounds, uh, all the great things that are there, the one way si one central system for logging complaints, the reduction of numbers, and I don't think I was too kind to a lot of our scooter companies today. And they understand that. Uh, they know they have to work hard for the privilege to work in Ottawa because we actually are a surprisingly good base. And I know usually they cover off overseas quite well with their new product, but they've realized, wow, there's actually tourism and people that actually do enjoy the last mile and riding around on these things in the city, which is terrific. The crowling idea, uh, I love the crowl idea, like Councillor Menard said. I know staff are committed to working with the councillors within those areas to work on those. Um, uh, one quick, quick question, and then we'll get right to it. Um, when it comes to, if there's a bad actor out of the two, can we chop them off? Are they done? Can we get rid of them? Yes. Yes, yes or no. That's all I needed. Thank you. And uh, question number two, uh, when you guys, you guys have to see it. It can't be vaporware. It's got to be like Leaper and I, but it'll be a warmer day where you actually ride them and test them after staff has got, got it down, because of course we can't direct staff who you guys select, there's criteria. When you get the two providers, will you be able to arrange a day? Obviously we don't want a quorum of committee, uh, but to break it up so we could actually try it ourselves and see firsthand what's exactly happening. Sure, we can do that. Okay, so on that, uh, we do have three motions and I really, I, I'm, I, I wish there was a way I can get Vice Chair Leeper on board with us, I understand 
his principal stance on the parking on the streets, but with the MTO, and I'm, I've just gotten a couple of emails from some uh, accessibility community people that are not super warm because I did speak to that in the last two reports. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't support Councillor Leeper's motion as much as I would love to, uh, but uh, we do have staff supports on both Councillor Fleury's motions. Uh, so uh, if, uh, is that my understanding, uh, staff? Yes. Good. So on that, on both Councillor Fleury's uh, motions, are they carried? Carried. Terrific. Mr. And Chair, just for the record, they don't have to be, um, there's one relating to MTO and fines to equip police. Yep. And there's the other one on uh, removing the motor on the sidewalk and, um, and uh, lane direction uh, efforts. So I, they were presented at, at the beginning of this item. So yep. committee did see them, they are on record. I just want to we make sure that- We can screen share if desired. Yeah, no, I think I think our colleagues remember them at the beginning when you read them out. And uh, thank, thank you, you for, for highlighting what those two specific ones were. I appreciate that. Uh, so we have those two items carried. And Jeff, did you did you want to uh, call for yeas and nays on, on your item? Okay, thank you. Chris, thank could you call for yeas and nays on Vice Chair Leeper's motion? Happy to do so, just bear with me. Councillor Luloff. Sorry, but after hearing from the AAC, uh, my vote has to be no. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. After discussing it with the AAC, my, my vote has to be no. Councillor Dudas. Sorry, no. Councillor El Shantiri. No. Councillor Deans. Councillor Deans may not be here. Councillor Fleury. Yes. Councillor Menard. Yes. Councillor Kitts. No. Councillor Deruz. Councillor Deruz may not be here. Councillor Hubley. No. Councillor uh, Vice Chair Leeper. Yes. And Chair Tierney. Badly, no. I'm sorry? No. And I'll just read out Councillor Deans again if she's here. Councillor DeRuz, not present. Okay, that's six nays to three yeas. Okay, thank you. And on the main motion, uh, will you just list dissent, Vice Chair Leeper? Is that satisfactory? Okay, great. So on the main motion, please note dissent by Vice Chair Leeper. Uh, and again, thank you everyone for your participation on this one. Uh, I, I will quickly scroll down. Uh, we have a no, uh, we have a no notices of motion. I did have a quick inquiry. I'm going to speed read this thing uh, from Councillor Brockington wishes to introduce the following inquiry. The city of Ottawa is responsible for over 800 all way control intersections with more being implemented every year. Residents have increasingly up, uh, identified um, identified non-compliance at always stop intersections, non-compliance with stop signs and direct impact on the safety of the vulnerable road users and detracts from the safety of the residents' communities. Enforcement by police officers is one of the methods to increase the stop sign compliance. Understanding the Ottawa Police Service has very limited resources to enforce uh, intersections on a continual basis. Would traffic services staff conduct a review of the current practices and technologies uh, with the intersection design solutions and assist in increasing compliance that always stop intersections. Yeah, I think we all feel that. Uh, there's no other business. And our next meeting will take place in wonderful, balmy April, April 6, Wednesday, April 6, 2020. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Dinner time. <laughs>